morning and welcome to the Shevchenko Scientific Society's eight hour marathon of presentations by our members and guests as we raise money to support Ukrainian scholarship and arts that have been disrupted by this destructive and brutal war. My name is Helena Hrin, I'm the president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Our patron, the poet Taras Shevchenko once commented in his biography with the words, my story is the story of my people. Something similar can be said of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. It was founded by private donations in 1873, long before a fully constituted state came into being in 1917. The society was designed as an academy of sciences to provide the intellectual foundation for this desired state. And in fact, its longtime and probably most effective president, Mikhail Hrushevsky, ended up being the first president of the Ukrainian National Republic. The society has thus shared the tortuous path of its country or, or the country of its um, study, the ups and downs of imperial subjugation, world war, displacements, upheavals, and so up to the present day. Our society numbers about 400 members and is comprised of five academic sections, arts, history and social sciences, philology, medicine and biology, and math and physical and applied sciences. Each of them will be represented in today's lectures, in addition to a number of panels that deal with various initiatives called forth by the war. They represent only a small fraction of what members have been doing since the war's outbreak. And in fact, we could mount another half dozen such marathons to cover all of it if we had the time. Since February 24th, and in fact, several weeks beforehand, uh, during the buildup to the invasion, there has been a veritable explosion of activity. Articles, public lectures, webinars, media consultations, concerts, literary and art exhibits, temporary placement of scholars in Western institutions, important discussions about university curricula, and massive participation in the humanitarian and political effort. I think we can all, I, I won't thank you because you, you can thank the rest of us. I think we are all very moved by everything that we have done. Uh, I would like to thank each of the speakers uh, that have dedicated their time today and um, all of you for participating. The scale of the challenge before us is overwhelming. Uh, just recently, um, I, um, an, another Ukrainian institution announced 30 fellowships, 30 residential fellowships in Ukraine and received 700 applications. I think Ukraine is a highly educated country. It is um, it, the, the, the destruction of institutions, the displacement of people is massive. And I think with everything else that we are doing, the Shevchenko Society would also like to participate in um, doing what we can to further the cause of Ukrainian scholarship, which is extremely important, especially in a situation where the, um, the aim of this war is to erase um, Ukraine uh, as, a, uh, as a nation and as a cultural entity. Therefore, uh, I want to thank everyone who has um, worked hard to make this seminar, uh, this marathon, expertise a happen. And um, probably no one um, more than um, Markian Dobchansky, who I would like to now invite to say a few words about this, um, about this event. Uh, so Markian, please. Uh, thank you so much, Elena. Um, I'd like to echo uh, the thanks that we extended to our speakers today and to um, our audience for being here um, and for all of us who have uh, been with us as we have um, been observing what's going on in Ukraine. Um, it's a very um, difficult moment, but it's a moment that um, I think um, has, has shined a light on Ukraine in a way that um, few events have 
um, up to this point, both um, among um, Western observers, but also, um, you know, the attention of the world is really focused on Ukraine in unprecedented ways. And <clears throat> obviously, with, um, you know, millions of people displaced, there's a great need um, among um, Ukrainians who have been displaced. Um, so, in, with that in mind, um, we decided, the Shochenko Scientific Society decided to inaugurate the Shochenko Emergency Fund, which will create um, fellowships that are designed for both residential and non-residential formats. Um, and they will benefit Ukrainian scholars, writers, and artists who have been affected by the war. Um, this expertise thon will benefit the emergency fund. So all donations that are made to the Entesha today um, will go directly to that fund. And so I wanna thank you all um, for being with us, for being willing to learn more, to hear from experts, writers, practitioners, doctors, uh, volunteer activists, and um, to learn a lot, listen to what you're interested in, um, give what you can to support our colleagues. Um, the purpose is threefold. Um, so first of all, um, we'd like to unite our community in the common purpose of sharing knowledge. The Shuchenko Scientific Society is a scholarly organization and um, all of us are engaged at least in some way in scholarship and in educating the public. So this is one of our key core missions as an organization. Um, second, the goal is to elevate Ukrainian voices and expertise. Um, many people, um, the, the joke on Twitter is that uh, for two years I was an epidemiologist and now I'd like to announce that I'm an expert on Ukraine. Um, but um, many people actually are experts um, and we need to elevate uh, the voices of, of experts who know a thing or two about Ukraine and elevate the voices of our colleagues. And so we're very pleased to have with us um, two colleagues who are currently in Ukraine, um, Timothy Brick and Roman Moskalenko, um, who will be on later today. And um, the, third, the third goal, which I've already mentioned, is um, we're going to uh, raise money for the Shuchenka Emergency Fund. So um, this event is free and open to the public, and I'm very pleased um, to, um, to welcome you all um, today. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Helena, um, who will uh, begin our first panel on volunteering and uh, humanitarian assistance. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, Mirkian. Our first panel, I think that one can probably say that uh, that um, epidemiolo epidemiologist uh, comment applies here because you have people here who have been um, spent their lives in scholarship, but now have thrown themselves into volunteering humanitarian aid and uh, have become certainly if not, ex well, experts on Ukraine goes without saying, but experts on dealing with Ukraine during the, um, during the, uh, the war effort, the, the situation we have now. Our first speaker is Emily Channel Justice. I uh, first met her when she was writing her dissertation in the middle of the events of the Maidan. Uh, she is an anthropologist. She has, um, delved into the Ukrainian field to the point where she is now the director of the Temerte Contemporary Ukraine Program at the Ukrainian Research Institute and has been um, in some ways even spearheading many of the um, many of the initiatives of the Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, she is um, a, a member of Entesha and well known to all of us for her many presentations and articles that she has been um, presenting uh, in the in the last um, in the last bit and in the last time, bit of time that we have all been involved. Uh, Stephen Siegel is professor of Slavic and Eurasian studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of Map Men: Transnational Lives and Deaths of Geographers in the Making of East Central Europe. Uh, published in 2018, Ukraine Under Western Eyes, Harvard University Press 2013, and Mapping Europe's Borderlands, Russian Cartography in the Age of Empire. 
Uh, Professor Siegel is a former director at the Harvard University uh, Ukrainian um, Summer Institute. And uh, you can find him active on Twitter. I must also add that he has recently joined the um, faculty at the University of Texas at Austin and has been doing many things, including uh, setting up programs for Ukrainian uh, scholars, which I think he will tell you about as well. Uh, the um, third speaker, John Vsetichka, is uh, someone who <laughs> almost ended up in the middle of the war. He was a full, he is a um, graduate student uh, completing his dissertation uh, at the University of Michigan. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's, is, is it Michigan State University, perhaps, yes. Um, and, um, and he was on a Fulbright Fellowship in Ukraine. They were evacuated to Warsaw. And um, he spent a considerable amount of time helping with the volunteer effort there. And uh, at the same time, uh, working on his uh, scholarly um, in scholarly um, obligations at, at the same time. So I will begin, uh, our talks are roughly 10 to 15, uh, 10, 12 minutes with a few minutes for, um, for questions at the end. Uh, please uh, give, uh, add your questions into the Q&A uh, part of, at, at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, screen and we will try to deal with them. We will, uh, we will have to, you know, be strict with time because come, uh, come 10 o'clock, the next panel will come on. So Emily, please. Thank you so much, Helena. Thanks for that introduction. And thank you so much to Mark Yan for organizing this just truly fantastic lineup. Um, and I'm really delighted to start things off with two other fantastic panelists. Um, thanks so much for everybody to joining. Uh, you know, I think this is just a wonderful way to, to show the vast area of expertise that the membership of Intisha contains. Um, so as Helena mentioned, I previously did my dissertation research during the Euromaidan protests. And this is something, it wasn't intentional. I just happened to be doing my research already with activists at the time um, that those protests began. And it made for a very interesting research experience as you can guess. And um, it, it sort of took me some time to assess what had happened during those protests and the kind of information I was looking at and, and be able to, you know, step back and really understand what the key um, elements of that research were. And, and I'm very grateful for the chance to have done that because what I have actually found is that the concept of self-organization, which is at the kind of foundation of my book, uh, book project, is something that began in 2013 and 2014 during the Euromaidan protests, but it's absolutely foundational to what we're seeing now as part of the Ukrainian response to the war. So I'm just gonna take my 10 minutes to talk a little bit about the origins of this idea of, of self-organization based on my research experience, and then look at how self-organization has shaped um, participation in, in Ukrainian politics since 2014, and then how this has transformed in the, the, the past uh, 60 days. So, my concept of self-organization is very fundamental. The idea is that if something needs to be done and you are a person who has the capability of doing that thing, then you should simply do it. And this is it's a, obviously, you know, no frills idea. It's very basic. Um, and it comes out of, I was working with uh, independent student and feminist and leftist activists in Ukraine in the, in the 20, 20, 2012 is when I began my research. Um, and these people were sort of working far outside of party politics. So they did not want to get involved in political parties, um, but they wanted to be political activists and they had different skills, different abilities um, in terms of what they, they could do politically. Um, and they based this idea of self-organization very much on leftist political philosophy and, and the kind of Marxist idea of to each, from each according to his abilities and to each according to his needs. So the activists that I was working with were conceptualizing self-organization as a fundamentally leftist political concept. Um, 
when the Euromaidan protests began, these activists were very active. They wanted to be present. They understood that this protest movement was a very important moment in terms of Ukraine's kind of political development. Um, and so they they found different ways to be involved, but that ways that honored their political ideologies. And what we ended up seeing was despite in the first few weeks of Maidan, party political parties were very present. They were they were sort of trying to to gain control um, over those conversations, over those protests. But m- most people who participated in the protests actually wanted not very much to do with those political parties. Um, and so what we ended up seeing was that the the Euromaidan protests as a whole very much became self organized. Um, they were very they were very far outside of party politics. Um, politicians with established parties and platforms were not necessarily the most powerful people at any stage of the protest. And that really opened up Euromaidan to be a much more inclusive, kind of politically diverse space. And that's that's what my, my forthcoming book is about. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, what I found in the kind of long term um, is that looking at self-organization tells us a lot, not just about the Euromaidan protest. And this concept is something, you know, like I said, started out in this very leftist ideology, but became much more broad to the point that groups as far as the very far right right sector and such groups were also claiming to be self-organized. Um, and that's a very interesting, you know, way, kind of organizing concept that, that a, a thing that self-organization does is that it, it can be very flexible like that. But what we found was that the response to the initial war, so the illegal annexation of Crimea and then the first Russian invasion in 2014, the response to that was also very self-organized. And in my book, I argued, even before February 24th, I argued that this self-organization of the response to the first invasion was very much grounded in Euromaidan. So people already knew that they could have this kind of response because they did it in the protests. So people were gathering supplies for soldiers. And remember at this time in 2014, the Ukrainian military was much more poorly organized than it is today. It was largely made up of volunteer forces. Many of those forces got their start on Euromaidan as volunteer brigades. And so you had ordinary people who were volunteering to fight ordinary people who were volunteering to give them supplies or ordinary people who were sending those supplies and then ordinary people at the front lines when displacement began as well. So when you saw major waves of displacement from Donetsk and Luhansk regions in 2014 and really you know, up until more recent years, those responses were also self-organized. So in my book, I, I I make I kind of look at these connections between the different stages of self-organization. And the really fundamental thing is that Euromaidan was this moment that was very particular because it allowed people to see that self-organization would work. If everybody contributed based on what they could, then there was no need to rely on, for example, the state. Um, or in in the terms of displacement, no need to rely on international organizations because people could do it themselves. Um, And I think that that's really what is so, um, you know, I I don't know if heartening is is exactly the right word. Um, One of the things that I've noticed in terms of Western media coverage of the invasion that happened on February 24th was really a, a general surprise that the Ukrainian response was so robust. And that so many people were willing to put themselves on the line. I mean, I remember being on one one news broadcast where the the commentator was absolutely shocked when he said, but I I saw that the Ukrainian government tweeted about how to make a Molotov cocktail. And can you believe that they're asking people to do that? And I I almost chuckled a little bit because of this. Like, well, of course, you know, first of all, this is totally a reference to people making Molotov cocktails on Euromaidan. But this idea that, you know, ordinary people not only can do something, but should do something, that's that's what that evoked to me. And that response is very surprising to a lot of Americans who haven't been following Ukraine. Um, but for many of us, you know, we're not very shocked to see this robust response. To me, what's most interesting is the response at so many different levels. So not only have we seen, um, you know, within Ukraine, People are gathering funds, people are 
um, sourcing whatever they can. So ranging from military equipment and supplies to medicine, to food, um, to, you know, whatever is, is needed. Um, volunteers within Ukraine are driving those supplies around to deliver them wherever they need to be. Um, I've also seen a lot of people who are, for instance, um, you know, somebody needs to get out of Kiev to go somewhere else that, you know, I have a car, I have this many seats, right? These are all very kind of low level um, network responses among people who know each other, but who know that the best solution is often the self-organized solution, right? The one where people who have a resource say, I have this resource, who needs it, right? And, and it's distributed um, through those networks. And so I think that this idea of self-organization and these self-organized responses really come from that experience of 2014. We know that we can do this because we have already done it. And we've also seen, and I, I, I'm sure my, my other colleagues will talk a lot more about this, you know, these networks aren't just in Ukraine. They're all across the border. They're responding to people who have been displaced as well. Um, you know, many of, many of the organizations meeting refugees at the Polish border, they're not state organizations and they're not international organizations. They're, they're small local humanitarian organizations that are there to help. I'm sure there's a lot more to discuss about, you know, the actual experience of displacement, the actual effectiveness of these organizations. But I really think if we really, you know, if we want to look at the genealogy of this response, I think it goes back to Euromaidan and this idea of self-organization. Um, I think I'm at my, my 12 minutes, so I will stop there. But, but thanks so much to everybody for joining. And I look forward to any questions that you might have. Uh, well, uh, while, while the audience is uh, thinking of their questions and still getting geared up uh, early in the morning uh, for some, uh, I uh, maybe will ask you uh, just maybe to say a few words in your capacity as the Temerte um, uh, director, if you would, um, what are some of the other initiatives that, that have been happening? Uh, in your organization. Absolutely, thank you. Um, well, I, I see, you know, being in a position of um, where my whole, you know, role is to is to take on the task of talking about Ukraine. Um, I really see that the that the Temerate Contemporary Ukraine program has um, a, a priority of information sharing and making sure that we are working to share good information, spread good information, and uh, not just to our academic community, but, but more broadly as well. There's great interest in our local community in Massachusetts and beyond, um, you know, just to understand a little bit more. I think, I think average people in the U.S. are really in this position where they want to be empathetic to Ukraine, but they're not really sure why. And so they're asking a lot of questions and having, you know, the resource that we've created um, with the help of my colleagues at Huri, this uh, our website about the war. We share all kinds of information. Um, and that's one of the resources that people have been using. I've personally been giving talks at lots of local libraries, um, which has been just really, the response has been fantastic. People just really want to understand more. Um, so I think this is, you know, one of really information is one of the main things that we can do. And Helena, you also mentioned that Curie is, is partnering with the IWM in Vienna, where I am actually right now. And we're working to do also these non-residential fellowships so that people can remain in Ukraine. Um, I think these types of resources are, are just really essential right now because people are still, you know, they're trying to make decisions and, and things are happening really fast and, and giving people the chance to, you know, not be forced to move and fill out visa applications and, and uh, relocate, you know, while, while they're making those decisions. Those are really wonderful initiatives. So those are just two things. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Val. I, we, we have another two minutes. Um, I, I suppose I, I can just uh, comment that certainly um, Maidan has, uh, was something of a, um, well, uh, the, the volunteering effort and the self-organization came from Maidan. But of course, there is uh, traditionally, perhaps not so much in, in, in the Soviet experience, but even if you look back to something like Marta Bohachevska's book, Feminists Despite Themselves, and the, the, the whole, the whole um, Western Ukrainian experience uh, with their underground movement, it is, and then also it's not just in Ukraine, I think the, the way that the Ukrainian community has mobilized in, 
in the United States with these incredible um, volunteer or organizations <clears throat> that, um, well, of course, but there's always room for more. There's always room for more. And as I said, it's, it's, still, it's still an overwhelming challenge. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that uh, we will then ask our, our next speaker, Stephen Siegel, to tell us, um, to, to speak on, on both his area of expertise and, um, and some of the things that he's been doing. Stephen, please. So thank you, um, Helena, and thanks to all of you for the work that you're doing. I want to echo exactly what Emily was talking about with this sense of mutual aid and the pooling of resources. This is really what I've been doing um, since February 24th and before that, um, in fact, back to the late 1990s when I had been a union activist at Brown University and then suddenly was introduced my, by my late and beloved advisor, Patricia Hurley, he, the historian of Odessa, uh, to the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and, and the lovely people there. I also want to pay tribute today to Tamara Nari, who, who I really um, respected and, and loved and who recently died of cancer. Um, she, for so many years at Hurey and at Harvard, had been the engine for Ukrainian studies. I remember putting together the summer school and events with her, and, and I, I really wish all condolences to her family today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the February 24th archive, this project that I began uh, in the middle of the night during the war. Um, and I had been aware, of course, as a historian who had written books in geography and cartography, had worked with human rights activists, um, including Russian journalists, as well as Ukrainians involved with Amnesty and, and Human Rights Watch and some other organizations really back to the early 2000s and, and back to the Chechen Wars and, and um, ultimately after 9-11. I'll write, read a little piece that I wrote um, for uh, the public audience uh, a month after the large-scale war started, emphasizing, of course, that this is the continuation of an eight-year war at the end of 2014. So let me start with that, and then I'll talk a little bit about the archive as I've envisioned it, and, and hopefully as it continues. Um, I'll just say that uh, since I started it, I've gained some 12,000 followers, and, and those are people from all around the world, and, and I'll explain this a little bit. So in the piece I wrote for a new fascism syllabus just published, in the darkness on February 24th, I tried to set a historical tone. I don't know what was in my mind on Twitter exactly as I began tweeting. I had a plan to mobilize and connect by the scholarly hundreds, then by thousands in the streets. I thought of recording protest using ethical tools for lived history, not likes, because who cares? And the living past, a sense of long, knowledgeable causation. In rewind, or as Marcy Shore calls it, in loops, drafts backward, correcting drafts, warnings of 1939, of 1914, drawing from Polish, Polish solidarity in 1980, Prague in 1968, Belarusian women and labor strikes of 2020, Mustafa Nayem in November 2013, don't count, Tahrir, Eurasian color revolutions. Messaging, because I worry about being a propagandist for causes I don't believe in. Career suicide too, because all of this is quite emotional. February 24th is a limit experience, a new scale of violence, 1941, 1939, transposed to Cold War, 1962, the atomic age. Forget 1997, 1995, NATO, the Crimson Herring. Mariupol in 2022 to Aleppo, Grozny, Yemen, Guatemala, El Salvador, Chile, Guernica, or loosely a kind of Noah's Ark, 
a biblical time, two by two, side by each, rescue from Ukraine. Atrocity journalists taken hostage in panic, disfigured bodies under rubble, targeted schools, distant geopoliticians from DC, more great power man pomposity, power flattering Siloviki from Moscow, future denizens of The Hague, oligarchs, yachts, and jets, cross-border prisoners of war, and I'm adamant that it's not shown, dogs, cats, bunnies, roosters, and llamas, eco-parks, children in hospitals, future painters, sliders down metros, blown up churches and mosques, blocked trains, crowded stations, unpretentious rabbis, wasted taxes, tractors pulling tanks, jokes and blood-soaked memes, more despair, flowers and green, fields of grain, poison, profanity, unleashed by the brightest fucking minds. Voters and survivors dead, scraps of Nazi donated metal Z junk, near nuclear disaster, radiation, sunflowers, grain, water, soil. Here, I emphasize the pain of Ukrainians. And I emphasize all people who are the keepers of updates in simultaneous time. Those who rescue, those who know the history of genocide. This shows human engagement against apathy and prejudice, where friends and family are. Real time, truth and post-truth, journalistic ethics, portals for war crimes, history books that once were catastrophic, premonitions, of corruption, of chains, of money in shadows, of crimes documented in Ukraine committed by extraordinaries, of mother's pain, ethnic cleansing, histories of famine, civilian deaths, lessons unlearned, genocide president, prevention that fails. All these abuses of the past, Ukraine's history, colonialism, imperialism, ethno-nationalism, territorial revisionism. What's the purpose to all of this archiving other than to keep a record of tragedy? I'm a professor and a historian of space. I could talk about my work. I wrote books, hopefully people read them. Hopefully they won't be out of print. Uh, hopefully people pay attention to Ukrainian history in them, but I can't force people to read. I live and die by history and historical geography and occasionally a few maps. As an academic at a pivotal moment, I see potential for us to recognize a country and a people, 44 million people in fact, who share pain. And they share experience, which allows us to do this incredible, point plotted, inspiring work of documentation. Who among us will make policy, master digital tools, write to journalists and diplomats, become the best of protesting activists? There are some in this room. Gather funds, build archives, info, maps, data, intelligence open source intelligence, all our years of expertise, perhaps finally recognized, to seek to assist the victims of unspeakable horrors across borders, illuminating writers, translators, let's name them please, and diarists, turn off the sirens that will haunt our children's memories until their deaths hold spontaneous concerts, share, anthologize, pay for violins, dance, accordions, sound systems, pianos, give 
refugees, those on our planet, education, homes, and health. Have memories, get out of capital comforts, bubbles, and cities. Know which words are stale or useless babble in rubble. Study languages, study Ukrainian, focus on the marginalized, focus on the names. Here in studying Ukraine, I'm optimistic, actually. I refuse to bid farewell to lands and times shared by a population of a country. It exists. My students, peers, and I share a wound. We will mourn this unprovoked trauma outside these words and our Zoom screens. We haven't lost each other, and we're united in voice, many voices, tweeting or not tweeting, shrieking out our rage and grief. Please don't ever forget the grief. Um, I can't follow myself, but I would like to just simply say uh, to all of you here who are interested in the past and future of Ukraine, to follow each other and to do what you can for each other at this moment. Um, this is beyond social media, obviously. My agenda with the February 24th archive has been to platform experts. This is a governing philosophy that I have. Uh, it has been to cover and make sure that they are covering um, journalists who are abiding by truth and not actively carrying on Kremlin propaganda. I've also endeavored in the spirit of Entisha Ah, and I'm very proud to be a new member of this, and um, Helena knows this, um, all the different disciplines which are constantly expanding. This is history, this is math and science, science for Ukraine, these are the social sciences, anthropology, sociology, what Dr. Channel Justice is doing, I think very admirably with the Temerty program. I'm also trying very hard to reach out to NGOs and INGOs and those who might simply be voters and citizens uh, and to connect them with all of these different overlapping and concentric circles uh, this is what I think maps can do. This is what I think open source intelligence can do. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it, because this is a fundraising endeavor, and I've written a, a poem of sorts for um, the purpose of, of things like this, I, I hope that we can begin to understand media in all of its forms outside the echo chambers of one platform or another. Facebook inadequate, Twitter inadequate thinking about what other possibilities we may not see over the horizon in keeping this record of a war, I think, that has in our lives transformed the world. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a very um, moving, uh, Present, presentation of, of everything that we are all experiencing. And I think it also captures the fact that everything is happening on 20 different tracks at the same time. Everybody is working, everybody's feeling, everybody's experiencing. And it's definitely not a linear experience, either in our organization or personally. It is something we all, um, we all feel coming at us from all directions. Uh, perhaps you can give us, um, as, as, as far as your, your platform, you will give us the um, organization, I, I mean, the, the link and the, and, the, and the Twitter feed for your um, archive, or is this, uh, or perhaps just explain uh, a little bit more about, about this 24, uh, February 24th archive. Sure. I, I thought I would um, read my writing a little bit, but as it, yes, it, yes, oh, but just I, no, don't leave us without actually uh, sure. giving us the the cord. I 
I, I can say more tangibly, and I think concretely in, in less purple prose, that we're working throughout the summer with granting agencies and digital archive projects to develop this. And I am very glad to have the support of, of multiple universities, um, including um, people who have, have been involved with SUCHO, uh, which I think is a fantastic um, program for archiving and preserving Ukraine's heritage. And, and this involves, of course, the destruction of museums, uh, and historical archives, as well as churches, schools, universities. So I'm in the process at this point through the summer and, and potentially the early fall uh, of securing some grants to make sure that this uh, giant, um, I think, resource uh, collecting threads, there are thousands of them, opinions, articles, uh, connecting policymakers with writers and poets and translators is, is there for posterity. So the archive itself, uh, I'm currently developing together with um, data viz people, uh, those who are working with the visualization aspect of this, as well as with the hashtags. Um, everything that I record, and, and sometimes I've worked 16 to 18 hour days around the clock to record it in multiple languages, um, is, is there. So it hasn't disappeared. Um, and I, I take this very seriously because I, I do think that uh, people tend to often think of digital media or new digital media as perishable, that they're, that they're going on a platform and, and perhaps also that they don't have accountability on that platform. Um, and, and I think that if anything I've learned um, from my own activism and, and from the Trump era and, and other eras, um, it, it's that you have to hold people accountable. Uh, and, and I would hope actually in my work on Twitter, because that's been the main platform, I can't be on all of them at once, uh, that these um, endeavors to, to make sure that experts have a louder voice, uh, especially um, women in the profession, uh, and people of color and LGBTQ, I'm known for this in the podcasts that I've done for New Books Network. I wanna make sure that there are voices uh, of people who really know what they're talking about, who know the Ukrainian language, culture, history, who've been to Ukraine, spent time in Ukrainian region cities. Uh, and so that's been my endeavor through this. I would hope in the next couple of months, uh, as we begin securing some grants, that it will be public, publicly act accessible for everybody who is here in this room and, and beyond. Thank you very much. And, uh, and that uh, archive was featured on PBS NewsHour last night. So it, the word is getting out. Uh, John, please, uh, we, you we, we cut into your time a little bit, but um, please. And, and thank you again, Stephen, for everything that you've been doing. I've been following you from the weeks before the war and um, You've really been a whirlwind of activity. Thank you. John, please. Great, thank you. Um, I hope that it's possible that I can share my screen here so everyone can. Okay, can you see that okay? Okay, fantastic. Uh, so today what I want to do is I want to build on the things that Stephen and Emily have talked about today, which is about volunteering and the efforts that we've put in to Ukraine since February 24th, and for most of us um, beyond that, uh, both before and after. And so what I want to do is give you sort of a visual representation of what it was like to actually work on the ground with refugees in Poland and beyond. And I think that you read about this in the news every day, but I'm not sure that everyone has a clear understanding of exactly what this looks like. So let me give you some perspective from my experience. The, this all started in really October for me. Um, I was in Ukraine since October of 2021. I arrived there in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the red zone, in the middle of a city that was in theory shut down, but not a still thriving metropolis, of course, as Kyiv is. And I was there on a Fulbright grant to conduct dissertation research. I had settled in quite nicely and it was um, all sort of abruptly ended 
on in, in late January when I found out from Fulbright Ukraine that I was going to be evacuated. Now troops had been amassing on the borders uh, for months. Everyone had been following it closely, but many were skeptical about what would actually happen. And so when I got the news that I was actually going to be forced to leave, uh, I had 72 hours to pack up my apartment, get a COVID test so I could enter a different country and get my affairs in order in Ukraine so that I could leave. Now, fortunately, due to Fulbright Ukraine's connection with Fulbright Poland, we were invited to go to Warsaw, where we would, in theory, continue our grants remotely. And so uh, on January 26th, it was my last day in Ukraine, um, I left on a flight to Warsaw, thinking that I would be in Warsaw for about 30 days until we could hopefully return, but obviously things changed. When I got to Poland, I was only there for a couple of weeks before people started to get actually really concerned about what was happening with Putin's troops on the borders. Um, it was a time when global consternation had become of the utmost concern. Along with many of my fellow Fulbrighters, friends, colleagues, um, and, and other folks that were in Warsaw at the time, we started going to every demonstration and protest that was occurring. Now, a lot of these started before February 24th, um, we were protesting um, the absurd history that Putin was propagating. We were, you know, we were protesting at the embassies, at the Russian embassy, at the German embassy, uh, things over the SWIFT accounts, all these types of things that happened actually before February 24th. But when the bombs actually started falling on February 24th, these protests increased dramatically. And we started to be outside in front of the embassies almost every day. Um, which included harassment, stalking, following, and all kinds of other concerns that come along with demonstrating, um, you know, your, your disenchantment with uh, Russian aggression in, in Ukraine. And it was in this moment that me and so many others uh, that carry these academic titles, I think, dropped those in that moment and traded them in for activist ones. And we were in a position in that moment to help um, Ukraine and the Ukrainians that would be affected by the war that would only intensify in the coming days. Now, when I was in Poland, my first concern was for my friends and family in Ukraine or people that I consider family. And the, the folks that you see here are some of my best friends that made the harrowing journey from Kyiv in the middle of the bombing campaigns to Warsaw. It took them 10 days. And as you'll notice, they had at the time a one month old baby with them, their newborn daughter, baby Sophia. My activism started with them. I wanted to help get them to safety. I was in coordination with them every day as they navigated checkpoints, crossing through different cities in Ukraine, trying to get into different villages, cities and towns before curfew hit. We also monitored crossing uh, checkpoint crossings. The, the times that it would take at each crossing, trying to find them the best route to go because with a newborn child, they were not able to be outside. Uh, what at the time was about 48 hours of waiting time at some of these crossings, uh, they just couldn't do it. So eventually they joined me in Warsaw. We got them there safely and they came to live with me. And the four of us uh, um, moved into a one bedroom apartment together. In fact, they just came to live with me and my neighbor from Kiev as well, who is now doing refugee work in Poland right now, also joined us. And so there were four adults and a little baby living in the apartment together. And you can see pictures of um, me playing with baby Sophia in these images. Now, we all started living together. And when I got my friends to safety, the refugee crisis started to intensify. It went from at first hundreds of people to thousands of people to hundreds of thousands of people to millions really quickly that were coming into Poland to escape the war. In that moment, all of us that were living together started to receive phone calls, messages. My WhatsApp was blowing up constantly from people asking for help. And so in that moment, we turned our apartment into kind of a command center. I was on the computer finding housing for people. Um, we were speaking in multiple languages, trying to coordinate, and this was helpful. We were helping them get jobs, helping them find money. We were donating our own money to these folks. And we started to become really good at what we were doing essentially because we had connections in Poland already because we had been there. And at this moment, we really use, utilize social media, something that I think Stephen has talked about and the organization, the self-organization that Emily talked about, we tapped into these existing networks. And so Twitter became a main platform where I was able to secure housing safely uh, and honestly for a lot of people and Facebook as well. And these tools were invaluable in this moment. 
And in addition to helping these people virtually, we started going to the border, which I had been doing since I got there to give people rides back to different uh, locations, mostly in Warsaw. And you can see pictures of the border here. Um, and we started to, to work with different groups of people. We would drive down and whoever wasn't driving would be managing the Telegram channel in multiple languages, figuring out who needed rides, when and where. And this was the kind of activism that we all got ourselves into in that moment. Now, spending this time in Poland gave us a perspective where we were able to see some of the failures of the humanitarian aid that was supposed to be there, but wasn't. And something that was very notable to all of us spending our time on the borders was the absence of large humanitarian orgs, groups like the Red Cross and others who in theory should be there helping, but visibly were not, or so at least we could tell. And we used our expertise in this moment to fill in gaps that we saw essentially, like writing for many of us who are historians into the historiography, what hasn't been discussed, where can we contribute? This is what we did. And in these pictures here, you can see um, some of the supplies that we started buying. We bought out all the military stores in Warsaw, thermal underwear, all these things to send to Ukraine. And we started organizing grassroots style and fundraising rather successfully. And we were all doing this for, uh, you know, as volunteers, we don't take a penny of it. And every penny that's earned uh, goes directly to Ukraine. And so you can see some of our efforts here, the things that we were buying, the things that we were sending. All of this was going into Ukraine because we had tapped into the existing Ukrainian networks, which many other organizations have not been able to successfully integrate with. Um, to us, they are our friends and the people that we have spent a lot of time with working with not only as friends, but as colleagues in Ukraine. We relied on them, we listened to them, and we talked to them to figure out what their needs were and what they needed was money and supplies. And so we provided that, and then they got things into Ukraine into the hardest hit cities within 48 hours. And we continue to do this work today. Our group, which originally was just a grassroots team of displaced persons from Kyiv who ended up in Warsaw together, became a group called For Peace. And we are now doing humanitarian work on a global scale. So let me wrap up here since I know we don't have much time. We now have what I would call transnational supply chains. Due to, due to our success um, in the months of February, March, and April, which was at first, like I said, just a small group of people trying to help the country that we love and admire, turned into something bigger. We now work regularly with consulates, embassies, and foreign governments all over the world to facilitate aid in strategic and helpful ways. And we have partnered with all kinds of groups and, and people in Ukraine, including hospitals in hard hit cities, territorial defense units, citizen groups, and others. And we're providing this critical aid that they need. And some of our big projects now are supplying the hospitals with the types of medicines that they need. And they've become reliant on us to provide them so they can continue to treat those who are wounded. We also are working on water projects to, to promote clean water. And this has been another a big task of ours. And right now, I, I am in the United States at this moment, but um, I'm, I'm tapping into the supply chains here to be able to provide these types of things that can then go to Poland and right into Ukraine in the shortest amount of time possible. So although I'm in the US for now, we have team members all over the country. And in addition to writing the dissertation, which is my other full-time job, I'm still continuing to do humanitarian work. And I wanna leave it with this, that you've had some understanding now of what this can look like, what grassroots efforts look like, what um, organization that Emily talked about looks like, and it, it'll continue to develop as such. But I want to remind everyone that, you know, um, your contributions to people and groups like the Shevchenko Society that provide scholarships to those who are in need are also helping supply critical transnational networks. And the aid that's going to continue to develop for Ukraine is not limited to border countries such as Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. Um, the way that we help is global now and everyone can help. You don't have to be at the border on the Poland-Ukraine border. You don't have to be in Ukraine. Um, you can be all over the world and help. And so I, I invite you to check out um, our group for peace if you're interested in doing such after you donate, of course, to the Shevchenko Society to support the displaced uh, scholars from Ukraine. Um, remember that it's going to take this transnational effort on behalf of all of us to keep helping Ukraine, to keep supplying them with everything that they need. And I'm happy, of course, if you want to reach out to me personally, I can tell you more about this experience, more about how these things work, more about the humanitarian relief efforts that are going on now.
So thank you very much for allowing me to talk with you today. And I, I, I hope um, that we can all continue to do our best to help Ukraine during this harrowing war. Thank you very much, John. This is uh, truly a, um, a moving experience to see that, you know, what one or two or a few people, you have a kernel of a small group of, of three or four people in an apartment, and then suddenly it has grown into this um, large international effort. Uh, I think that uh, your email is and, and your Twitter is on on the chat for anyone who wants to get in touch with you and um, uh, we're very grateful uh, Emily we are we have one minute but Emily has a question please I was just wondering if John could maybe say a, a one or two words about um, if you have any you know sense of why those large international organizations were unable to be at the border I, I think that's something that's really striking striking and maybe something that people don't realize um, you know is 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 that they've been absent and you're not the only person that I've heard this from, but, but I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, thanks Emily, it's a great question. You know, I wanna preface this by saying, um, I'm an academic and not a humanitarian worker, although I guess I am now. So uh, my, my history in these kinds of things was limited up until what happened. And, uh, you know, I, I think, and everyone else that I've worked with on the border and talked to that did work on the border, every now and then you'll come across that maybe says UNICEF or Red Cross, and there's nothing under the tent. There's nobody, there's no coordination. And there wasn't any kind of big coordination from states or governments or big uh, NGOs when this initially took place. I think the problem is, is there, and this is something that we can talk about historically, are some troubled uh, relationships between some of these groups uh, working in Ukraine that have a long history of actually failing Ukraine in times of crises. Not everyone, but there are there is a history of this. And as someone who um, works on the history of the Holodomor and famine in Ukraine, um, the Red Cross, uh, we could talk about that in detail about instances where uh, these types of help, these instances of help didn't come. I would also say, I think the bigger thing that's at stake is a lot of these groups don't know how to work um, really strategically with the already pre-existing Ukrainian networks that are there. Um, I think we need to remember that the goal of humanitarian help is not us in the West telling Ukrainians how they need to do their own kind of help, right? It's listening to them, really actually listening and hearing what their needs are and then providing them with what they're asking for. And this has been something that um, goes beyond just the humanitarian help. Look at the way that Zelensky has been asking for other types of help, right? And this is really a, a litmus test for how we listen to, to Ukraine and to Ukrainians. Uh, and so I think this in some way explains why there hasn't been as much success with those bigger organizations um, as opposed to our grassroots organizations. I also think it helps when you speak the language and you can talk to people in their native tongue. So uh, I, whatever we're doing seems to be working. And not only are Ukrainians now asking us for help, but uh, much larger entities as well. And so I hope, you know, our, our whole purpose is not to, to do um, all the work ourselves. We want to partner with, with other groups also doing help because that's how this really gets done is everyone has to work together. And so I think that's um, a, a reminder of grassroots organization is it fundamentally takes you back to those moments of cooperation. And I think that's coming to the forefront again. Thank you very much. We are two minutes over. I um, want to thank the speakers very much for all they do and for speaking to us today. Uh, with uh, And I, will, I am turning this over to Markian Dubchansky who will uh, who has um, who will remind us of um, the need to donate and um, Markian. Thank you so much, Helena. Um, thank you to Emily, Stephen, and John um, for sharing their expertise and their experiences with us. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that um, we are um, accepting donations today to benefit the Shochenka Emergency Fund. And I've put the logo and a QR code up on the screen. And while our next panel is getting ready, I'm going to um, play a song just to give everyone a breather. Um, but the next panel is History and Politics. Um, and it features um, four uh, members of the History, Social Science, and Law section of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. And it's going to be... Um, really great. And um, our chair is Mark Tanitsky. Um, and while everyone is, uh, I'd ask the panelists from the first panel to please uh, turn off your video and for people who are on the next panel to turn on your video. 
Um, give us a couple of minutes here and we'll be right back with you. Походи під морози, під негоди, чи живі не змерз. Не знав монах, де подіться, зайшов у кабак, погріться, збросив свій мундір. Збросив мундір ще очки, порвав ляси на плашки, сам пішов в ляса, сам пішов в ляса. Наплясався, наігрався з доброї волі, розпрощався, скочив на крильцо, вдарив у кольцо. Монах на коня садиться, під монахом конь різиться зеленим лугом, зеленим лугом. Лугом, 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 ходять дівчинки кругом, дівки не знайшов, до дави пішов. Цілував, милував, роз душею називав, закричав ура, закричав ура. Ой, ура, 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 сочинилася біда, де не мала я, де не мала я. Okay, um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we need to get, move on to the next um, panel. So I'd like to uh, introduce Mark Tanitsky, who is a freelance journalist in Washington, DC, and is an analyst of um, Ukrainian and international affairs. So Mark, please. And, and Mark is a new member of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Thank you, Dr. Dotsatsky, for inviting me, and thank you for this wonderful session. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the Shevchenko Scientific Society of America's event at this crucial time in Ukrainian and world history. We had a fantastic panel just on volunteering and humanitarian assistance in Ukraine. And as Dr. Dobchansky said, this next session will be on the history and politics. So following the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine, the society established a fundraiser that is willing and working to assist Ukrainian scholars, writers, and artists affected by Russia's war. As the previous panel stated, today's event, it, there will be over 30 scholars and activists who will share their experience on the conflict. And the purpose of today's webinar is to unite our community, to elevate Ukrainian voices and their expertise, and to raise money for the Shevchenko Emergency Fund. So as you see, we had the QR code earlier, that's where you can donate. Today's online event if, is free, but the suggested donations are $50. So with that, I will introduce the four fantastic panelists we have for the History and Politics panel. The first presenter is Dr. Johanna Petrovsky Stern. He is the Crown Family Professor of Jewish Studies and a Professor of History at Northwestern University. He teaches a variety of courses on early modern and modern Jewish history, Jews in Poland and Russia, Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah, history and culture of Ukraine and Slavic Jewish literatures. His most recent book is The Golden Age of Shtetl. He has written five other books and over 100 articles. His presentation for this panel is entitled New Wartime Discourse, What It Tells Us About Ukraine. 
So a quick overview, the panelists will be providing a brief 10 minute discussion and then they will take questions afterwards. So without further ado, Dr. Petrovsky Stern, the floor is yours. Um, Johanan, are you there? Okay, it looks like Johanan, Johanan has um, a baby at home, so he may be um, just away from his computer for the moment. So why don't we um, introduce the next speaker, uh, Mehil Fowler. All right. Great. So Dr. Mehil Favler is the director of the Stenson University's program in Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian studies. She teaches and researches the cultural history of Russia, Ukraine, and Eastern Europe. She has written numerous articles, and her first book, published in 2017, was Beaumont on Your Empire's Edge State in the Soviet Ukraine. A fun fact about Dr. Fowler, she is a former actress as well. So her presentation on this panel is Theater Then and Now, Understand Ukraine Through the Stage. Dr. Fowler, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I put the title of my book um, in, in the chat. Um, I would like to share my screen. Let me just see if I can do that. Fabulous. I assume you can see that. Okay, um, if Johanan yes, comes back on, thank you so much, just, just tell me. <clears throat> so I'm a scholar of theater, so this will be a talk in three acts. Um, I should start by saying this is not the arts panel, so um, let me address any concerns about theater first. You may think theater is unimportant, or at least hardly as central as geopolitics, foreign policy, or voting trends. Indeed, as a historian, and I am a historian, I've often faced a divide between theater history and real history. But why do people dismiss theater so? Theater reflects society, especially in a place like Eastern Europe where the state and society have deemed theater important precisely because there was not always a political nation or political avenues for expression. In these places, theater has reflected and continues to reflect society and it can help explain places. The stories we tell, tell us about ourselves. Let me just say that theater in Ukraine, the region that is today Ukraine, that was part of different empires and nations, theater in Ukraine and all the languages of the region constitutes a specific theatrical culture, and yet was also shaped by and shaped the theatrical cultures of the empires and nations that have ruled these lands. And I can tell you that after nearly 20 years of researching theater here, that it does help us understand Ukraine and that theater in Ukraine, even today, is extremely dynamic. So act one, methods, de-imperialization. Many of us who study Ukraine's culture, most of us who study Ukraine's culture, have been talking for years about the necessity of decolonizing the field of Slavic studies, challenging the hierarchies that take as unquestioned Moscow or St. Petersburg as center and Ukraine as periphery. I've been talking with Dr. Sofia Diak about unwinding empire. What if we unwound the thread of imperial culture dominating Ukraine and focused on Ukraine as a place, as an agent, as a cultural space in her own right? The art historian Piotr Petrovsky points out how certain places, Berlin, Paris, St. Petersburg, get to be universal cities of modernism or avant-garde. But places like Warsaw, Kyiv, Lviv are relegated to the national to Polish modernism or Ukrainian modernism. And it's clear that this cultural map resonates with the political map of which places get to matter to the general public and to politicians making life or death decisions. In my first book, Beaumont on Empire's Edge, I focused on de-imperializing the study of Soviet culture, which is so important because many scholars in the West still see Moscow as the only important artistic center. And what they miss is, as I call it, the geography of revolutionary culture and how, in fact, center and periphery radically shifted during the Soviet period, and not only. Ignoring Ukraine, or rather imagining Ukraine as producing only copies of art produced in Moscow, misses the very real cultural explosion that happened in Ukraine. 
and more broadly, the way that actually Soviet Ukraine was a driving force in the Soviet Union and Ukraine and the Russian Empire, of course. But mental blocks are hard to shake. The worldview that Moscow is the center and Ukraine the periphery is still in place, still, even today, in so much of the scholarship on the culture of this region. And this need to decolonize is urgent. This notion of Russian culture is not innocent. The general public, for example, in my world, often refers to Russian theater as something particularly excellent, without paying attention to the fact that much of this theater was a legacy of the Soviet Union. Artists may not have been Russian. There's a lot of great theater in languages other than Russian or in places that are not today Russia. And cultural infrastructures in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union were deeply imbricated with the state, like they are in Russia today. Russian culture silences other cultures, erases space. And my work seeks to investigate precisely how space, where artists work, shapes their creativity. So act two, my previous work. My goal in my book was to expand the Russia-dominated view of Soviet culture by showing how artists in Ukraine made great art totally unlike that in Moscow. And yet at the same time, my goal was to bring the imperial and Soviet context to these Ukrainian figures. And this methodology of showing how artists worked in larger contexts has happened long ago in other geographic regions, but this contextualization is really more fraught in the post-Soviet space precisely because the field is so very Russo-centric. And this is an epistemological challenge now, frankly. Um, my book is supposed to come out in Ukrainian translation this summer from Rodovid, and um, I have many thoughts about it and, and, and uh, feel very nervous about it. How do you talk about Soviet theater or Soviet culture in a nuanced way, taking these artists seriously in a time when it seems like only violence comes from Ukraine's neighbor, when it seems like all one can see is blood and violence and the graves at Solovki that seem inextricably linked to Bucha, to Mariupol, to Kharkiv, to, to Budinik Slovo bombed in March 2022, just as the inhabitants' lives were brutally cut short in the 1930s. How do you study Soviet Ukrainian culture without reverting to an unnuanced? Soviet versus Ukrainian. And I think you should study Soviet Ukrainian culture because Soviet Ukrainian was a real category for these artists. I think we need the larger context. Contextualizing does not mean rehabilitating the Russian empire, the Soviet Union. In fact, it means the opposite. Arguing that Kurbas was a Soviet artist does not mean he liked the Soviet Union. It simply means that we need to draw those contexts into explanations of how they made the art they did, when they did, where they did, why they did. How did they make art that was Soviet and that was also Ukrainian? Because they did. And to remove this task from the larger context diminishes it. And comparative context reveals their success. And in fact, in very few other places, was there such a creative outpouring as there was in Soviet Ukraine? And I argued that this was because of the diversity of the region, because of the productivity of artists from one um, artistic tradition encountering artists from another, because the experience of war shaped them more than elsewhere, because it was here that people who were not pre-war intelligentsia suddenly had the chance to tell their stories. And all of these regions make this region, this Soviet Ukraine, unique in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe and demand that it belong in syllabi outside Ukrainian studies. My work also takes the multi-ethnic context of Soviet Ukrainian culture seriously. One of Ukraine's distinguishing features was and is its multi-ethnicity. The Polish theater, for example, in Kiev was the only one in the entire Soviet Union. Its story is important. The study of Yiddish theater tends to center around Solomon Mikhail's and Gosset and Moscow, but the heartland was here in this region, um, in Ukraine and then Soviet Ukraine. And I'm one of the only people who works on Yiddish theater in Soviet Ukraine. It's a huge story. It's so open for further research. There was actually a Yiddish theater division of the Theater Institute in Kyiv. It must have had students because there was a Yiddish theater of working youth, a Yiddish theater of young spectators, and a Yiddish puppet theater, which won second place in an all-union competition in 1937. What makes this region specific? is its diversity. And there's a larger argument that I think Ukraine offers us about the benefits of diversity for creativity. Um, in many books and certainly in public discourse, it's often the nation that provokes creativity, but in fact, creativity comes from difference, I think. And one of the striking features of Ukraine was its many differences and is its many differences. And that must have impacted his artists. 
And very quickly, um, one of the shows I talk about in my book that I showed on the, the previous slide is Hello from Radio 477, Aluna Felicio Teresa Sim, uh, from 1929, the first ever uh, Ukrainian musical review. Um, and several years ago, I saw photos from another 1929 show at the Yiddish Theater um, uh, that seems to have some of the same tropes, the dancing girls, um, some of the masks, some of the, the comic elements. Um, and so there must have been some sort of cultural resonance between these um, milieus. So moving on to act three, my current work. I want to share two projects with you. One um, that I don't know what to do about is a biography of Prikvo, the theater of the Carpathian military district. Yes, the only Russian language theater in Lviv, the theater of the Soviet army that was active in the city from 1954 to 1991. I started this project in 2016 and I was interested in something totally not avant-garde um, and in the layers between local Republican and pan-Soviet culture, I was interested in war stories. Um, as war was being told in contemporary Ukrainian theater, I was really interested in how this older theater, this Soviet army theater, um, told and retold stories of World War II which resonated at first, but by the 80s, these stories were not true war stories and the theater was falling apart. Um, it's also an incredibly interesting theater because um, through several iterations, it is now uh, today's Teatr Lassi, right? Not associated with the military, Ukrainian language theater for uh, Lviv um, younger generation, which is doing really amazing and beautiful uh, humanitarian and theatrical work right now. And as I just argued in an article for Nationalities Papers, Teatr Lassi shows actually the successful transformation of post-Soviet infrastructure. I think the challenge for post-Soviet culture is infrastructural, the relationship between the money and the muse, and Ukraine kind of solved it. Um, I don't actually know what to do with this project because of the epistemological challenge of writing about the Soviet Union. Right now, I can't find it within myself to write a project that is largely about the institution of the Soviet military. Um, if you have ideas, tell me. I spent a month before COVID getting amazing documents, researching in the Ministry of Defense archive in Kiev. I think of those archivists and that building and those collections so much now. But I am writing a book on women in theater, uh, women who circulated between the Habsburg and Romanov empires, independent Poland and the Soviet Union, crossing political boundaries, shifting cultural infrastructures and the front lines of total war. Their lives break the geographic categories all too persistent in theater history in this region, which really divides into European and Russian and then various national theater histories. And obviously these lives really challenge those categories. The women in this book could bring childhoods in the Habsburg villages to the new Soviet metropolis, could travel from the camps of the Gulag to post-war theater, could study in cosmopolitan Moscow and return home to dissident circles in Soviet Ukraine. Comrade actress, Soviet Ukrainian women on the stage and behind the scenes, focuses specifically on women in Soviet Ukraine, arguing that the circulation between empires, the experiences of changing political structures, the trauma of war and occupation in World War I and II make theater in this region unique. And I'm interested in how that specificity of local experience shapes theatrical life on stage and off. And now I'm interested in the multiple layers of trauma and how they shape theater. I'm thinking so much about some of these women. Hanna Babievna, coming home from the Gulag. Anna Sheinfeld, who returned with the Yiddish theater, and when it was disbanded, she moved to the musical comedy and then puppet theater in post-war Lviv. Dina Pronicheva survived Babinyar and returned to work at the Kiev puppet theater. The actresses from a set of oral histories at the Center for Urban History, who survived Stalingrad, and enter the studio at the Zankovatska Theater, or whose families are arrested as Ukrainian nationalists after the war, or who moved to Lviv with nothing, as Holocaust survivors, as war survivors. How did loss and trauma during the war shape post-war theater? I can't stop thinking about these women who lost their homes, their loved ones, who survived multiple borders changing multiple times and stepped on the stage to tell stories almost every night. The depth of this trauma is not in archives or documents. It is a silence in the archives and in personal papers and an inner world that will forever remain closed to me as we see in this quote from Hanna Babievna's daughter Dia, who says that 
I knew not to ask these questions when I was little. I only knew from people what I could see myself. I would never ask questions. But the resonance with today is important. Today, too, theaters are working. They are opening. Stories are being told. People are writing plays. Theater people are making theater. And these same issues remain. How does the trauma of war shape theater? These questions are being asked now, and they will be answered. And theater in Ukraine will remain a place of negotiating narrative, of making meaning, and of working out the unbearable stories of today. I only hope that there are fewer silences. Thank you so much. Dr. Fowler, thank you for that fantastic presentation. So we open the audience for questions, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Fowler. Uh, okay, so there's a there's a question. Um, it seems Putin and many scholars in Russia want to re-imperialize. How would you propose to um, to have that change to, to change that? Um, I think through our work, through our work, through our teaching. Um, I'm doing a project with the Center for Urban History on translating primary sources on Ukraine into English, so that we have more sources on Ukraine for our undergraduate classes. Um, so that students are not only learning the sort of standard narrative, but that they're getting sources um, on Ukraine. Um, it's our work, it's our speaking, it's our writing, it's events like this that we can spread on social networks like Steven Siegel told us about um, that will challenge these narratives. I think it is very, very difficult to challenge imperial attitudes, particularly in culture. Um, I've been struggling in my career, um, but but we will continue to fight on the cultural front. Um, yes, thank you for this for this note about the Belarus um, free theater. Um, absolutely profoundly riveting performances, but there's wonderful theater in Ukraine too. And I wish that we would um, spread the knowledge of those theater that those those theaters and those performances um, as well and these people who can't actually come to Ukraine because they're doing theater work right now in Ukraine. Their theaters are shelters. They're doing humanitarian aid and they're creating work in Ukraine for Ukraine right now. And I hope that we can support them as well as well as support the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Irena uh, Chalupa, yeah, mm -hmm. let's talk. Um, it's very, very difficult. Uh, Moscow centrism absolutely reigns. Um, I can share with you some of my rants about scholarly organizations. Um, and I think it's just continued work, nose to the grindstone. We keep presenting, we keep writing, we keep complaining, we keep pushing. Um, Alessia Khromichuk talks about Ukrainianists as, you know, the women in a room of men, right? Um, and all the men are like, why is she complaining about the patriarchy, right? We have to keep doing it. We have to keep talking and pushing and complaining and um, presenting our work and doing our work. All right, thank you so much. We will continue with the panel. Our next presenter is Dr. Markian Dovchansky. He is an independent scholar who studies the history of Ukraine, Russia, and the former Soviet Union. He is a scholar at Harvard University's Central Eurasian Studies Society and the administrative associate for the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the United States. He is currently completing a book manuscript on the cultural politics of Soviet Kharkiv. Dr. Dubchansky's presentation for today's webinar is War and the City, Understanding Kharkiv Through History. Dr. Dubchansky, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, so um, when I wanted to uh, think about the panel, uh, the, the presentation today, I thought about Kharkiv being on the front lines of a war, um, which it happens happens rarely in the history of Kharkiv, but when it does happen, it's a it's a really important moment. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the history of the city and talk about how war has influenced its development, and also um, talk a little bit about why Kharkiv is the way that it is. Um, the paradox of Kharkiv is that it's a, a very overwhelmingly Russian-speaking city in everyday life. Um, obviously, it's also a bilingual city, 
And um, yet at the same time, um, Kharkiv did not go the way of the Donbass in 2014 and Kharkiv remained in the Ukrainian state. Part of my book's argument is trying to give a cultural, a long-term cultural and historical explanation about why that happened. In addition to all of the political um, and um, you know machinations of the Siloviki, right, in 2014, there's also a long-term historical explanation for why Kharkiv stayed in the Ukrainian state. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. Kharkiv was founded in 1654. It was uh, in the wild field on the southern border reaches of the Russian Empire. As the Russian Empire expanded to the south towards the Ottoman Empire and as the Khmelnytsky uprising was placing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth into a great deal of tumult. Kharkiv was founded, and the area around it was settled by people from somewhere else. Um, it was founded largely by Ukrainian uh, pe uh, peasants who were fleeing the uh, uprising in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as well as Russian colonists who came in from the north and the east. Um, so Kharkiv was a borderland city, and the, the cent historical center of the city um, was uh, a Russian fortification, um, which was built. And so 1654 is generally taken as the founding of, of Kharkiv. Um, so Kharkiv was founded in uh, like a very nearby a war, as it, was, as it was happening, but it was founded to be away from the war. It was founded uh, where there was no war, um, actually. And so even though its founding is connected to the Khmelnytsky uprising, um, it's, most of its history, the significant factor was Russian colonization of the South and Russian expansion towards the South. Within the Russian empire, Kharkiv was a crucial railroad link between Moscow and the Donbass. And it developed as a transit center, as a commercial center, and as a center of the food industry because it was surrounded by uh, grain producing areas um, with some of the most uh, productive land. Um, and if uh, the, the founding of Kharkiv was connected to Russian imperial expansion to the south, its importance to the Ukrainian movement is also um, not related to war. Kharkiv has, is famously the birthplace of the Ukrainian national movement in the 19th century. And what I mean by that is that it, its university was the site of some of the first folkloric and ethnographic research that took place in the Ukrainian village. Um, scholars went out into the countryside, collected folklore, stories, songs, poems, and published them in their university uh, academic journals. And that gave rise to um, an understanding that um, Ukrainian folklore, or Little Russian as it might have been called at the time, was uh, distinct um, from, from Russian folklore and from folklore in other parts of the Russian Empire. Um, so th in that sense, um, Kharkiv, Kharkiv's connection to the Ukrainian movement is an intellectual one. And um, the second way that Kharkiv is really important to the Ukrainian national movement is that it became the capital of Soviet Ukraine. Um, famously, in 1918. And, um, and during the 1920s, during the period of Ukrainization, Kornizatsia, Kharkiv became a cultural mecca um, when Ukrainian cultural activists, um, literary figures, theater figures, um, poets from all over the Ukrainian lands, including beyond the Russian Empire's borders, uh, flocked to the city and created what uh, they may have called Soviet Ukrainian culture and which uh, Dr. Fowler uh, argues that they took quite seriously as a category. Um, it was a contingent category to be sure, limited to the 1920s, but it was supposed to be modern, it was supposed to be Soviet, and it was supposed to be Ukrainian. So that's another way that Kharkiv matters to the Ukrainian national movement in an intellectual sense, rather than um, from the sense of strategy or war or geopolitics. But there was war, and war came to Kharkiv during the the First World War, the Russian Civil War, the Ukrainian uh, battle for independence, um, and of course in World War II. And uh, I propose to that we understand the history of Ukraine, um, not just as the 1920s and everything that came after, but rather as a continuum of crisis, as a continuum of, of, of destruction. Um, it began in World War I and really culminated in World War II. And of course that takes into account both the Civil War 
the war between the peasantry and the Soviet Ukrainian government, which was headquartered in Kharkiv, the purges of that Soviet Ukrainian government, the purges of the Ukrainian cultural elite, and of course, German occupation um, during the war, which, which brought uh, untold suffering um, to Kharkiv, including the Holocaust, including uh, starvation, including um, people fleeing the city to go to the countryside, and a, a city that had reached almost a million people in 1939 on the eve of the war um, dropped to about 200,000 um, during the war, a little bit under 200,000 at its uh, lowest point. Um, so Kharkiv is no stranger to war, but it is not defined by war as a city. When Ukraine becomes independent, um, Kharkiv is, an, is ambivalent about the Ukrainian state and the form that it's taking. Kharkiv is a Russian speaking city. There were activist groups, um, both of Ukrainian orientation and of a liberal glasnost um, orientation that were focused on events in Moscow. And it had this um, structural position between Moscow and Kyiv as the two centers of Soviet power to which it was most closely connected. Uh, Kharkiv's ambivalence is not necessarily about independence. Um, people voted in 1991 overwhelmingly for independence in the referendum. Rather, the ambivalence was about what kind of Ukraine it sh there should be. Um, if you think about the politics of the 1990s, you might put into dialogue two politicians, Vyacheslav Shornovil, who represents Lviv and a kind of Western Ukrainian national democratic orientation. And on the other hand, <clears throat> excuse me, you might find Yevhen Kushnaryov, who was uh, actually the mayor of Kharkiv when the Soviet Union collapsed and became a kind of power broker um, of the highest levels of the Ukrainian state. And his vision of, Kharkiv, of Ukraine uh, may have been um, um, a, a bit different. It may have been a kind of uh, more left-leaning, more friendly to Russia, um, but still Ukrainian politics. Um, so, though, and of, of, of course, uh, Pushnaryov never was able to become a national leader in his own right, and um, he um, was assassinated in what many people have called a, a hunting accident, but which um, still hasn't been investigated. Um, but those two figures really represent two poles in Ukrainian politics um, in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, Lviv in the West, Kharkiv in the East. Kharkiv was kind of always seen as an ersatz capital of Eastern Ukraine, of an Eastern Ukrainian politics. Of course, but in 2014, that ambivalence uh, came to an end. Um, there were attempts in March of 2014 prior to the declaration of the Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics to create a Kharkiv People's Republic with um, uh, crowds storming the regional administration building in Kharkiv with a Russian flag being raised above the regional administration building. Um, and things really looked quite tense. There were many Kharkivites among that group, but there are also people from across the border 40 kilometers away from Russia who were um, fomenting um, this this uprising. Um, and in the end, uh, the Ukrainian government was able to retain control over Kharkiv by sending in uh, special forces from uh, Vinnytsia. They cleared out the, uh, the pro-Russian uh, groups and Kharkiv remained, of course, in the, within the Ukrainian state. And many Kharkivites were shaken by these events because there was widespread street violence, uh, including uh, the poet Serhii Jodan, uh, who was uh, was beaten during those uh, during that street violence, um, and the uh, when the war in the Donbas and the annexation of Crimea took place, um, Kharkivites looked next door. After all, there, Kharkiv has a large border with the Luhansk Oblast, and people could see. And Kharkiv also became a center of uh, internally displaced people. Uh, it's one of the first stops on the, on the train from Donetsk and Luhansk. And so Kharkivites observed what was going on. They looked, they took stock, they analyzed the situation, and they said, there but for the grace of God go I, and what we need now is stability more than anything else. And stability is what the local elites pursued. They made deals with the central authorities in Kyiv, and uh, they 
accommodated themselves um, to the Ukrainian state. And of course, so why does my, my book argue that there is a long-term cultural explanation? Um, my argument is that the Soviet experience made Kharkiv both a Russian-speaking city characterized by universities and factories and high-tech. Um, on the other side, it also created institutions of Ukrainian culture, um, Ukrainian language newspapers, Ukrainian language schools, especially in the oblast, but also in the city until relatively late in the Soviet experience and uh, Ukrainian th theaters and Ukrainian uh, writers um, who continue to publish um, in Ukrainian um, in Kharkiv all the way through the, the Soviet period. So uh, in addition to elite choices and pol political science explanations, the Kharkiv also has a long-term cultural tradition of, of being on the map of Ukrainian culture and people understanding Ukrainian realities in Kharkiv. They may not have always been uh, national Democrats or oriented a certain kind of way that we might think Ukrainian identity exists, but they were engaged with Ukrainian culture in a way that cities in the Russian part of the Soviet Union would never have been able to. So that's my, my argument. And I'd like to just finish up with a couple of quick things about what I think is at risk. Kharkiv, of course, has been under um, bombardment since the very first days of the war. Um, the, the bombard, bombardment is quite extensive. There are regions of the city which are um, completely destroyed and uninhabitable. And first and foremost, what's at risk is the lives of Kharkivites. Um, the, these uh, people who are independent, opinionated, uh, maybe brusque, maybe unorthodox in how they define Ukrainian identity, but they are people nonetheless, and their city is under attack. And they have, um, I, I'm inspired by how they have rallied around the Kharkiv uh, communal services brigades are going around cleaning up the city, uh, cleaning up broken glass and, and bits of buildings that have been um, bombed. And it's really um, quite an inspiring thing to watch a city rally, um, even as it's under bombardment. Uh, the second thing that's at risk is there was this kind of um, multilingual environment in Kharkiv, the bilingualism, um, where language wasn't really political. Uh, unless it was, <laughs> there was a kind of coexistence between Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers in Kharkiv. Um, even though there may be some some attitudes, there is still an understanding that you know people speak Ukrainian, people speak Russian, and I think that 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 easy tolerance, um, it, its historical moment may be coming to an end. Um, and finally, there is the architectural legacy of Kharkiv. There it has some of the most widespread collection of constructivist architecture from the 1920s, and also um, many late imperial buildings um, in the center of the city. And all of those things are at risk. Um, the Prom famously is the first, uh, maybe only uh, constructivist building uh, skyscraper uh, that was ever built. And um, it survived World War II in, the, in its original form. Um, but of course, um, bombs can go errantly. And um, the regional administration building has already, for example, just across Freedom Square from the Drishprom has already been uh, subject to a rocket attack and um, completely destroyed. So uh, a lot of things are up in the air and um, I'd be happy to take your questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dubchansky. Um, I, I can also uh, take questions at the end if we, we wanna move on to. Okay, I don't see any in the chat function currently. I will ask a question then. With, with the ongoing Russian invasion, now that it's entered its ninth week, how do you foresee the Russians as it relates to the Kharkiv Oblast, et cetera. As we're all aware, the Russians now have altered their invasion, so they've pulled away from the north, and it seems that they are more concentrated on controlling the Donbass region that they, they have, rather than the initial wide-scale invasion of the country. Yeah, thanks. So I think that the Russian, I'll just be really brief because I want to make sure we get to um, Professor Shevel. Um, the Russians initially thought that Kharkiv would be the, one of the first cities to fall, um, they were uh, repelled from, from the city, but the Russian military is still active in Kharkiv Oblast to the east, uh, especially around the Izum area, which is a strategically important uh, point. And um, of course, depending on everything depends on how things go in the Donbass, but um, 
Kharkiv in, a, in the Russian uh, discourse of war is basically a Russian speaking city that is very friendly to us and we will be greeted as liberators when we go there. And of course, the lie has been put to that, but nevertheless, I think in some grand strat strategic sense, they're still interested in, in Kharkiv. Okay, and with that, we will move on to Dr. Oksana Chevelle. Dr. Chevelle is an associate professor in political science at Tufts University. Her research and teaching focus on the post-communist region surrounding Russia. Dr. Chevelle has written numerous book reviews, book chapters, and scholarly articles. She is the author of Migration, Refugee Policy, and State Building in Post-Communist Europe. Dr. Chevelle's presentation for today's webinar is Looking to the Future, Ukrainian Identity, and Ukrainian-Russia Relations After the War. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to speak on this panel. Just to clarify logistics, um, if, how much time do we have? Because there is another speaker, right? And we only have 15 minutes until the next panel, or...? No, all the time is yours, Oksana. Oh, okay. So, so the remaining fifteen minutes are mine. Okay, great. Um, all right. So, um, so what I wanted to talk about is uh, built a little bit on the work, uh, the remarks that I'm going to make today, uh, built um, somewhat on the work that I've done on the memory politics in Ukraine, um, and um, especially um, the very different take um, on the memory of the Soviet period, in particular, that um, has existed in Ukraine and Russia for quite some time. Uh, of course, you know, in Ukraine, especially after 2014, although that process began even earlier, certainly since Yushchenko presidency and to some extent even before, uh, there has been a resinking of um, historical past. Um, and in a way, it also could be linked, although I'm not going to do it now, I think it could be also linked to sort of this broader de decolonization, decommunization, uh, right? And Ukraine began to look at the so-called um, blank pages that were blank pages in the Soviet period. Uh, essentially, a lot of them were Soviet crimes or Soviet policies that were, uh, say, whitewashed or not uh, talked about um, during communist period in Russia and even after the, the, the end of communism, um, you know, the way these, these things were approached in Russia was quite different. So the most notable here perhaps would be the Holodomor that was um, denied, kind of its very existence was denied, or um, as I remember learning in the Soviet school about it, where the excesses in collective farm building, right? Um, so of course, um, you know, in, in the post-Soviet Ukraine, that was one of the, we can say, central um, elements or central uh, periods um, that affected how many Ukrainians thought of themselves, of the Soviet past, and there was, um, you know, substantial rethinking also at the legislative level. And then more recently, since um, the victory of the Euromaidan and um, the, the flight of Yanukovych, the so-called decommunization laws that um, many consider to be quite controversial, um, I'll try to speak a little bit about that, were adopted, that further were rethinking the whole Soviet period altogether. Um, and uh, more, more specifically, the role of the Ukrainian nationalist underground that, of course, in the Soviet narrative of the Second World War were unambiguously the bad guys, right, the villains. Um, and it should be noted, um, I think, the, the main reason why these groups were so vilified in the Soviet Union was, I would argue, not even so much about the involvement of this or some members of this group in the Holocaust, but it's really the fact that they fought against the Soviet state. Like that was the main thing. Of course, the Soviet narrative um, of the victims of the Second World War were Soviet people. So even in the Soviet period, the, um, the plight of the Jews in particular was not singled out. So, um, you know, the victims of the Nazi occupation were the quote unquote Soviet people. And then, you know, the groups such as Ukrainian nationalists who fought against the Soviet state were, of course, unambiguously the bad guys. And then that, that uh, rethinking began to take place in Ukraine, again, at the societal level, you know, even earlier. But then these decommunization laws that were adopted that essentially made members of these groups, um, that gave them the status of the veteran. Um, and, you know, there were other provisions in the law that, you know, we can say were somewhat controversial and like not, you know, able to criticize them um, and so forth. But anyway, so I'm going to get into that a little bit. But what sort of what it meant for Ukrainian-Russian relations that there was really a very, very different vision and that really angered um, Putin in particular and, you know, many Russian elites in general that Ukraine went this way. And this narrative that Ukraine is quote unquote run by Nazis, the sort of denazification, it, uh, it, it is part of that, of that sort of this, the changes in the legislation, especially the decommunization laws, um, is, is part of that, right? Now, um, of course, you know, the, the so-called denazification that Putin is talking about is about nothing less than erasure of any Ukrainian identity. So it's not about sort of Nazism defined in, in any academic or 
uh, we can say objectively, it is really a catch-all term. And we see that given what the Russian army has been doing in the cities and towns it occupies, it goes after the people who they perceive to have Ukrainian identity, who support Ukrainian statehood, who do not buy into this, you know, Ukraine belongs with Russia um, sort of paradigm. So anybody could be easily labeled Nazis and therefore, uh, you know, subject to, you know, at best arrest and potentially, you know, torture and liquidation altogether. So it's very ominous, right? And Putin, if we look at what his complaints have been, again, he, um, again, the broader narrative here, where I think memory politics fits in, is that uh, Ukraine has become, as he says it, anti-Russia, right? So since 2014, supposedly it was the best in meddling um, or uh, outright directed by Washington. Um, the um, um, the uh, Ukraine has become um, an entity, as, as Putin considers it, that is aimed against Russia in every possible way. And here I think it's important to realize it is not just limited to some sort of security issues such as, you know, NATO training of Ukrainian troops or position of certain, you know, our new airports somewhere. I mean, he has uh, um, circulated all these fantastic scenarios that it's some remodeled municipal airports, bombers would fly to Moscow, but it really goes much deeper. I mean, he's very, um, you know, the, the evidence of this anti-Russian, uh, quote unquote, um, reality in Ukraine is anything from municipal reform, which again is supposedly done uh, with the meddling by the US. He claims that every single unit of Ukrainian army down to the platoon level is controlled by NATO, but it goes further. And he mentions, um, we can say legislation that has nothing to do with security, including of course, decommunization laws, but also say laws um, about indigenous people in Ukraine when Crimean Tatars were defined as indigenous people, but not Russians and not Ukrainians for that matter. Putin singled out, you know, for various reasons, this, um, indigenous people law as yet another manifestation of Ukrainian supposedly anti-Russian um, thing, right? Now, um, so what I think what's happening in Ukraine, and this is why I think things would change um, after the war, or at least, you know, I would expect that they, they would change, and I'll speak a little bit um, about that in the time that I have left. So in Ukraine, when this decommunization law was adopted, um, I would say, uh, in my estimation, this is something I've written about, I think there was a problem, with the, not with the law as such, because the laws basically were aimed at um, undoing and deconstructing the Soviet paradigm, Soviet historical narrative, which of course was not neutral, it was not somehow democratic, it was not grassroots produced, it was, um, you know, ideological agenda um, of the Soviet state. So I think dismantling that law was not a problem. And this is why I personally, for example, didn't sign some of the open letters that were circulating against the laws as such, because I didn't see the problem with adopting these kinds of laws. Now, the content of these laws was somewhat more problematic. Because what was basically done, essentially the labels were reversed, right? So if before everybody who fought on the Soviet state, on the Soviet side, including NKVD officers, including you know military who were in the so-called Zagranatriade, who shot at the, you know the backs of their own armed forces, including all these repressive uh, police and so forth um, personnel who pacified quote unquote Western Ukraine and committed this great crimes against civilian population, of course, all the Red Army soldiers who raped German women and all of this, like they were all veterans and they were all the good guys. And what Ukrainian law has done, it has done something similar that now essentially everybody who fought on the pro-Ukrainian side, right, um, they, for, for independence, were the good guys. So there was no kind of questioning and wrestling with the fact that yes, these people fought for Ukrainian sovereignty and Ukrainian statehood, and they deserve acknowledgement of that, and oftentimes against great odds and great personal sacrifice. But some members of these forces, and this is again basic historical fact that you know we, some you know people continue to dispute it, but I think historical scholarship is pretty clear on this, did participate in the activities that um, we would find very questionable against civilian population, against the Jews, against the Poles. So I think what would have been a better um, way to approach this historical memory is to make exclusions. And again, of course, these exclusions would have been purely political step because all the actual people who are involved in this are, are long dead by now. But I think the more a better way, in other words, to go about um, changing Soviet historical narrative would, would be to, yes, give uh, fighters for Ukrainian state the status with the exclusion of those who committed crimes against civilian population, blood crimes, you know, crimes against humanity. You can find specific language for that. That was not done, unfortunately. Uh, when the law was adopted, um, again, Poroshenko talked about introducing amendments to the law, which uh, ultimately never materialized. So I think now the question becomes to my mind, and this is something that I don't think we know exactly, but I, I want to just sort of share some thoughts, like what would happen after this war ends? Because now um, there is even greater distance, um, and I think this distance probably could not even be bridged, um, certainly not, you know, for generations, if not more, 
against sort of vision of everything, of the past, of the present, right, of the future that um, Russia, at least Putin's Russia has, and what Ukraine would be willing to accept. So we see that already now happening um, in the occupied territories, um, the collaborators and the Russian army are trying to erect monuments to Lenin that they assemble from pieces and so forth, right? So it is very, very backward looking vision, essentially trying to recreate Soviet narrative in all its glory. There is no kind of nuance of anything there, right? And on the other hand, in Ukraine, where already decommunization took place some years ago, now there is any sort of remnants of that. We had the dismantling of this, um, Druzhby Narodov, the Russian-Ukrainian friendship uh, monument in Kyiv, the removal of um, now signage about the, the Second World War and the Great Patriotic War, and that continues now into renaming or plans of renaming even Russian-affiliated, not Soviet-affiliated um, historical cultural figures and so forth. So we really see this sort of great divergence um, in which already diverged, I would say, even before in, in the, you know, at least since 2014 for sure, and arguably even earlier. But now I think this divergence is so great that I don't even see sort of how any kind of potential, um, you know, basically what, what I guess what I want to say that it's going to remain a great bone of contention, even under the best of circumstances. And um, I think this rejection of anything to do with Russia slash Soviet uh, past and legacy is very understandable, right, in, in, in the way of Ukraine, for Ukraine. Um, I think certainly as long as Putin remains in power in Russia or other persons similar to Putin in, in their views, uh, we are going to see this continuation of this narrative that Ukraine is anti-Russia in whatever shape, you know, border uh, Ukraine exists at, at that time. So the danger to Ukraine would remain because again, even if say, for ideally, like for us an ideal scenario, say they do manage to hold on to some territory for some length of time, the rest of Ukraine would remain anti-Russia. So Ukraine would always be in danger and the same narrative that we see today, you know, is happening. But for Ukraine, I think it would be a challenge for, for democratic Ukrainian government, like how to deal with this past, right? And I can see sort of two ways maybe here. One way would be to double down on the approach that was taken before the war. Essentially, everybody who's on the Ukrainian side are the good guys, no nuance, no like, you know, Bandera is our hero and like we go with that and whoever says anything against, you know, say the nationalist underground in the Second World War is a Russian agent. Like that's one possibility. I think we may see again sort of doubling down on this. But another possibility, which I think is also possible, would be that these whole discussions about especially Second World War and, and history more generally maybe might become less prominent in social discourse. Why is that? Because we are now going to have new heroes, new, you know, hours, new heroes that everybody would agree about, right? So you don't need to argue over whether you're going to have, you know, a monument to Bandera or not in a particular settlement, because you can now build monuments to new heroes who have fought and died for Ukraine in this war. So in a way, if that were to happen, then I think it would create a political space for more kind of less maybe charged discussion, maybe among historians, among cultural figures of these more distant um, periods in the past when Ukraine did have complicated relationship uh, with its own past, you know, with uh, given again, the diversity in Ukraine and so forth. So that's where, you know, that's what I wanted to suggest. Again, I'm not obviously nobody can predict the future, but I did want to link some of the debates about historical memory that existed before the war and suggest that there might be these two different pathways that Ukraine could take after the war. And of course, um, the sad reality of it is that whichever of these pathways is taken, Russia will remain a danger to Ukraine for some, quite some time to come. Um, again, regardless how this war ends, and that's, I think, something also important to keep in mind as kind of broader environments within which these de debates would take place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shavel. We have one question that is from Mikola Konrad, and it's, do you think that if there have not been decolonization laws, Russia would not be attacking or would this happen anyway? Yeah, it's the decommunization laws, um, not the decolonization, it's probably was a typo. Um, I think that probably would have attacked anyway, because they basically were looking for excuses, right? As I said, this broader narrative that Ukraine is anti-Russia and, um, you know, the West is using Ukraine as a puppet to get Russia, it has many, many, many sub- you know, arguments to it. So decommunization laws is used as one of the 
quote-unquote evidence how Ukraine is anti-Russian. But as I said, they are citing all sorts of crazy things, right? Anything from, you know, the way that, that you know, how language is taught in school to, um, you know, what municipal government reform looks like, right? Like which airports are, are remodeled. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the slow and indigenous people that for whatever reason Putin get very incensed about. I was actually kind of curious because Ukrainians are also not defined as indigenous people. Maybe somebody didn't mention it to him, right? Like the Russians are not defined, but not, not, not the Ukrainians, the Crimean Tatars are defined as indigenous uh, people. So, so the short answer to this question, no, I don't think so. I think there would have been plenty, you know, evidence, essentially anything Ukraine does, you know, Eurovaidan itself, democratic election, civil society mobilization, that was, of course, done on the CIA money, right? He said in his pre-invasion speech that what everybody on the Maidan received a million dollars, I'm still waiting for mine, all right? And then the leaders of the Maidan were getting like $10 million. Um, so no, I don't think that would be the case, right? Um, but again, I think Ukraine shouldn't get caught up in the Russian kind of framing of this thing, right? Like this is something that Ukraine as any sovereign country is entitled and ought to debate domestically. This is a complicated thing, right? And the society should have, you know, be, be able to discuss it, come to some terms. Um, and that shouldn't be driven by what Russia says or doesn't say. Okay. Any other questions for... Dr. Shua, or any of our panelists for that matter. Okay. Shturavam Jackies of Aschas, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your time for attending today. A reminder for this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dovshaki. We have a great series coming up. This concludes the history and politics panel. The next panel is arts and music. And please consider donating to the Shachenko Emergency Fund, the fund are being used for non-resident and resident fellows, Ukrainian scholars, activists, etc. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. We're just going to take a brief musical interlude here and begin the next panel in three minutes. It's on arts and music, so you want to stick around. Strangers are coming They come to your house They kill you all And say we're not guilty Not guilty Where is your mind? Humanity cries You think you are God But everyone dies Don't swallow my soul Our souls Everyone dies, don't swallow. 
Okay, um, thank you for staying with us. Um, this is the Shuchenko expertise for Ukraine. Our next panel is about arts and music. And I would please ask our panelists to now turn on their video. Um, and I'd like to turn the floor over to the moderator, Anton Varga, who is an associate member of Shuchenko Scientific Society, a visual artist based in Brooklyn, um, a, a native of Zakarpatya, um, and uh, one of Ukraine's um, uh, most talented designers and visual artists. So Anton, please, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, the introduction, uh, Markian. Um, yeah, I would like to say thanks for, first of all, like thanks for all, all speakers. Uh, and uh, for, for the previous and future, and also like for all participants that are joining us today. And uh, thanks a lot, Markian, for your work to putting together this expertise of Tom. And we will have uh, four speakers, uh, Miroslava Mudrak, Maria Sunovetsky, Virko Belay, and Leah Bedstone. And uh, we will start from Dr. Miroslava Mudrak. Uh, Miroslava Mudrak focuses on the unfolding of modernism in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union in relation to the philosophical and stylistic developments of the West. Her primary interest is in ideological discourses, sociopolitical influences and artistic practice with Eastern European cultures that use modernity to signify national identity. Currently, she has several larger projects underway from the Lotus of the Sickle, the Art of Boris Kosarev, the Symbolist Impulse, Sevalot Maximovich, and the Ukrainian avant-garde. Okay, and on this, I will give the floor to Dr. Marcel Mudrak. Yeah. Okay, did my screen come up? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you so much for organizing this Markiane and for the Shotenko Society for sponsoring this. Uh, I think it gives us one way of um, and doing something that is very narrowly within our purview, which can be helpful to Ukraine and I'm greatly appreciative of it. So I will start my talk uh, with my images in front of me I don't see anyone. Uh, I hope all of this works. Uh, I titled my talk, Where Would Great uh, Russia- Slava, sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, did you want to share your screen? I thought I did. Yeah, no, um, I don't think it's appearing. If you wanna try again, uh, we can make sure it appears. Okay, I will. All right, so I'm at the desktop, right? Uh-huh. Um, you have to then click the blue share button at the bottom uh, right hand side of the share window. I see. Okay. All right. And what else do I do now? Um. <clears throat> Do you see the screen? No. Um, so if if you're you're seeing what what you want us to see on your desktop, right? Um, in the Zoom window at the bottom, you there should be a green button that says Share Screen. Yes, I've pressed it. Mm -hmm. You press that. So now another window pops up. Um, you select the window that you want to share, and then in the bottom right hand side of that Share window, you need to click on that blue Share button. And it says open system preferences. Um, um, Miroslava, one thing we can do is if you wanna uh, just quickly email your slides to me, I can share them. And then um, we could try to go to the second speaker while I'm getting those set up. I think it would be a large file. Um, why don't you go to the second speaker so we don't waste time and I will try and play with this then. Okay. That sounds great. 
Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulty. Sure. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Maria Sonovitsky, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Music at Bard College. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thanks. Yaku, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to speak, um, we have 10 minutes, is that right? Correct. Okay, great. Setting the timer. Um, so I'm going to speak very briefly about Ukrainian musical diplomacy since February 24th, 2022. Um, this is going to be a very broad overview and not at all comprehensive, which if anything just shows us that this is really a tactic that's widespread at the moment. I'm going to start just by invoking a very well-known phrase from Leonard Bernstein, who was himself the son of Ukrainian Jewish immigrants to the US. His mother was born in Khmelnytsky, his father in Rivne. He famously said, quote, this will be our reply to violence, to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before, end quote. Uh, Leonard Bernstein uttered these words after the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1963 before, um, before an audience for the New York Philharmonic's Young People's Concerts. And I'm just going to say that today, I think what we are seeing are Ukrainian musicians replying to violence in exactly this way, making music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. Um, and in many cases, they're carrying this message to audiences outside of Ukraine and therefore doing very important work, in my view, um, on the cultural front. So Ukrainian musicians who I've been speaking to and have been in touch with um, understand that their music will not stop rockets from raining upon Ukrainian cities. But this begs the question then, what is the potential and power of music in a time of war? And why is musical diplomacy such an essential prong in the cultural front at this moment? So I'm going to set out just a few broad theses here. The first is that music is humanizing. The second is that music asserts a past for Ukraine especially when we see traditional repertoires or academic repertoires being invoked, we learn about a history of Ukrainian composition, a history of Ukrainian folklore, a history of Ukrainian regional style. It also asserts a future for Ukraine. Music also allows us to imagine a future in which Ukrainian music will continue to develop and flourish. Um, may I ask that that if we're, if I'm not if um, I don't think the static is coming from me. Maybe we can mute people who aren't speaking right now. Um, the third thesis I'll set forward is that the concerts themselves, musical performances, can uh, reach broad audiences who might not otherwise be following the news closely. Um, and I'll speak in greater detail about this in a moment. Um, this is also an opportunity for us to think about how concerts and musical performances can become powerful vehicles for fundraising for war efforts. So consciousness raising, but also literally just raising funds. And this has actually been proven in the last uh, 60 some days of war. Um, it's, an, it's an opportunity and a reminder for us, especially to take pop music industries seriously at this moment. And then the last thesis I'll set forward is that the embodied acts of listening dancing, of moving together, of singing together, that all of these are powerful vehicles for building solidarity and support, powerful vehicles for motivating people fighting against this um, aggressive um, invasion. Okay, we have limited time, so I'm going to speak briefly about three examples, and I'm gonna start just by showing you this image, which in some way is historicize this problem. This is a bingo card that was produced by Stop Fake, which is a media organization that was combating Russian disinformation that is still doing this work. And what's striking about this bingo card, this was meant for Ukrainian audiences who are watching Russian state television to kind of check off the different stories that recurred in Russian media. And you'll notice that I circled the one that says something about Eurovision. So the Eurovision Song Contest, which is an annual pageant of uh, pop and kind of geopolitics, um, was not irrelevant enough uh, that, that the Russian state media ignored it. 
And this bingo colors card was developed after the victory of Jamala, who is a Ukrainian pop star of Crimean Tatar heritage. After she won the Eurovision Song Contest in 2016 with the song 1944, which we were just listening to in the break. Um, so in 2016, this Crimean Tatar Ukrainian pop star won the Eurovision Song Contest, which we have a tendency um, to disregard because it's seen often as kitsch or it's disregarded for being not serious. Um, but Eurovision has a tremendous audience, estimated sometimes to be 1 billion viewers annually. So this is a huge platform for a Ukrainian musician to achieve. Um, when after February 24th, Jamala fled from Ukraine with her two children, her husband, Bekir, stayed behind um, to serve um, in the fight. And she has in the last 60 days been touring Western Europe and often performing this song from 2016. In 2016, the song was specifically in reference to the deportation of Crimean Tatars from the Crimean Peninsula in 1944. Um, it is a song about loss and missing one's homeland. Uh, in 2022, it takes on um, profound overtones for the whole of Ukraine. I'm going to play a brief excerpt of this performance. This was a performance that Jamala gave in Germany in early March that reportedly raised tens of millions of dollars with this performance. She also recently performed in a concert with Ed Sheeran that um, apparently raised over 70 million as well. So again, we, uh, we should not disregard the power of these pop industries in supporting a war effort at this moment. I'll play a little clip of Jamala performing 1944 in March of 2022. stop there because we really don't have time to listen more um but this is uh relatively easy to find on uh, on youtube okay um uh, moving on so dacha bracha is a, a so-called ethno chaos band that from Kyiv, originally currently on tour in the united states and i won't be <coughs> any examples from them right now but what i want to highlight is um the ways in which dacha bracha who have been calling themselves ambassadors of free ukraine since 2014, have now expanded this role and are taking their um, job as diplomats for Ukraine, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian history, and Ukrainian future very seriously. This excerpt that I have on the slide comes from this New York Times article that's in the middle of the slide, and I'm just going to read this. So the journalist asked, what is at risk if this war lasts, culturally speaking? And Marko Halanevich, who is the male member of the band, said, the risk is that Ukrainians will disappear as a nation and that the Ukrainian culture would, will disappear. For 300 years, Russia did everything for Ukrainian culture to disappear. Also in recent years, the last 30, and especially the last eight, we Ukrainians feel what it is like to be a free people. So again, this discourse of freedom, this idea that these are powerful ambassadors for the message of Ukraine in North America. <coughs> And again, it's possible to meet people who aren't speaking. I would so appreciate that. Um, this is a still from Dr. Bracha's recent concert. They have now adopted this slogan in addition to other slogans that they have been using for eight years, including Stop Putin, No War. They're now also embracing the slogan, Arm Ukraine Now. The last example I'll touch on right now um, is the Kiev Symphony Orchestra, which maybe Leah will talk about more later, but they have also now kicked off what they're calling the Voice of Ukraine tour, and they have been performing in Germany and will continue performing in other locations throughout Europe. Um, I would love to share a brief excerpt of the recent performance, um, if, if I can, uh, where we can hear a little bit of Skorik's, um, Miroslav Skorik's um, melody A minor, a famous tune.
and I'll stop it at the end of that phrase. Um, so the Kiev Symphony Orchestra, as part of their press release having to do with this performance, said that they are, quote, fighting Russia's aggression in every possible way, end quote. And the musicians in this band, like musicians in other bands who might otherwise not have been, or other ensembles, who might not otherwise have been able to leave the country, have been given permission to basically fight the war on the cultural front through musical so I think my time is up. I'll just stop by saying that this is really the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other examples in so many other musical genres, from pop music to rock music um, to punk rock music to you know hip hip hop. Um, we can look at examples like Alona Alona, Jerry Heil, even just viral musicians of ordinary people playing in bomb shelters. The incredibly moving performance of a violinist playing Verbovaya Doshka in a bomb shelter, which was then accompanied see the power of music in, in, um, in translating this message. So musical diplomacy on all sides is and will continue to be essential as this war grinds on. And I actually think it might take on even greater um, meaning as the war continues. Um, at the moment, will remind us that in the fatal degradation of human life that war brings, that there are vibrant musical cultures across Ukraine that are performed by humans deserving of our continued attention and support. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, if you have questions uh, to Maria, please uh, text them to our Q&A chat and we'll go now to Miroslava Mudrak with her. Uh, with, and her topic is, uh, where would great Russian art be without the backwaters of Ukraine? Uh, please, Miroslava. Okay, uh, and thank you, Markian, for managing <clears throat> the PowerPoint. Do I do anything with it, or do I just tell you to just go forward to the next slide? Just tell me when, and I can go to the next slide. Okay, you could show the full screen, though, um, if you don't mind. Okay, so there's a big block there on the right. I don't know what that is. Um, in any case, oh, thanks. Okay, so let's get started here. Uh, this title just came up, um, I guess, out of all of the um, activities that have been brewing about trying to do something uh, to explain to people about Ukraine. Most people who contact me are surprised that, um, that Ukraine has museums or that Ukraine has art. Uh, and so now, you know, all kinds of requests about writing this, writing that, uh, doing uh, um, lectures, doing demonstrations, and so on and so forth. So um, I've been thinking about the trajectory of my own career. And, and I remember um, as a, a, a college student how I just wanted to delve into the history of Ukrainian art. And uh, how and where was I going to do that? Well, the only thing that could happen, the next slide, please, uh, was to read the books that were current. And, and uh, what was current at that time was um, uh, a, a, an edition of a book in English, The Art and Architecture of Russia by Hamilton, which was first published in 1954. And I think that had something to do with the death of Stalin and an interest in Russia. Uh, but when you, uh, I'm showing you the contents page, I don't know how well you could see it, but uh, the first chapters are the art of Kiev and Russia. Uh, and of course, when you look into that book, everything that I would have known to be Ukrainian uh, was listed as part of Kiev and Russia. Um, so another book that was available to prepare myself, the next slide, please, for um, a study of Russian art, uh, excuse me, the study of Ukrainian art was uh, Tamara Talbot Rice's A Concise History of Russian Art, published in 1963. Okay, so this is on the verge of the uh, Khrushchev thaw. And here, um, the first chapter was uh, Art of Russia of the Pre-Mongol Period. Uh, and if you looked into this uh, book, and the next slide, please, um, the first pages had to do with 
um, St. Sophia, the icons, the mosaics, but uh, what you don't see uh, is that they were all listed as part of Kiev, Russia. So having to face this, um, uh, I knew that there was going to be a long, long um, journey ahead of me uh, to try and uh, get a niche or, or find a niche within uh, the history of, of art uh, where I could devote myself to the study of Ukrainian art. Um, and of course, iconography was big because Byzantine uh, area studies were uh, a conventional area that you could uh, uh, declare as, a, as an area of concentration. So uh, the next slide, please. I thought, okay, maybe I could focus on iconography. Uh, but uh, here again, you know, the greatest and oldest icons from the region uh, are all listed as part of Russian culture. And I bring this one to mind because uh, I think it sets the tone for why I gave that sardonic title to my talk. Uh, here is the Theotokos, the mother of God of Vishhorod, which was commissioned in Kyiv, and it was brought from Constantinople. Uh, to the convent, uh, to the convent at Vishhorod uh, in the 12th century. It is the oldest icon extant from the period of Kiev Rus. Um, but it was removed to the city of Vladimir, where uh, Boholyubsky was uh, 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 resettling, and uh, and then in 1395 it was brought to the Dormition Cathedral in Moscow. Uh, uh, as I think a very symbolic gesture uh, to present that third Rome idea uh, linking Muscovy to, uh, to Constantinople. And today it's, it's commonly known as the Vladimir Virgin. Um, where is it located? It's located in the Trechekov Gallery, one of their prized possessions. And here begins the, the direction of my talk. Most of the great art that is considered part of Ukraine's history uh, is not in Ukrainian museums. Uh, most of that is in Russian museums. Uh, and as we'll see in a little bit, uh, the greatest artists who have determined the history of Russian art, I say in quotations, uh, really came from Ukraine. And that fact is very little known. Uh, and I'm so, so uh, glad that we've come to a point in history where perhaps we can begin to write a history of Ukrainian art and bring back all of these masterpieces uh, as examples. The next slide, please. So some of these greats that you can find in the Russian museums include Dmitro Levitsky, uh, who was one of the finest court painters uh, uh, in the St. Petersburg court, showing you two examples of his work. Uh, portraiture was his specialty. Uh, the one on the right is actually a portrait of the architect uh, and part founder of the St. Petersburg Academy of Art. Uh, so we have a Ukrainian who's right in the midst of the founding of, of uh, academic training within the Russian empire. Uh, but I want to uh, emphasize a little bit more the painting on the left. There are two, there are actually three versions of this. The one I'm showing you is in the Novosibirsk Museum, uh, but there's one at the Russian Museum uh, as well. Uh, it shows you Catherine the Great or Catherine the Second, but um, in an allegorical stance. Uh, she's uh, depicted as the legislatress in the temple of the goddess of justice. Uh, what is interesting about this particular uh, work is that um, uh, it was greatly lauded. Uh, it, was, uh, it was considered one of the most uh, wonderful masterpieces of the era. This is uh, the late 18th century. But what people miss, and, and I, I, uh, there's a story to tell here, is that the way that uh, Levitsky paints uh, the goddess of justice uh, is in fact, um, I would like to say uh, a, a Ukrainian view of how great Catherine actually was. The goddess of justice is not blindfolded. And as she holds her scales, they are tipped. Uh, so she actually really sees 
uh, Catherine as the despot that she actually was, despite the fact that Catherine is shown here uh, putting rose petals uh, in a kind of sacrificial um, uh, um, uh, honor to uh, the goddess of justice. It's these little nuances that allow us to really see that the creators of these portraits uh, are not within the actual, uh, they exist physically, they work physically within the milieu of the Russian court, but their mentality is very different. Uh, the next slide, please. So the other great uh, portraitist within the Russian court uh, is uh, Volodymyr Borovikovsky, uh, who comes from Kozakstak, uh, from Mirhorod, uh, original name Borovik, uh, who was considered the Gainsborough of the Russian court, uh, very, in very close circles with the aristocracy, uh, portrait upon portrait of these um, individuals rendered with such uh, luxuriance. He actually studied a little bit with Levitsky. Levitsky was slightly a generation older, uh, but Borovikovsky and Levitsky are considered the greats of 18th century uh, Russian portraiture, aristocratic portraiture. Um, within the, the history of the academy, the next great Ukrainian that I'd like to focus on, and this is just a matter of time that I'm skipping to the 19th century, the next slide, please, uh, is, yeah, is Ilya Repin. And Repin uh, in particular becomes very interesting to us, I think in light of the bombings uh, around Kharkiv today, uh, because he was born in Chuhuyev. Chuhuyev was bombed uh, on the 24th of February, uh, one of the first, of all the first day of shelling. And, um, and there's a little museum. I don't know what the state of the museum is currently, but it's the Repin Museum uh, in Chuhuyev, uh, which gives tribute to uh, their, the son of their native land. Uh, but I'm showing you this because we know Repin, and I don't need to uh, explain uh, the status of Repin within the history of Russian art, but we know him to be, the next slide, uh, the greatest realist of, of 19th century, uh, painting. Uh, even the French recognize him as one of the great realists of academic uh, art. The next slide, please. Oh, okay. Well, let's hold it there. Sorry. Um, this is a painting that um, Repin did, of uh, which he had redone several times. Um, it's a revolutionary coming back, uh, and uh, he captures the moment, the psychological moment of uh, the unexpected return of the revolutionary into the kind of bourgeois home of, of, of the family. Uh, this is the kind of home that uh, Repin would have grown up in, and it's the kind of structure uh, that the museum itself uh, was used to create the Repin Museum uh, in Shuhuyev. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is, uh, the next slide please, on the wall of this uh, kind of bourgeois home uh, are two works that tell us something about Repin's roots. Uh, first of all, I think you can see or recognize even from afar, uh, the portrait of Shevchenko on the wall. And then the larger uh, is a, 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 a lithograph or, or perhaps even an etching of a work by, um, in Russian, Nikolai Gay, uh, but another Ukrainian, Mikola Gay, who was also considered one of the great painters of the late 19th century uh, within uh, Russian art history. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Mikola Gay was from Podilia, uh, a philosophical sort, uh, someone who, whose paintings tapped into uh, Christ's passion. Uh, but uh, Christ's passion, uh, as depicted by Gay, was really meant to be a depiction of man's sacrifice and, uh, and the way that uh, people lived uh, within late 19th century uh, Russia. This self-portrait actually hangs in Kyiv, I'm happy to say, but only in 2017 did the museum where it hung, which was called the uh, Kyiv National Museum of Russian Art, 
only in 2017 was it finally renamed the Cave Picture Gallery, uh, where you will find many of uh, the uh, leftover, let's call it paintings of our Ukrainian greats that have been counted in among uh, Russian uh, culture. The next slide. So I want to show you just a few works by Mykola Gay, uh, very powerful psychological works. Uh, Christ's passion uh, is felt viscerally, it's depicted viscerally. And I think uh, the connection with um, um, the little man uh, within the great empire uh, cannot be lost on us. The next, please. So, uh, another artist uh, who is touted by Russia as one of their great experimentalists, uh, also uh, is a 19th century master uh, who largely was self-taught. Uh, he comes from Mariupol, uh, a name, a town that we are very familiar with. Um, there is or was a, mu a museum uh, named after Quinji, Archib Quinji in Mariupol that was bombed on March 20th. Um, Luckily, uh, there was enough foresight to remove Queen G's art from the museum, uh, but there are lots of other uh, works within that museum that are of Ukrainian masters that are lost to us. But I'd like to say just a little bit about Queen G, uh, since we know of this structure now that's been uh, um, damaged. Uh, next slide. Queen G was an artist that uh, made his name uh, by working with uh, 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 Mendeleev um, and, the, and the person who invented the periodic chart. Uh, Quinge experimented with chemistry, uh, with chemical bases of paint to create these beautiful images of the twilights and dawns along the Dnipro River. Um, Mariupol is along the Dnipro uh, that, that uh, flows into the, uh, the Black Sea and his his luminescent images are just, they're just not romantic, sentimental images of, of Ukraine, of the countryside in Ukraine, but they're powerful statements about the beauty of Ukraine, uh, why artists are drawn to Ukraine, what artists, whether it's 19th century or 20th century, why they work in Ukraine, uh, where they gain their inspiration. Uh, so Queen G, I think, is a person who uh, needs to be brought into the forefront of world art. Uh, I know the Metropolitan Museum, um, if doesn't own, at least had displayed for a long time, a borrowed work by Queen G. Another, uh, the next image, please. But uh, someone who uh, really deserves our attention, especially now uh, with the uh, damage done to his legacy uh, in, in Mariupol. Here's another work by, by, by Queen G. The next slide, please. So uh, just an example of uh, the interior of the Queen G Art Museum, and of course, the leveled city of Mariupol. The next, please. So I think I'm going to skip this information about the museum, but uh, say except one say one thing that some of the works that were in the museum were by Ivan Ivazovsky, who's considered the greatest, um, the next, the greatest uh, marine painter of in Russian art history. But rather, he comes from the Black Sea port of Feodosia in Crimea, uh, from a, an Armenian family. Uh, he worked. Uh, primarily in Feodosia, uh, but uh, his works are, the next slide, uh, his works are now owned uh, by the Russian museums, uh, particularly his most famous one, which is the ninth wave that you see here of 1850, which is in St. Petersburg. I'm trying to rush through these, but I want to show you another, uh, another aspect of this. The next slide, please. I want to jump to the 20th century and talk just a little bit about the usurpation of Ukrainian culture uh, under the rubric of Russian. Um, the next slide. Uh, 
the show of modernism, the exhibitions of modernism began in Ukraine. Um, they started in Odessa, they moved along to Kyiv, then they came to St. Petersburg and to Riga. And uh, one of the first exhibitions of modernism uh, was sponsored by uh, Izdebsky, Vladimir Izdebsky, through two major salons, major uh, touring um, expositions, uh, begun in 1909, 1910, and then the following year, 1910, 1911. The first uh, exhibition had works by French masters that Izdebsky was able to bring uh, to the uh, to the to Ukraine, uh, which then uh, they uh, toured with, but the second included European masters alongside uh, local masters, and by local masters I mean uh, people like Kandinsky, who emerged out of Odessa art circles, which is made very little known. Uh, and of course, Volodymyr Burluk, uh, whose brother uh, came to be known as the father of Russian, Russian futurism uh, in the teens and later in the 20s. The next slide, please. Then coming back to how one studies uh, Ukrainian art, well, again, through the filter of books such as this in 1962, uh, British art historian Camilla Gray publishes a book entitled The Great Experiment, uh, Russian Art, 1863 to 1922. Uh, and in uh, on the cover, we find Kazimir Malevich, who hails from Kyiv uh, in one of his Cubo-Futuristic images. Granted, uh, uh, Malevich, like so many of the avant-gardists, had uh, worked in Moscow and were part of the Moscow avant-garde circles, but there's Professor no- Professor Mudrak, I'm, I'm yes. so sorry. I, I hate to interrupt this uh, really just brilliant exposition of the history of Russian art and how the Ukrainian element goes into it, but we really need to wrap up. There's okay. two more speakers on the panel, but thank okay. you so much. This is so great. Okay, I will end it there and thank you for giving me the time and helping me with this. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marosawa. That was very important. That's a very important topic, actually. Very important. Uh, I will introduce the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Virko Valey. Uh, Virko Valey is a uh, JSIC fellow at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and distinguished professor of music, composer in residence, and co director of NEON, an annual composers conference at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He received the 2007 Grammy Award as a recording co-producer for TNC Recordings and the prestigious Academy Award in Music 2008 from the American Academy, Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, yeah, and I will give uh, yeah I will give the word to Virko. He like his top his topic is um, arts ideology and politics. Yeah, please, uh, uh, Virko. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. First of all, I want to congratulate both uh, Maria Sonevetsky and uh, Dr. Mudrak, actually both doctors, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, Maria touched very well on the need for wide popular acceptance of what is Ukraine, as opposed to a narrow academic acceptance of what is Ukraine. And that is an area in which I think we lacked quite a bit in. Not because we didn't want it, but because the problem was very huge to overcome the power of that particular empire. And I think uh, I purposefully chose not so much to talk about music, but to talk about the the idea of politics and ideology and what it plays a role and how that is manufactured uh, in it. And a brief, a very brief story from my life. I was 10 years old when we came to the United States. It was 1949. Up to that point, I was raised in the Ukrainian family. I had no questions about who I was by the time I was 10. And um, came to America and after a few years, we got a little house and my father asked me to go to a store, which would be like off a Home Depot to buy some nails, etc., etc. And I went there and I had an accent, of course. 
And the guy asked me, oh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Ukraine. Oh, the Texas of Russia. That was my first introduction to what Ukraine was. Ukraine was an appendix, to use a metaphor. It wasn't a real organ. It was an appendix. It was in a way, as Dr. Woodrock very well said, it was a theater place to feed into something else. And my question that appeared as I started working within Ukrainian culture and started working particularly in music, what happened? And so I'm going to, in my research, let me give you a few discoveries that I made. Excuse me, I'm still very much in the morning on, my, on the West Coast. This is 1935. This is a few years after Holodomor. And this is already when Stalinist repressions are in a full swing. In 1935, uh, it was an English journalist, Lancelot Lawton, who had to explain to the House of Commons in England, quote, the deliberate policy of Russia was to avoid and discourage mention of Ukraine abroad. Now, I'm emphasizing the word abroad because I've worked in Ukraine a lot myself. And they didn't know that. From the Middle Ages down to the 18th century, Ukraine figured largely in European literature. But after the first half of the 19th century, the West was made to forget that there was or had been such a nation. That so little has been heard of it is not surprising, for suppression of the Ukrainian nationality has been persistently accompanied by obliteration of the very word Ukraine and concealment of the existence of Ukrainians. It constitutes one of the major political deceptions of history. This is why I say politics is extremely important and to be aware of where, what needs to be done to make Ukrainian known. Uh, as Maria, I think, very well said, there is a movement, particularly in Europe, where Ukrainian pop art is prominent. And I think that has helped knowledge of Ukraine and has helped dissemination of Ukrainian music, not only in pop, but also in classical music. Uh, just so that you will have an understanding of this. The, one of the best known world composers, and I'm not telling it as a, as a shall I say, a hyperbole, is Valentin Silvestrov. Valentin Silvestrov is internationally recognized as a great composer. Hardly known by Ukrainians, and certainly also known in the United States, None of his symphonies were performed by any major orchestra. I did some with the Las Vegas or Nevada Symphony, but that's not a major orchestra. That's a provincial orchestra. The major orchestras haven't touched him. Why? The reasons are not that they don't know who he is, but the reasons are polit political and ideological. Now, why that is so, I think it would that be a bad idea to kind of, again, check something out? In 2012, when we were going through, as you know, the, uh, what do you call it? Oh, yeah, the presidential period, yes? There's going to be a little presidential voting going on. So. The question was, what are we going to say about that? Well, one of the candidates for the president, the senator from Utah, stated that, yes, Russia is one of our most important foes, but they have the right to suggest policies to Kiev. In other words, it isn't a question of discussing something they can actually dictate something. This is 2012. And when the United Nations were being formed and Stalin, and unfortunately, 
the, the, the current boundaries of Ukraine, as we understand them, and for which right now we are fighting for, was actually Stalin's invention. This is something Ukrainians hate to admit to, but it's a, tr it's a fact. He put it together. Why did he do it? Because he liked Ukrainians? Absolutely not. Pure politics. He needed another voice in the United Nations. He felt that Soviet Union should have three voices. Okay, so he got that. So when that was formed, it was also clearly stated by the American Secretary of State, that Ukraine was to be viewed by all subject to Russian geopolitical interests. That's where we are. And so the sudden recognition that Ukraine is important, I think shocked everybody. I don't know about you, but I, did, I was sort of the terror of it, the horror of it, of course, is one thing. But suddenly, to make everybody talk about Ukraine, while the day before, many would not even know where it was, tells us something. And it tells us that there is, the power always lies in politics. And one of the things I think that we need to become aware of now is the need to infiltrate the halls of power somehow. Now, I'm not telling you that I understand how to do it, necessarily. I might have some ideas, but we all have ideas. But without infiltrating that, we don't have a voice. In other words, Professor Mudrak's idea that we're going to expose these artists and show them that they have Ukrainian roots Unless you have the power, it's not going to work very well. And I'll tell you why. Stravinsky. We all know Stravinsky, don't we? Even those of you who don't like him know what Stravinsky is. Stravinsky now is seen as a Russian composer from the beginning to the end. Yet he spent a minuscule part of his life in Russia. And a lot of it was in Ukraine. He built his dacha in Ukraine on the River Bug. And yet, to this day, he is known as that. Why? On the other hand, Bortnyansky, who was born in Ukraine, was stock music in Lukyu, is known as Russian. What is the reason for that? Politics. Virko, uh, Virko thank you so yeah. much. I, okay. I really hate to step in, but uh, you've just turned our attention to the intimate connections between art and politics. And I think that that's a really helpful thing, uh, but we do need to move on and make sure Fine. that Dr. Ratstone has a chance to present as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rico. Uh, I, you can have some questions here. If you have like, a few questions, you like to do something, so I was going to start with anything that you said. And I want to do the next one as the about Stone. Leo Bastian is a music musicologist uh, specializing in the intersections of art, music, philosophy, and politics in the circle of Austria and 20th century Ukraine. She's a Rewire postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ukraine and artistic director of the Ukraine Contemporary Music Festival. Uh, please, uh, please, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yes, thank you so much for that. And actually, I'm, much of what I'm going to say follows very much on what Yurko was saying and connects back, I think, to the themes that both Maria and Miroslava um, brought up. So my, the title of my presentation um, is Why Defining the History of Ukrainian Art Music is More Important Than Ever. And this is partly sort of my own project, but it's something that I think since February 24th has, has really become more, more important than ever. Um, so I just had a few sort of observations and remarks. Um, following the start of Russia's war against Ukraine on February 24th, 2022, music institutions around the world rushed to signal support and solidarity through special performances and benefit concerts. 
As many will have observed, these, con uh, these concerts frequently did not feature Ukrainian music, but rather works that have been conventionally taken on symbolism of hope and support, like Verdi's Requiem, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, etc. Uh, Valentin Silvestrov, as Virako just was discussing, the most well-known Ukrainian composer, has seen a tremendous jump in the performances of his music. If you go to um, the shot, uh, shot music publishers website who represent him, they, they list sort of upcoming performances of his works and there's been sort of a, a massive jump um, in the last two months. Um, Miroslav Skorik's Melodia, which was so effectively used to score the video that President Zelensky showed to the American Congress has also been performed very frequently. But I would say that these situations, the fact that there's actually quite little in terms of Ukrainian music that is being employed as a signal of support for Ukraine reveals how little we know or how little is known about Ukrainian art music beyond its borders. So I think that the importance of musical diplomacy on the part of Ukrainian musicians, which um, Maria mentioned is incredible and very important. And I will just say, somebody asked in the chat if the Kiev Symphony will perform in the US. Um, so they don't know yet, I can answer that question. Um, they're, they are traveling through Europe and sort of to be determined, I think it's gonna depend on sort of support that they can get opportunity space, um, but it's not off the table. It's just not planned yet. Um, but I think it's equally important and maybe in some ways more important um, that we sort of beyond the borders of Ukraine know, understand, promote and define Ukrainian history, whether that's art history, whether that's music history, political history. Um, so one of the reasons that I think this is really important is that the accusation of a lack of high culture is a common trope that's been used to denigrate groups throughout history and around the world. So it's frequently leveled at groups of color it's historically been a charge against various Slavic peoples, not just Ukrainians. And the idea that Ukraine has no high culture of its own is a myth that Russian propaganda rejoices in the spread of, and one that is long due in long overdue in tearing down. Um, so I think that that's a really important project for um, all of us to participate in. And of course, it's something that can be achieved in scholarly spaces, but it can also be achieved outside of uh, the academy and simply educating ourselves and sort of connecting threads um, amongst composers of Ukrainian art music. I mean, there are recordings available um, on popular streaming platforms and Ukrainian art music in particular has a very strong genealogical history. So that's something that um, I think is both a very important part of Ukrainian art music, but it also makes it easier in some ways to trace Ukrainian art music and to find and discover new Ukrainian composers because there is this long genealogical history. So Boris Yatoshinsky studied at the Kiev Conservatory and then students were um, and then their students were, you know, th there's there's a very strong genealogical history that um, can be effectively utilized to learn more about Ukrainian art music. Um, I mean, we can also talk about similar trends to what Miroslava mentioned in music. And of course, Virko just mentioned um, Stravinsky as one of these examples where you have composers who have much more compelling, maybe not much more, who have compelling ties to Ukraine that have been kind of absorbed into a Russian narrative of um, great culture that I think we can tear down. But I think equally compelling are a number of Ukrainian composers who just, because they haven't, it hasn't been so easy to absorb them into a Russian narrative have been left behind. Um, and so I think that it's very important that um, we advocate as much as possible for the performance of those works and, you know, doing that through the organization of small performances. Um, I run a contemporary music festival. That's a very niche, <laughs> that's a very niche um, part of um, art music, but there have been sort of small performances by chamber music ensembles. And certainly if you have Ukrainian musicians traveling in the United States who are acting as cultural ambassadors that they too will bring that repertoire um, to, to uh, the American public, to the European public, to just to, to the world in general. Um, one more reason that I think it's very important to study um, Ukrainian art music history and to kind of define that history has to do maybe with sort of a bit more of an academic bent. But I think across sort of culture and certainly in the humanities fields, there's been an increasing move to kind of push back against sort of um, 
the canon, the idea of the canon, the idea of imperial narratives. And I think that's something that we sort of see generally sort of throughout uh, contemporary culture. And I think that Ukraine is a really excellent space to do that. Um, so I think that Ukraine has a lot to offer in terms of how do we rethink um, perhaps some of the untruths or less than truths that imperial narratives tell us about groups and about people and about their histories. Um, Ukraine is also a wonderful example of a place that um, given, its, given its absorption into various empires has existed to some extent on the periphery, had been the space for incredible um, incredible sort of progressive developments and innovations that have then moved into the center and have come to define the center. So I know that Miros Miroslava has, has talked a lot about um, Ukrainian artists who have then sort of gone into, I mean, as Berlug, for instance, was mentioned, who then become sort of, um, they become the, the epitome of these sort of progressive movements, but in fact come from the periphery. So that's another reason why I think Ukraine is a really important and um, exciting area to sort, to sort of to think about. Um, and I think that, you know, it is it is part of a um, the giving giving voice to Ukrainian composers and defining a sense of Ukrainian music history is part of a, a, a project that I think we all want to engage in all the time, which is to better understand um, and better represent the voices of oppressed um, and and put them into dialogue with the sort of versions of history that we're much more used to. And um, it allows us to kind of challenge some of those um, damaging sort of assumptions that people have. And that's a skill and a, and a, and a, a tool that can be applied from, you know, across Ukrainian music and beyond. And so I think for that reason, Ukrainian music has a really important role to play in kind of contemporary discourses. So I see that it is noon. Um, so I'm gonna keep my remarks short, but I wanna thank the Shevchenko Society for, for doing this. This has been a wonderful event and for inviting me. And I'm really glad that we had an hour to devote to arts and music. So thank you. Thank you, Leah. Uh, do we have some, uh, do we have some questions? Uh, uh, no, looks like we do not. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on my own as an artist, I would just like to say that representation is also like, uh, it's a, like, a huge issue in uh, like in contemporary art world, like representation of Ukrainian culture. Uh, even now, like recent days, in recent days, Ukrainian pavilion at Venice opened and we again, Ukraine, like in some like fifth or sixth time, Ukraine needed to rent some pavilion, even though uh, Russian pavilion in Venice was founded by the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian, uh, like a sugar magnate, Tereshenko, back in 18, uh, 1912. And uh, since that time, it was the Russian pavilion, and then it was Soviet pavilion. And back in the 90s, it became again a uh, uh, Russian pavilion. And Ukraine in 1886, when, uh, when there was a first uh, representation of Ukraine at Venice Biennial, Ukraine has its first pavilion in military tent. Can you imagine how prophetic that was? Uh, so yeah, and uh, but we hope uh, we are every year we're getting we're getting closer and we're getting better at those presentations. Thank you very much for uh, for all panelists for their uh, talks, and uh, thank you, thank Markian for putting this together again, and for all listeners. We definitely have to make another like roundtable webinar with the all uh, with the speakers today about arts and war times. Thanks again. Thank you, Anton. Uh, I completely agree. There's so much, uh, so much richness in all of these presentations. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone as well. Um, our next panel is going to be on uh, sorry, scholar rescue and cultural uh, pre heritage preservation activities. And uh, let's take a couple of minutes and listen to a very famous song. With the, old, will, uh, with the um, speakers.
that has a bit, shows just how the past continues to influence uh, pop contemporary uh, perceptions about the war. So that was Pink Floyd uh, with Hey Hey Rise Up, uh, which of course draws on Andriy Klevniuk's uh, performance of Oi Luzi Cermola Kalina, which is a song that goes back to World War I. Um, so at the next panel, as, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Katarina Yakovlenko, who is a, uh, an, an independent artist and um, who uh, was, uh, we're very glad to say was our, a Fulbright scholar at the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the US and who is now on a fellowship at the Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen in Vienna. Um, Katerina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark Ian, and thank you, uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society for such incredible event. I feel as a displaced researcher and scholar, I feel that it's really important to our community to feel such support. And uh, today I delighted to introduce you four incredible speakers. And the first one is uh, Skolt Milnichuk, uh, writer and editor. Uh, Skolt Milnichuk book stories of men who would not blow appears in 2021. He has published- Henrik Berstein, the he has been published four novels uh, which have variously been named uh, New York Times, notable LA Times Best Book of the Year, an editor's choice by the American Library Association book list. He also did um, numerous uh, translation include works uh, Oksana Zabushka, Mariana Savka, Bohdan Wojciuk, and Ivan Drach. He also was awarded for his incredible work. And today uh, he will speak about literature experience and uh, how today we can help uh, Ukrainian writers in uh, today's war. So probably I will introduce next speak speakers later, but now um, I will give a floor to Askot Mimnich. You can also have to mention that if you have any questions, you just press your button uh, on the Zoom um, panel and uh, wrote your uh, any comments or questions? And after that, I will um, ask Skolt Menichuk um, about that. So please ask Skolt. Thank you so very much, Katerina. Um, thank you, Markian, for organizing this event. Thank you all to the uh, previous speakers and all who are participants. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to speak to you briefly about some of the things that have been going on, So uh, about some of which you may know, others you may not know about, um, in the area particularly of um, collaborations between Ukrainian and American writers and artists. 
Uh, and uh, so it is actually a, this perfect translation transition from Leah Batstone's uh, um, uh, suggest, uh, conversation and 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 uh, observations about the importance of representation and the way in which Ukrainian literature has heretofore been regarded uh, by uh, American sort of literary audiences and critics. I mean, it has indeed been seen. I think ever since um, Nabokov uh, published his. Um, a uh, terribly annoying book on on Hohoi, uh, Gogol, in which he uh, wrote, um, I think something like, if I want to give myself a good nightmare, I imagine uh, Hohoi continuing to write in this little Russian dialect. Um, the, when I read that 30 some years ago, I was um, offended <laughs> and uh, um, puzzled about how uh, one might respond to uh, such a slur, uh, which seemed to be kind of universally uh, accepted by so many of my uh, colleagues, those few who knew anything at all about Ukrainian literature seemed to regard it as a kind of subspecies, um, uh, uh, a kind of minor regional literature in relation to uh, the kind of great Russian uh, texts and novels. In any case, um, it, it's uh, less important that um, Ukrainian literature be compared to that of the work of its neighbors and that it stand on its own and uh, on, in, in the kind of larger com global community of literatures. And uh, I believe that it is well on its way to doing so now. In fact, I think that anybody who has been following um, at least uh, events in the literary world will uh, have recognized uh, that there is no more popular literature on the planet, it seems right now, than Ukrainian literature. Ukrainian poems are appearing uh, widely in just about every um, serious literary publication in the country. Uh, a Ukrainian uh, a story by a Ukrainian writer was finally published in the New Yorker. And um, these, uh, th these appearances are all the result of the individual efforts of many people who are often behind the scenes um, uh, people like Zhenya Tompkins and Kate Surkin, who have been doing remarkable work in promoting Ukrainian literature over the years during the quiet period before this uh, sudden uh, boom. Um, it's a boom that's an important, really kind of essential to take advantage of because um, the world is looking and the world is interested. And as we know, the world is deeply moved and impressed by um, the Ukrainian response to Russia's war. And it's, uh, it could personally, I've been very um, moved and excited by the willingness of so many American writers to take part in a number of events that I've been able to collaborate with others on organizing. These have included, uh, live meetings between half a dozen Ukrainian, contemporary Ukrainian poets, including uh, Pablo Korobchuk, Mariana Sauka, Lyuba Yakimchuk, uh, Victoria Melina, Katerina Mikhailitsina, uh, and a number of other writers who have um, appeared in readings sponsored by the Goethe Institute and the uh, Brookline Booksmith and the Iowa International Writers Program and Penn American Center, uh, together with some of the most important American writers of our time, including uh, Marilyn Robinson, uh, three-time po U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky, um, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer Richard Ford, et cetera, et cetera. So the, um, th these events have consisted of um, readings by American writers, uh, counterpointed by readings uh, by Ukrainian writers who were reading live from, uh, most of them were in view. Um, there have been um, events like this organized across the country, and each of them have been sort of widely viewed and very well received. Uh, there have, um, in, in addition to this, I have been working with um, on, on a video project collaborating with the Ukrainian filmmaker, some of you uh, surely know, Alexander Frasev Frazenko, um, in which I am interviewing individual Ukrainian writers uh, in anything from half hour to hour long conversations about their early work, their um, literary sort of ambitions, uh, the, what they were doing before the war and how the war has changed their focus uh, uh, and their lives. And these will be posted on um, the 
Agni website. Uh, Agni is a literary journal I founded many years ago, who's in, which is enjoying its 50th anniversary. Um, it is also celebrating its 50th anniversary by including as part of its um, uh, launch uh, performance by Julian Kitasti, by the way, that'll be taking place in Boston on uh, May 11th. Um, furthermore, um, we have uh, been able to organize a prize uh, in honor of the Nobel Prize winning St. Lucian uh, no, uh, poet, Derek Walcott, Nobel Prize winning poet. Uh, the prize is awarded by, um, the, the winners of the prize are selected by some of the country's leading poets. Um, the judge for this last uh, round was a poet named Major Jackson and the two poets he chose were a poet from St. Lucia, Canisia Lubrin and um, uh, Sidhija Dan. And I just had word this morning that Sidhi Shadan will be trying to join us via Zoom from Kharkiv on uh, May 15th uh, at noon, Boston time, 7 p.m. Uh, Ukraine time. I'm hoping that uh, some of you will also be able to join that event. Um, so these are the kinds of um, openings that this moment has provided. And I think it's essential that uh, the Ukrainian community uh, join in in attending these events and in encouraging their American friends to also participate. Uh, it is um, th the idea obviously behind bringing together Ukrainian poets and American writers is to have people look each other in the eyes and uh, cease to be abstractions for each other to recognize that there are um, human beings behind these uh, these texts that sometimes appear in literary journals. Um, the collaborations um, will uh, result and are already leading to a number of books that have, are being published by a number of small presses around the country. Um, the important thing with literature is that, and, and it's probably not too different from um, art music is that there are many wonderful writers, many wonderful composers, many wonderful producers of this literature. What, it, what often happens is that um, these voices do not get supported by readers who um, don't buy the books, who uh, do not uh, continue to give these uh, works of living uh, testimony and witness um, a uh, the, the extended life that they need. And that's something that I think that the Ukrainian community in the United States could certainly work on doing a better job at is that is in creating an audience for this rather remarkable body of literature that has emerged from Ukraine, um, especially since independence, really from the 1990s on. Uh, I think that uh, Ukrainian writers have um, often been prophetic in um, predicting the sort of grim events that we are witnessing now. I know that um, the poet and novelist, who many of you will know of, Oksana Zabushko, has been writing since 2014 that World War III had already started. And um, she also has more than once noted how frustrating it is for her to appear in, uh, the, in, in Western literary contexts, speaking to people who have so very little um, understanding of the world out of which she has she is writing and speaking. And it's the creation of a context for the understanding of Ukrainian literature that uh, scholars, uh, the, the literary scholars among you could do really important work. Um, this is a, a moment when uh, Slavic departments are seem to be adding <clears throat> very quickly classes in Ukrainian literature and Ukrainian language. And uh, it's important to seize the day here and to fill those positions with uh, qualified candidates. Um, the last point, I, well, I, the last thing I wanna say is that a number of, uh, of th that I join uh, about 20 different human rights organizations every Monday morning with some of the other sort of uh, panelists, today's panelists, including it in the Bushko, uh, where we uh, meet with um, representatives from both uh, Pan American Center, the Writers Organization, and International Pen, as well as um, several Pen branches from abroad. We meet with UNESCO uh, uh, groups and uh, with uh, scholars and artists at risks representatives uh, in order to discuss the needs and possibilities for 
uh, Ukrainian scholars and writers. Just this morning, um, I received an email from the organizer of the particular group to which I, uh, which I attend on Mondays, Jane Unruh, who runs the Har Harvard Scholars and Artists at Risk program, saying that that just today they suddenly received seventy applications for positions. Um, this is a welcome development. Um, up until now, there have been very few applications from Ukrainian writers and artists. Everybody has seemed to have wanted to stay in the country. We're not quite sure what has, what is responsible for the sudden uh, willingness to uh, take part in an exodus. Uh, perhaps somebody will be, uh, one of the other panelists would be able to say more about this. But I think I'll stop here right now, Katrina, and then see if there are any questions and then turn it over to the other um, venerable panelists. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Markian. Uh, thank you, Scott. I think that uh, for now we have no questions, but uh, now I can pass the floor to Olha Alexic, who is a Petro uh, bibliographer for Ukrainian collections at Harvard University, and she was graduated for at Simon, Simon College and received her PhD in a School of Library and Information Science, and actually have been working as a librarian over 15 years, which is, I think, super incredible. And um, she will focus on the pro uh, project called Sucho Project. I think I uh, pronounced it right. And uh, could you please tell us more about your experience and how you see uh, this experience could help um, Ukrainian uh, poets, writers, or researchers, or scholars who are interested in literature to, uh, to be safe and to prolong their, their career? Thank you very much, Katarina, for your kind introduction. And thank you for, to Shevchenko Society for inviting me to this panel. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, library and archive professionals around the world have been reaching out to their Ukrainian colleagues with offers to help. And they also discussed, they were discussing the best ways of preserving vulnerable information, not only about the war, but also of cultural importance. Initially, the main concern was the threat of cyber attacks, which Ukraine suffered from since 2014. And with the invasion underway, the possibility of losing government and cultural websites seemed very real. With the continuation of the war, another threat became obvious, the physical destruction of the infrastructure and the loss of data due to server damage. And the Ukrainian cultural sites, both physical and digital, are at risk being deliberately targeted by Russian troops. I would like to share the, the screen. And um, here you can see on this website, you can see the, uh, the Ukrainian government website documenting uh, the war crimes against the cultural heritage, heritage objects and uh, touches monuments and religious and historical building. As you, as you can see from this table, so far 274 um, items have been already recorded. Another example of lost cultural heritage is theft. Um, the most recent example is of which is the Russian occupiers taking more than 2,000 unique items from the museums of Mariupol, according to the city council. And among uh, them, there are original artworks and ancient icons and unique handwritten Torah scrolls. So while we are helpless against physical destruction, various initiatives have been born to try preserving digital items. Many of them are of local nature. For example, UC Berkeley Library or British Library web archiving projects on the war in Ukraine. The Library of Congress is archiving government websites and web publication in Ukraine as part of its European government miniseries. A small number of sites are being captured for preservation as part of Eastern Europe collection in the Ivy uh, Plus Libraries Confederation program. Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute is also working with the online archiving platform Archivit to catalog important online records relating to the war in Ukraine's cultural heritage. The contents of Russia war in Ukraine Collection includes a selection of news portal, digital libraries, governments, and civil society website and social media related to the war. In addition uh, to that, Curie is offering scholars, archives, and academic centers in Ukraine assistance with secure data storage on Harvard SharePoint site. In this case, preserving data which is not available online. But as Katarina said, my uh, my focus today is the um, is uh, saving Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage online project. 
And it, and I would like to share this uh, particular image. Uh, yes, of the cultural. Um, this one, this image was created to commemorate uh, this effort by librarians and archivists by Ukrainian artist Vlad Holodny. Um, who created this, this image. Um, so over 1,300 volunteers like myself, uh, who are librarians, archivists, researchers, programmers, joined this group to identify and archive at risk sites and digital content of Ukrainian cultural heritage institutions. So what do we mean by digital culture? It's websites, videos, images stored not only by museums and libraries, but a whole a host of art, music, dance, and other organizations that represents a country social's heritage. So far, Sucha has saved more than 330 30 terabytes of data for more than 3,500 websites. Volunteers initially found target content in the obvious places of large cultural institutions, but they're becoming more systematic and creative with time. The primary mode of communication for such a large group is Slack. Slack is, all, is uh, in addition, in general to general channel, there are multiple discussion groups depending on interests and the way one chooses to volunteer. For example, collecting and submitting links, using various technologies to crawl and archive submitted sites, database verification, quality control, metadata creation and coordination. Um, so I will go back to the to the to the websites just to demonstrate. So we, here there is various way uh, how to explaining how to volunteer, how to sign up to volunteer, or simply submitting a link uh, for any websites to be to be saved. Um, there is the uh, the database for the submitted links with the detailed explanation what is being done here. Uh, uh, that, and also the completed tax, task and completed archives, which you can access and see and see for yourself. For the newcomers, uh, there are very detailed tutorials and workflows, and also Zoom available uh, or Zoom orientation available for the for the newcomers as well. Um, here in this. Uh, in, in this workflow, there is step by step explanation how everybody can contribute. Um, and here, even, even with this little image, how everything fits together and how it works, uh, works at the very end. The group is using a combination of technologies to crawl and archive size and content, including the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, the Browser Tricks Crawlers, which requires some basic coding skills, and it's helpful for advanced crawls, such as capturing expensive websites that might have multiple features, like calendars, 3D tours, link for navigating insights, and why individual efforts of preservation by various libraries I mentioned before are important, they are prone to duplication. And from technical point of view, it has always been very difficult to capture complex content beyond the front page of the site. Such as approach is more nuanced than multi-layered. The group submits more detailed manifests of URLs to the Wayback machine, which result in better coverage, gathering data and files from major collections and adding them to internet uh, archive collections for easy discovery. And here is the demonstration how it looks like item by item on the website of the Internet Archive. Uh, and if you click on, the, on any of these individual items, um, you can flip page by page. In this case, uh, Spivanik of Chervone Kaline, and here is the Veliki Spivanik Chervone Kaline. Um, you can see um, the sheet, the music sheets for that song that we just heard, or Luzi Chervona Kalina, that we just had at the beginning of, of our panel. So this data um, can be extracted, uh, recovered in case these websites need to be reconstructed because of the service have been disconnected or destroyed by the Russian military. Um, this organization has received a few grants to support the effort from the Association for Computers and the Humanities. Um, the European Association of Digital Humanities, Europeana, and all this money are used to cover the server cost. 
uh, be already thinking about next step. So the next step would be including a curation of the website collected and large scale identification of the information of this of um, they contain. Um, so at the beginning of the uh, talk, I'll show you one illustration. There is another one created by two different artists. I just combined them in one image, but these are two different artists from Ukraine. Again, in, in response to that effort and uh, they wanted to, to show their gratitude. So here on the left, you see the, the illustration created uh, uh, by um, Diana Filipova who was inspired by, by uh, Maria Premachenko art, creating this Vratuite Ukrainsku Kulturnu Spatschinu. On the left and on the right, uh, it, there is another artist from Odessa, is Olga Rodzik, and um, she featured in, in this particular image, um, you can see the, the opera house, uh, uh, the famous uh, Odessa Opera and Ballet Theater is being, is being featured here. Um, <clears throat> Just as said, libraries have collected, preserved, and shared knowledge held by their own institutions over the past century. They are now making this knowledge accessible globally. When the war is over, Ukraine can see its cultural treasures rescued and restored. The group is committed to working with Ukrainian experts and government officials to help them rebuild, um, their, uh, rebuild their websites using their archives, which belongs to Ukraine and its you know, cultural institutions. Um, as administration of the project, keep repeating their, all of their interviews, the base case scenario for this project is none of this work is being needed. Uh, but in the meantime, we, of course, we are, the work is ongoing and we will try to preserve and to restore as many websites as possible. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Olha. It's a really great and incredible job that you're doing right now at Harvard. And also, it's interesting to me how our panels are interconnected to, because today we started with the first panel and Steven Siegel told about his uh, archival project called February 21st. So I think that today such kind of interesting uh, archival projects and uh, writers project just will grow and uh, show us and trying to document probably today's uh, events. But um, before uh, our third panelist, I will also mention again that if you have any questions, you can uh, press your chat uh, button or Q&A button and um, Write, write down the questions. And the third panelist is um, Irina Vushko, who is a professor at the Princeton University, and she uh, teaching undergraduate and graduate uh, students East Europe and political prison in modern Europe. And she also an author of uh, two books about the history of uh, Central European uh, history and the Halicia. But actually what she's doing now, she's doing an incredible job with um, helping people, helping especially researchers and scholars at risk um, to find their place uh, in different universities and institutions. And probably she will uh, talk us more about such experience and how she started doing this and uh, how many people uh, does she, did, uh, did she help already. Thank you very much. And I, I just, I messaged Mar uh, Markian privately, so I may not last long because we got interrupted by COVID quarantine. So my son is jumping around here. So I'll try to quick, talk quickly and then, you know, hopefully, hopefully he'll uh, at least, uh, you'll bear with me. Maybe, you know, maybe you can say a few words later. Uh, thank you, thank you, Markian, for putting it all together. You know, and unfortunately I couldn't really hear everything, but I've heard like bits and pieces. I just wanted to say um, about the work that I've been doing and some other people have been doing and you know how it all started and uh, where it's going. So I've been um, I've been working with uh, people and uh, you know we've been in touch with especially Askolt Malnichuk. Um, and so I've been personally trying to help uh, scholars who are either in Ukraine or somewhere in Europe now and trying to help them with the finding the placement somewhere in the world, around the world. And, you know, I think that as academics, we all have some experience in finding positions, but I think no one has ever lived through the war. I'm sorry, I know. No one has lived through the war. And so I think my task, or at least the way that 
I've been trying, what I've been trying to do is actually working with, with people who either have no experience with Western institutions or and need some help because the applications, there are a lot of places and applications have been simplified, but still for people who can't really, who never applied, right? It's a, still, it's a somewhat convoluted procedure, right? So that's kind of, and another thing is basically you know, trying to kind of create the database and kind of gear people towards, place, towards places where they can find safety. And I think that, you know, we got to the point where there is a lot of positions available and there are a lot of people who are applying, but there is a little bit of a disconnect between those who are applying, oops, I have to put the headphones, those who are applying and those who are, <laughs> and those, uh, and the positions, because some applications are really complicated and some applications you know, are really convoluted, even for those of us who have plenty of experience, right? Plenty of experience of applying, right? And so, this is what I've been doing, and I'm I'm gonna say now that I I get I get I, I, I it's actually it's actually heartwarming to see how many people actually find placements and how many people actually find find positions for themselves. And the way that I see it, there are several issues with um, with with all of that. One is that. Um, I always tell people that on both sides, and I've been communicating with people, you know, on both ends, those who actually who who design applications and people who are applying that the main purpose of this is not for people to produce some valuable research, which is not really going to happen under the conditions of the war, right? At least I can tell personally from my own experience that it just really, you know, I've done nothing since February 24, right? Research-wise, right? And so the main purpose is that I think at this point is to find to bring people to safety so that they can get 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 the sense of some kind of security and come back to and come back to the and come back to the come back to their senses and then maybe at some point in down the road, right, we can talk about some valuable or any kind of sustainable research, right? But that's not really going to happen anytime. I mean, I at least don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. You know, people who apply usually ask me after they got position, they ask me, so what's you know, okay, so I got a position, right? And so what's going to happen next, right? What I what if I fail? And I usually tell people, you know, you've done already so much, you know, you you brought yourself and your child and very often to safety and no human should have been asked to do anything like this in 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 during their lifetime so whatever comes next it is going to be so much easier but i hope that the at, at institutions on the other end right the kind of the recipient who get all these people also understand that this is what's going to happen and um, I mean, I don't know, I'll be happy to answer questions, right? And I talked about it in kind of in different, in different, uh, in different venues is that um, um, there are a lot of people who can apply. There are a lot of people who, who, who know how to apply, but there are also a lot of people who cannot really apply by themselves. And there are different reasons for that. I think that especially at the beginning and Katarina knows from, uh, from her own experience, you know, I think that, you know, you had, we had to ask people to apply. I mean, remember Katarina kept saying, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere, right? So, and Helena remembers this. I think that people, so many people went such a shock at the beginning that, I, that people just couldn't really make, you know, sense of what's happening. And so people just refused to apply. And now I think there are more and more people who are actually willing to apply. And we just, you know, corresponded with a school to, today early and with some other people, there are kind of a flow of application coming in. I think that people are realizing that this is not, it's for real, it's for long term, it's for, it's for long, that this is not going to stop, right? That it's not going to stop anytime soon. So, and especially this was for people in, you know, there are different kind of, different kind of places and different kind of applications, but um, especially for people with young children, I think it's really valuable and it's really helpful is there a, to, to kind of to help them apply for positions that have some kind of security, not just for two months or three months, but at least for a year. And that's a kind of, I think this is, while there's a lot of positions, there are tons of positions everywhere. Most of them are very short term and Katarina knows also from her own experience, right? So two months doesn't really get you anywhere, right? Two months basically extends insecurity, unfortunately, right? And especially with people who are traveling with young children, and I've been working with, you know, with several families, with very young children, and with kind of with all kind of medical conditions, right? You know, we need some kind of, we need some kind of places where they can have at least a year long position, right? And so, so some of these positions actually are 
in the US and the US actually opened their doors and the US have been bringing, have been bringing people to here to different academic institutions and there are a variety of scholarships for, for, uh, uh, for undergrads and for graduate students, also for researchers. But the US is, it has all these applications open up a different set of issues. Mostly the logistics here in the mm -hmm. US is impossible, you know, and as we actually start dealing with the logistics of like, you know, just bringing people in, visas and health issues, right? Uh, medical, you know, ins health insurance, uh, housing, it just becomes so difficult. And when people apply, I usually, even uh, when people apply, I usually, one second. Uh, I usually tell them, you know, if you can find places in Europe because U.S. is just so hard. You know, U.S. Is, I mean, I've been living in the U.S. for like almost 20 years, and I still find it like impossible. The logistics here is impossible, but I cannot imagine families with like with children coming here and you know, like just finding housing, finding you know the furniture and this and the health insurance situation. It just is. It just really, really difficult. And uh, another thing, you know, I'm go I'm not going to. I, I would like to conclude, wrap up, maybe with a, uh, for another minute or two. And we've been discussing this with Ascolt for a long time. And mm -hmm. fortunately, there is going to be more. There are more options, and more options of like this. So what we really need, and I don't know what the audience is, you know. So what we really need, and I think what's the most the most useful of all are the so-called non-residential fellowships. This is kind of the type of fellowships that basically give people some money to live. Not with, notwithstanding where they live, right? So the 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 the, the stipends that allow people basically to pay for housing and basically find some kind of safety and you know pay for food, um, no matter where they are, right? So this is mostly for people who are in Ukraine, but this is also for people who are anywhere in Europe that cannot or don't want to uh, un unable to move to to kind of to, to residential fellowship somewhere else. And we know and we know that moving from one country to another, right, is difficult, right? Once you want one country you have to apply when we apply <laughs> To, you have to apply for residence and everything. So, okay, I think I, I think I run out of um, my son is out of patience. So I have to I haven't unfortunately to stop. But I'm happy to open questions that can chat or anything, right? And I've been telling people, right? You know, and I, I have a lot of requests. But if anyone, if anyone, if anyone like needs help applying or finding place placements, you know, please feel free to contact me directly. You know, and I, I cannot promise anything, but you know, I've been trying to help people the best I can. And thank you, Marianne, again for, 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 for putting it all together. Thank you, Irina. And uh, Marianne, just remind me that this whole event is created for emergency fund uh, that will help to uh, different scholars to give them non-residential uh, fellowships and uh, as well as residential fellowship. So please donate to Shevchenko Scientific Societies to support such scholars and uh, fellows. But today we also have the our first panelist who um, also researcher and um, who received his PhD in physics from uh, the University of Michigan, the George Gamota, and he have been doing basic solid state physics research and well labs for eight years. And he has found the director of research at the Office of Security of Defense, professor of physics and director of the Institute of Science and Technology. And for 30 years, he has been constantly worked in Ukraine on the projects helping Ukrainian scientists. And for example, currently he is a member of two working groups uh, focused on help to Ukrainian uh, scientists. Uh, please, George, uh, uh, this is, floor is yours. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Katarina. I just want to make sure that I can share my uh, screen. Do you see uh, the sharing? Yes. OK. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me, uh, Markian and the Shevchenko uh, Scientific Society. I feel a little bit like a fish out of water here because uh, my concentration is on the hard sciences and engineering. And I think cultural aspects are very important. And I kind of resonated with Virko's comments about his growing up in the US and having to defend yourself. Uh, being Ukrainian, they either wanted to label you as Russian or Polish, and you had to almost uh, tell your teachers to point on the map and say, no, this is Ukraine and I'm Ukrainian. 
So anyway, but that you know, most most of us our age uh, have had this experience. Um, I have been involved with Ukrainian science and technology for over 30 years since independence. I first received uh, an invitation uh, from Ihor Yuknowski. Uh, can you see this? Uh, back uh, in 1992, early, when he came to uh, visit uh, the embassy in Washington, I still lived in Washington at that time. And uh, he is a, was a science advisor to President Krauchuk. And he basically comes from Lviv. And since I was born in Lviv, we had a lot of common things to talk about, but most of it was has to do with physics. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist. But as uh, President Krochuk's science advisor, he said, you know, we really would like you to come to Ukraine and uh, do an assessment of uh, what our capabilities are. He said, you know, we inherited a large country, but many centers of technology reported to Moscow and now they're ours, but I don't even know where they are. So uh, I took him up on that and uh, spent six weeks. So this is uh, in 1992 going around um, Ukraine, starting with uh, Kiev, going to Kharkiv, Dnipro, uh, Melkowayu, Odessa, Lviv, and then back up to Cave. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I had the opportunity, for example, to meet the future president, second president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma. He was the director of uh, Yushmash, which is a facility that build SS-24 intercontinental missiles. Um, and um, it was an interesting uh, meeting because his uh, Ukrainian was essentially non-existent and uh, I didn't speak uh, Russian. So uh, we kind of talked, I spoke Ukrainian and he spoke Russian. And, and whenever I needed translation, I asked my friend to please, could you translate me what Kushma was saying? But it was a very good meeting because it was important for later on interactions when he became uh, president. Uh, there is a, a, a big effort that uh, started probably around 1992 when the um, various societies uh, and Western world was trying to help um, Ukraine. And the American Physical Society that I'm a fellow of, and I was a member of a committee that created an emergency fund for uh, former Soviet Union. Now, what that means is that most of the attention was given to Russia, but since I was a member, I kind of pushed to make sure that Ukraine got its fair share, and as a result was given the uh, chance to manage the program. The program was, was quite good because the physical society provided funds uh, and it was leveraged a little bit with George Soros funding. And we were able to start programs. The most important one was a small grant program uh, that we were given on a competitive basis to young people. Uh, and here we have a year later after the grant program uh, started, we came to kind of do a review or inventory of the program. And as you can see from the slide, the American Physical Society uh, CEO, uh, Judy Franz, uh, Irving, and myself visited two of the young scientists who used the money. Now the amount of money wasn't very large, but it was $500 in cash that I actually carried uh, on myself to Ukraine at that time. And they use it to further their research rather than spending it on personal uh, matters. And they actually did publish a, a paper as a result of it. So we were very uh, excited about that. Uh, what I found was the great potential and eagerness to connect with the rest, the Western world, especially the young people who just were eager to do that. Uh, 
but there were necessary transformations that had to take place in order for really Ukrainians to connect to the West. And I have to say that there was also some opposition, some older established people, uh, particularly uh, uh, <clears throat> Boris Paton, who was forever uh, leader of the uh, National Academy of Sciences, who really wanted to continue a relationship with Russia and uh, did not really encourage the scientists to reach out to the West. Uh, that's another story, but in my brief remarks, I really don't want to get into that. Um, what I, I wanted to talk about is other efforts that were happening uh, right then and there. The Science and Technology Center in Kiev uh, provided a lot of funding uh, for scientists and continues to do that as of today. Uh, they exist uh, in Kiev and are managed. The general manager is a Canadian, uh, typically of uh, Ukrainian extraction and the vice chair is an American. Um, they provided a lot of funding uh, in Ukraine for those who were involved with military projects and tried to steer them away from um, uh, projects that dealt with weapons, which actually now is kind of reversed because we're encouraging Ukrainian scientists to like the World War II American scientists helped the war effort. We're trying to get the Ukrainian scientists to work on war effort. Making Molotov cocktails is important, but I think they can do much more than that. Uh, the other aspect that was important is to help uh, Ukrainians begin the idea of not only doing research, but utilize that research for economic development. And so I started some business incubators, technology business incubators. And here you can see uh, the incubator in Kharkiv that we initiated and it continued uh, to this day, except now I lost contact with the people there and I suspect that they will possibly have been bombed. Well, you know, things continued, but to a large extent, um, the Ukrainians, in some ways, the scientists uh, rarely spoke as Ukrainians. Uh, and in fact, interestingly enough, there was a, a researcher at Stanford University, uh, a woman who sort of portrayed herself as Russian. And then as a result of the war, she suddenly said, hey, you know, I really want to identify myself as Ukrainian because this is crazy. I use Russian as an excuse to not to get into debates with people, but now I want to express myself. So we have a lot of Ukrainians who are kind of hidden uh, and now coming forth. And this is true in the scientific community as well as uh, general population. Um, especially, I would say, Ukrainian Jews who then were kind of hidden under the Russian uh, umbrella are now expressing very proudly the fact I'm a Ukrainian Jew from Odessa or Kiev or some other place. Um, Georgia, uh, I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt. This is Mark Yam. Um, yes. If you could uh, click on the bottom of your PowerPoint, just make that full screen. It'll, you know, pictures will be a lot easier for everyone to see. All right. And okay. then also we're coming up on the end of How time that? here. Oh, oh, that's perfect. We're coming okay. up a little bit on the end of time here. So if um, you could wrap okay. up in the next couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, all right. Well, fast forward, um, what we have the situation today um, is a, a, another emergency. And I think that this is where I, I, I think it can ex be of use to other people. Uh, and I will skip this and I will skip this. A lot of scientists have been killed in the process. And, um, you know, uh, here are a few examples. Uh, Science Magazine published a list of uh, scholarly uh, deaths. Uh, and this is just a partial list because they really don't have a, a complete list as of now. Uh, the White House uh, on March 11th published a paper, a memo 
to all of the research and development uh, uh, organizations, basically saying, hey, you need to do something to help Ukraine. And here I un underline swift action by the administration and Congress can make a significant positive impact on the outcome of the crisis, providing aid to Ukrainian students and researchers and their families. Uh, is a, a right moral imperative action that our leaders must immediately undertake. Well, the good thing is that the Department of Energy Office of Science was the first one to react and send out this note to all of its grantees. And there are thousands of grantees and saying, you, uh, we're asking you to identify Ukrainians of uh, similar interest to yours and uh, start collaborating and we will provide funding for you. And now this is important because that means that every uh, grantee in essence has extra money to spend on Ukrainian researchers. And that money can be spent whatever way that they agree to do it. Uh, the only catch is that there has to be a, um, a grantee that say works at the University of Michigan has to identify a Ukrainian that is connected to a university or other organization so that there can be a money transfer. It cannot go into personal accounts. Uh, now, American Chemical Society just recently came out with a note saying we will support Ukrainian uh, scientists, women especially, who are in need of help. Now, why women? Well, if you can think about it, there are 95,000 scientists in Ukraine. And uh, of those 78,000 are still in Ukraine. They might be displaced, but they're in Ukraine. 22,000 have left. Now, most of them are women who are in uh, Poland, Slovakia, what have you. And this is an attempt at the American Chemical Society to provide help to them. Now, we're not looking for, looking for positions. These are uh, where uh, money that can be spent on continuing your research wherever you are. Now, uh, you might say, what else is it done? Well, the American National, uh, let's see, let me get out of this. Uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences and uh, Engineering and Medicine as a working group, I'm a member of that, to try to come up with ways that we can help Ukrainian uh, scientists. The focus is really on helping Ukrainians in Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's another ball game to helping those who have are displaced and are working outside of Ukraine. But there has been a tremendous brain drain from Ukraine of Ukrainian scientists. And the efforts are here to help sustain the Ukrainians working in Ukraine. Uh, the American Physical Society is creating a portal where we, we will identify Ukrainians uh, in various fields and Americans uh, who have got grants uh, or contracts from the departments of energy and others, and then try to uh, form collaborative efforts. This is just at the beginning, but I think it's a short term uh, and the uh, efforts are going to last at least a year long. Um, but it's a work in progress. And I just wanted to report on it today. Uh, next week, things will change. And hopefully, I will be able to give you some uh, concrete examples. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Ascol. Thank you, Irina. And thank you, Olga. I have one question, but I have but I think that we uh, would run of time if I will ask you. But just in general, it's interesting how like many institutions and many individuals are trying to help uh, Ukrainian colleagues and uh, create and organize um, different funds or initiatives or events just to support them. But for now, what um, I can say is that if you want to help, uh, if you want to help uh, Ukrainian scientific and research society and writers or many other talented people, you can donate to Shevchenko Scientific Society and to support this emergency fund that will, um, after that, they will organize a different kind of 
types of fellowship, non-residential and residential. And this is how we can uh, support our colleagues. And now I have to give a floor to Mark Ian, who will, repre uh, who will present, um, uh, represent the next uh, panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Katrina, and uh, to all of our panelists, um, Askold, Irena, uh, George, and Olha. Um, we are going to go to the math, economics, and technical sciences panel next. Um, but first, we're going to take a couple of minutes break to listen to an anthem of Ukrainian resistance by Okan Eze. The song is called Ez Boyu. Okay, thank you. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce um, the next panel. Um, 
chaired by Dr. Roman Bruch, um, who is at Rutgers University, and he is the uh, director of the math and science section of Entesha in the United States, uh, Dr. Bruch. Thank you, Markia. So, uh, many members of our mathematics and science section at Entesha are involved in collaboration with universities in Ukraine. And now at this time, as Russia's, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, so they also help as much as they can. So we have four speakers in our panel in this hour. Uh, this is Anna Nagurny, Yuri Horodnichenko, Oleksiy Vodokhin, and Melania Ninka. And also one member of our section, Irena Zinyuk, will present at, about, at four o'clock or later a little bit during interdisciplinary panel as she has some conflict in, he, in her schedule. So you can send your questions or comments using chat so I can read it to speaker after presentation. Ви можете надавати, задавати свої питання, також подавати коментарі українською мовою в чат, що я на Zoom, і я зачитаю їх після презентації. Всі наші доповідачі добре володіють українською мовою, так що якщо потрібно, вони зможуть вам відповісти також по-українськи. So now uh, let me introduce our first speaker, Professor Anna Nagurny. Her topic is uh, Super Networks in Ukraine. So Anna Nagurny is the chair and the integrative studies in integrative studies at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the director of the Virtual Center for Super Networks, which she founded in 2001. Uh, she is the author of 15 books, more than 220 referred journal articles, and over 50 book chapters. Uh, professor Nagurny was a visiting professor at universities in Sweden, at Oxford University, at Harvard, at MIT, at Brown University. Uh, she has been recognized for her research on networks by many universities throughout the world. Uh, Anna Nagurny research focuses on network systems uh, from transportation to logical ones, including supply chains uh, to financial, economic, social networks and their integration along with the internet. So please, uh, Professor Anna Nagurny, so please, thank you. Just a minute, please. Just trying to get my slides. We'll just take a minute. Some things up here. Um, while Dr. Nagurney is getting her slides up, I just wanted to announce that um, we have raised almost $10,000 today um, to benefit the Shuchenko Emergency Fund, and we've just received an additional anonymous donation of another $10,000 on top of that. Um, so thank you very, very much um, to everyone who is donating. Okay, just a minute. Oops, apologies for this. Uh, it's a matter of sharing the screen and it's kind of jumpy. But in any event, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for this very special day. And I'm very much honored to be able to speak with you. As Dr. Brook mentioned, I'll be talking about super networks in Ukraine, and I'd like to dedicate my presentation to peace-loving Ukrainians as they fight for their freedom in Slava Ukraini. 
So uh, I started working on super networks by writing a book that was published over 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. And also at the time I founded the Virtual Center for Super Networks. And I'm pleased that among the center associates and one of my students there was a student from Ukraine, Mitra Matsupura. And the idea actually germinated uh, through a talk that Jack Smith, who is the CEO of General Motors, gave at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I was lucky to get funding from the National Science Foundation and several other foundations to start the center. So you might ask, what are super networks? Well, super networks are networks of networks and their applications are vast and growing. We think about congested urban transportation networks, complex supply chains, social networks, which are extremely important, financial networks, electric power networks, and also the internet. Now, the study of super networks focuses on the interactions among different network systems that underpin our societies and economies. For example, we know when the internet goes down, that affects our financial networks, our airline networks, and also uh, communications. So, uh, supply chains are actually one of the most important applications of super networks, and we're seeing the critical role that supply chains are playing now, for example, in Ukraine. Ukraine is renowned for its agriculture and also uh, for many other kinds of products. So when we study uh, supply chains, we're interested in the behavior underlying the decision makers. I'll show you several different network topologies. We're interested in capturing the behavior of different decision makers, figuring out who might get profits, what are the associated costs, what do consumers get, and so on. So since I work in uh, operations research, management science, and also network economics, a lot of our work involves mathematical modeling. And I truly believe that networks are a great way of abstracting a lot of phenomenon, a lot of different kinds of systems. And it's also something that decision makers really appreciate because it's a graphical kind of approach. So here I have an example of a multi-level network system where you have commodity shipments that are flowing uh, in one direction, you have information that's being exchanged, and the flows upward are prices associated with the financial network. Now, when we work on super networks, uh, sometimes we're also very much interested in integrating social networks with supply chains or even social networks with financial networks. So on supply chains, you have products flowing. On social networks, you would have relationships and strengths of relationships. So a lot of very interesting modeling that underlies these different kinds of network systems. Now, typically, as Dr. Brook mentioned, I love to write books. Um, most of my books will have a network theme. I'm now in the process. I just got another book contract, so I'm very excited about that. So in the past couple of years, a lot of the applications that we've been concerned about have involved perishable product supply chains. And they're also very, very important to the Ukrainian economy. And when I talk about perishable product supply chains or time sensitive product supply chains, we use also tools from different disciplines to model these. For example, food is highly perishable. So we have to model chemical phenomena. Blood is also highly perishable. When we're dealing with medical and nuclear ties, there's a physics phenomena underneath it. So it's always interesting to see how the different disciplines interact and help us to abstract and model various supply chains, which are very, very important in a better way. Now, in the pandemic, what I've been uh, very, very obsessed about is integrating labor into supply chains and identifying what are the different kinds of disruptions associated with labor and the kind of impact. So I think as we're seeing in Ukraine now, it really is all about people. It's about our people. It's how they work, how they produce. It's, you know, the work that they do in healthcare and manufacturing, in agriculture, and also in defending uh, the country. So uh, the first kind of application that we started working on that integrates labor with supply chain networks is perishable product food supply chains. And that was because in the pandemic, we could see that uh, the major 
ramifications of disruptions. Many people were getting ill, some were perishing, for example, in meat processing plants and so on. So it's very important to do that kind of modeling. And of course, Ukraine is known as the breadbasket, not only of Europe, but I would say the world, because the MENA countries, Middle Eastern, North African countries depend on wheat. Uh, obviously from Ukraine, Indonesia does, many countries in Europe as well, and even Asia. So what's happening now in Ukraine is exacerbating food insecurity. And the first paper that we published, I also do a lot of work in humanitarian logistics and disasters, was in a refereed volume, which I co-edited on dynamics of disasters. So we identified the network topology, and this kind of model is what is known as a generalized network model, because we would have, for example, associated with the links various arc multipliers. So you might begin with a certain amount of product, but what actually ends up at the demand points is a lower volume and or a lower quality. And we're seeing what's happening now in Ukraine. Honestly, it's like uh, deja vu, hello, the more again. We're having uh, much of the wheat perishing in warehouses. It can't get to the points of demand because the uh, ports are blockaded. Uh, the Black Sea is being mined. You know, transportation links are disrupted. So the kind of work that we do, you could do analyses associated with that. And I think that's really, really important. And in addition to these kinds of models that integrate labor with different kinds of capacities associated with labor, we've gone on to study all sorts of shortcomings associated with production of healthcare supplies, such as PPEs in the pandemic, in an optimization framework, and also in a game theory framework. Okay, because there's a lot of competition in different sectors for labor, because you just don't have enough labor. And we thought that was really important to cover. And our work has been recognized even uh, with awards in the pandemic. So these are different kinds of supply chain topologies. And we associate different kinds of links because sometimes you might be able to reallocate labor across different kinds of network economic activities or sometimes not. And this would be, for example, a network where you have multiple firms competing, trying to get substitutable products to different points of demand. And you're interested in figuring out what are going to be the profits, the, pro uh, the product flows, and also the prices that the consumers are going to pay. We also have done a lot of work on investing in productivity uh, to take care of workers and seeing you know, what would be the positive outcomes associated with that, and also what are appropriate wages that workers should be paid. Now, in terms of super networks, our work is not only limited um, or applied to different kinds of uh, supply chain network problems, but we've also been doing for the past 20 years or so, uh, models of human migration networks and even on refugee networks. And you see what Ukraine is struggling with right now. Okay, so really we pray for Ukraine. So what we've done is not only done optimization and various non-cooperative game theory models where you have competition, but also we became interested in could there be you know, effective partnerships? And we've been hearing about that throughout the day, uh, right? Which I think are really, really exciting, uh, not only for pandemic preparedness, but also in terms of war. So interesting enough, there's also a Ukrainian connection here. Uh, just before uh, the pandemic was declared, uh, we published a paper in a special issue of the IBM Journal of Research and Development. And we were invited by Dr. Yuri Parashtak, who was a former employer, actually executive IBM, who just happens to be Ukrainian. So in our paper, what we do is we consider different humanitarian organizations. And we know there are so many that now are working in Ukraine and Poland and so on to assist with you know, procurement of supplies, delivery of supplies, and also with refugee flows. And say they're interesting, interested in identifying possible partnerships. And uh, so we work on quantifying synergies associated with different kinds of organizations after cooperation. And we have metrics, and I think that's very, very useful. We have uncertain costs, uncertain demands, and so on. So you can see who should partner with whom, You know how you can redesign the networks and so on. So you have greater benefit and also synergy. So this is useful for disaster relief operations as we're having now in 
the time of war. So what I believe, obviously, many of us are academics who are taking part in this uh, very special uh, event today. So we publish or we perish. But I also believe in outreach, in public outreach, and writing about the kind of research that we do, I think. I know uh, many of the speakers today are very active in speaking to the media. So uh, throughout the pandemic and even before, I would write a lot of op-eds. And I think that's really important because, you know, if you write well, you can influence policy. So uh, the day that the World Health Organization declared the pandemic, right, was, I think we'll never forget it, March 11, 2020, the day after I published my op-ed on blood supply chains, which is a perishable product, and they, because there were a lot of shortcomings and so on. And I continued to write, okay, whether it has to do with vaccine and the ultra cold chain, uh, whether we're dealing with shortages now in terms of containers, they're not in the right places, and uh, all sorts of global supply chain uh, disruptions. I thought that was really, really important. Okay. And I continue to do that. And then the media reaches out to you and you can speak. Okay. And that's very important now to be, you know, speaking the truth about what's happening in Ukraine. So uh, the article that I wrote that was published in the conversation, you know, just a day after the declaration uh, was noticed by higher level administrators and it was cited in a uh, document and a memo, and it was able, it was instrumental in helping to change uh, blood supply chains and policies in the US. And I found that very, very gratifying. And now the one who's instrumental, the attorney general in uh, actually supporting uh, my work is the head of the uh, human and uh, health and human services department. So when it comes to Ukraine, okay, the latest invasion happened on February 24th. Already I was contacted by the media just four days after. And I was talking about a cultural genocide because I wanted to get the word genocide out there in whatever way I could. And uh, I've been talking about cybersecurity, obviously about agricultural supply chains, and even uh, in terms of supply chain education to educate students. I teach a course on humanitarian logistics and healthcare now, and students say it's the most useful course that they could possibly be taking. And I think that's a great, great honor. So we see that Russia's war against Ukraine is really an unmitigated disaster. There have been various estimates uh, that the economy is expected to contract about you know, 50% um, in 2022. At the same time, I wanna say, I think Ukrainians are an inspiration to the world, okay? As well, their resilience is resonating with everyone. Uh, we will have to make sure that Ukraine gets the financial resources that it needs. And as we start to rebuild and reconstruct, we can see that critical infrastructure networks are going to be extremely important in terms of rebuilding the country. And this is something that I work on, okay, from redesigning better roads, other kinds of transportation links to electric power networks and telecommunication networks, because the costs associated with the destructions of these now in the, uh, Ukraine are, are really, really horrific. So I'm so honored that Dr. Yudi Gorodnachenko will be following me. And I think it's really important to emphasize the great work that academics are doing now in support of Ukraine and will be doing in terms of reconstruction. So we'll be hearing more about the blueprint. And in rebuilding uh, the critical infrastructure networks, I hope that our tools can be used. We wrote a book that allows one to identify which are the most important nodes and links and how to invest accordingly. And this tool that we've developed has been used in multiple countries around the world, even to define better evacuation networks in multiple countries, where to invest in new transportation links in Dublin, and even new maritime routes, for example, in Indonesia. So my connections to Ukraine are very strong. That's my first language. I'm the daughter of World War II refugees. I was born in Canada. And I've, for the past couple of years, I've had the great honor to serve on the International Academic Board of the Cave School of Economics and also on its board of directors. 
And since the latest invasion of Ukraine, I've been elected the co-chair of the KSC Board of Directors, and that's a great honor. And I've been working very diligently at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to uh, forge even stronger connections. We signed a memorandum of agreement with the Cave School of Economics. And just this week, I heard some very, very good news. There will be substantial funds in supporting our uh, virtual scholar in residence program, and also in supporting students both online and in person, and even our director of national award-winning dining services says students from Ukraine will be able to get our delicious food for free. So these are some photos. The last time I had the honor of being in beautiful, beautiful Ukraine was September 2019 uh, for a board meeting of the KF School of Economics. So I thought I'd share some of these lovely photos with you, along with the new pra, the trams, the president of KSC, Timofey Milovanov, who is truly, truly inspiring. So I thank you very much for your attention. I have posted this presentation on the Virtual Center for Super Networks, where we also have a lot of our publications, pedagogical material, and so on. So thank you very much for listening. Slava Ukraini, and all the best to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nagorny Panyanma. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Yuri Ornichenko. And his topic is the reconstruction of Ukraine. So Yuri Horgnichenko is native of Ukraine. And uh, so he is a presidential professor at the Department of Economics, University of California, California Berkeley. So he received his uh, BA and MA in, um, at the Kiev Mohel Academy, KU Ukraine, and his PhD at the University of Michigan. So a significant part of his research has been about uh, monetary policy, uh, taxation, economic growth, and business cycles. So Yuri serves on many editorial boards, including Journal of Monetary Economics and Vox Ukraine. So his uh, work was published in leading economics journals and was cited in policy discussion and media. So Yuri has uh, received numerous awards for his research. So uh, please, Professor uh, Yuri Gurdnichenko, The Reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you, Roman, and thank you, Anna, for this uh, wonderful presentation earlier and making a transition to, to my slides. Uh, by training, I'm a macroeconomist, and so I often study how we can do a, an economic recovery after a big recession, um, the Great Recession, the Great Depression, the COVID crisis. I have never thought I'm going to work on anything related to reconstruction of Ukraine after a major uh, war. Um, but, you know, fortunately, we have many, many friends um, uh, in academia, people who really care about Ukraine, who are willing to volunteer there. Uh, expertise, their networks, uh, their time, and uh, try to devise a plan how you can rebuild Ukraine into a better country. Now, as a matter of introduction, let me show you the trajectory of <clears throat> the uh, development of Ukraine since its independence. Uh, this is GDP per capita, probably the most important metric of welfare in the economy. And uh, we started with relatively high level, then we know it was an extremely difficult time in the 90s when we had uh, hyperinflation, uh, a major economic crisis. Uh, then we had a phase of you know, rapid recovery, but then um, since the Great Recession, 2007-2008, the Ukrainian uh, income per capita was really stagnating. We see that in 2014 it fell, there was another war. Uh, there was in a recovery stage, then there is COVID, and now we're going to be, you know, somewhere here. Um, so it, it's really tragic that we may be again at the trough of what we experienced in the 90s. Uh, but this is not our destiny. You know, I think our destiny is to have a prosperous country, a part of the European Union, uh, where people are going to have uh, freedom and economic prosperity. 
Now, this is how Ukraine looks now. Uh, this is Azov style um, in Mariupol. Um, and as Anna mentioned earlier, the contraction of economic activity is really dramatic, 30 to 50% of GDP. Um, given the scale of the aggression, maybe it's not surprising <clears throat> that uh, this collapse is, is so big, but at the same time, we see uh, many, many signs of uh, economic resilience. Uh, we have you know, brave people uh, uh, fighting the Russian armed forces. We also have amazing uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen uh, who keep the economy running. Now, it seems like this is going to be you know, a long process. It's never going to end and we'll never have a recovery. But <clears throat> as a point of reference, I wanted to show you two pictures. This is uh, Cologne or Cologne in Germany. This is how it looked immediately after World War II. This is how it looks now. Okay, So this looks terrible, like Mariupol. Uh, this is a modern city, uh, very dynamic, very vibrant. So what we need is a new plan of reconstruction, a Marshall Plan, similar to what was done for Germany after World War II, when it seemed that you know, everything is, is going to lay in ruins for many, many years to come. And yet Germany was a, an economic miracle, it recovered and became the, the biggest economy in Europe. So I was very pleased when uh, my colleagues uh, from various places, from Harvard, from MIT, from the Kiev School of Economics, um, Europeans, Americans, Ukrainians, teamed up to write this report, uh, a blueprint for the reconstruction of Ukraine, where we outline you know, some key elements of how we see the next stages for uh, the rebuilding of Ukraine. And uh, in my talk, I will very briefly outline uh, what we see there. First one, uh, where money is going to come. Uh, we already see that a lot of aid coming uh, from uh, governments directly, uh, the land lease, maybe uh, other forms of uh, direct support. Uh, we, we expect that more support like this is going to be uh, on the way. Uh, multilateral institutions are willing to help Ukraine in a variety of ways. Uh, we see private sources, Shevchenko Society would be one example of this. Uh, we know Russian uh, assets which are frozen um, in the U.S. and elsewhere may be a source of compensation for the damages and losses that Ukraine experienced uh, so far and likely will experience in, in the coming weeks and maybe months. Uh, we also can uh, potentially count on uh, some form of reparation payments, uh, similar, for example, to what was done uh after iraq invaded kuwait and cumulatively over 30 years uh, uh iraq paid 50 billion dollars uh in reparations so this may be a very significant source of revenue as well um, so in principle we can raise a lot of money through these various sources now i have to think about uh principles how we're going to organize this help and um one thing which uh, should be clear in the design of these efforts is that this, this aid should be uh, very, very fast. You know, we, we have lots of suffering, lots of pain in Ukraine. Uh, we need to give resources immediately to the affected areas. Uh, we also know we need to have some type of conditionality because we're going to spend um, uh, taxpayers' money uh, from other countries and they want to have accountability and transparency. And so we should be doing that. Um, we should not rely on loans. Um, in, in the economy which is destroyed by the war, it's very hard to expect that any kind of debt is going to be repaid. And again, as a point of reference, 90% of payments during the Marshall Plan were in the form of grants. So you are not expected to repay back. Uh, we will see a lot of uh, willingness to support from all corners of the world. And it's going to be very important to coordinate these efforts and maybe we can use networks um, developed by uh, Anna to, to, to coordinate this. Uh, and to the Senate, it's, it's, it's going to be very important to have some type of uh, central agency that is going to accumulate these resources and make sure that they're going to put to the best uses. We suggest it's going to be uh, directed by the European Union just to make sure that the interests of Ukraine and Europe are going to be aligned as much as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that Ukraine owns reforms, right? So we build a road in Ukraine, not because it is convenient for a donor. Uh, we want to build this road because Ukraine needs this donor and Ukraine can sustain this road after the aid is withdrawn. 
Uh, we also suggest uh, that a key element, or I should say the key element of any reconstruction effort is effectively uh, the endpoint, uh, which is EU integration. Ukraine has to be a part of the European Union. It, it's going to be an ultimate uh, driving force in, in the success of this program. We also should use this as an opportunity to modernize the country in a, in a dramatic way. So we often hear about carbon-free future. Uh, when we need uh, to rebuild Mariupol or Kharkiv, we, we don't need to restore them to their original state. We can think of better ways to design more efficient, energy efficient cities and uh, you know get rid of dependence on uh, fuel, energy, and through this also reduce our dependence on, on Russia energy. Uh, reduction of corruption, that's a perennial problem for Ukraine. And we, again, we should use this as an opportunity to clean up our um, institutions and, and make sure we have the best allocation of resources. Very quickly in terms of phases, you know, obviously the first phase is going to be some type of uh, humanitarian exercise where we need to give food and fuel uh, to the uh, affected areas, make sure people don't starve to death or something like this. Uh, then the next stage is just to make sure that we can operate ports, railroads, uh, roads, uh, airports, so that you know goods uh, can flow in and out of Ukraine. For example, we know now that uh, a lot of grain in Ukraine is sitting uh, and waiting shipment, and we can't do this because ports are blocked or railroads are not uh, having enough capacity to do so. We, we need to radically improve the situation there. Uh, the third stage is going to be the most important, and uh, it will take many, many years, five, ten years, maybe more. And uh, this is our uh, trajectory. Uh, this is our path to join the EU, uh, build back better, uh, import technologies on a massive scale, really upgrade infrastructure, so really turn Ukraine into a modern uh, European country. Um, and finally, in terms of how much this is going to cost, uh, we can calculate damages in Ukraine and we're already looking at huge sums of money, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. And I wanted to give you a perspective on uh, how much uh, such reconstruction efforts uh, are, you know, cost uh, in the past. For example, Marshall Plan, if you scale it to the modern side of the economy, this is going to be roughly $500 billion. Uh, the reunification of Germany, so you can think of this as also a reconstruction exercise. The total cost was 2 trillion euros, and uh, just infrastructure alone was 300 uh, billion euros. Afghanistan, it's a much smaller country than Ukraine. U.S. alone paid $145 billion. So if we scale this up, it should be roughly $300 billion for Ukraine. Reconstruction of Iraq, again, a much smaller country, a lot of money. Reconstruction of Kuwait, $50 billion. Poland, it was not exactly a reconstruction of the World War II or anything like this, a major war, uh, but just updating the infrastructure of the country amounted to $160 billion over 15 years. Okay, So when you look at these magnitudes and, uh, and put them in the Ukrainian context, the, the cost of reconstruction is probably going to be 200, 500 billion euros, and this is as of end of March. And we know every day of war is going to raise the cost, is going to uh, give more suffering, more pain to anybody in Ukraine. Um, and so this uh, price tag uh, is increasing very, very rapidly. But we should be prepared that this, this kind of money is, is what Ukraine needs to, to recover after this war. So let me stop here and thank you again for including me in this very important event. Yeah, thank you very much, Yuri. Yeah, that was very interesting talk, uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would like to to go back to our previous um, uh, presenter, Panya uh, Nagur Nahirna. Uh, there is one comment from Panya uh, Halena Rain, our president of Antesha. Uh, dear Anna, your work is an inspiration for yes. all of us. We are so fortunate to have you among us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind, Dr. Helen. I appreciate it. We'll overcome together with our great work and our great networks and resilience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd like 
to thank again uh, Anna Nagurna and uh, Yuri Ornishenko. So our next speaker is um, Oleksiy Ladokhin, and his topic is promoting Ukrainian narrative in science. So uh, Oleksiy Ladokhin is professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Kansas Medical Center and the editor in chief of the, the Journal of Membrane Biology. He is the author of over 100 scientific publications. Oleksiy is actively working with the Ukrainian scientific community in multiple fields. So uh, thank you and please, uh, Oleksiy, so please. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I hope you can see my slides and you can uh, hear me. Um, uh, this has been really an honor to be invited uh, to follow some distinguished uh, uh, authors and, and present my take of what I believe uh, is an important subject, which is not directly related to my expertise in biophysics. So I'll be talking about promoting Ukrainian narrative in science. And by that, uh, I will touch on uh, certain things of what I believe the narrative is and what the problems with narrative are uh, using my personal experience and then give you several examples on how uh, we as a group were confronting uh, Western promoters of Russian narrative in our letter to science uh, 2016 and then uh, the experience, latest experience using professional academic societies to educate. Um, so first is uh, sort of personal experience and um, my personal tribute to Professor Shimansky, who was my teacher at the Shevchenko National University Department of Physics in the 80s. And uh, Professor Shimansky in the 80s in the Soviet Union would always wear his Vushivanka to work as a point of identity. And that inspired me to follow. And I have to say that uh, this is really um, a good tip to uh, select your social conversations at the professional society meetings. You are pretty much cutting off uh, the Russian world narrative and you attracting Ukrainian narrative this is a small tribute, but uh, the point is, why do we need to do that? And it has been addressed very eloquently in the, on the early stages of this uh, uh, marathon by people uh, in, in the field of culture and in the field of theater and literature, that uh, understanding and stating Ukrainian identity is an important part for Western world to understand that we exist. And in my opinion, unfortunately, science had suffered from uh, really not paying attention. The Ukrainian scientists did not quite pay attention. So I'm gonna give you a really few personal examples of how that could be brought up. Uh, this is a type of uh, my uh, slides for my regular presentation. As a matter of fact, one that was given in Austria a few weeks ago, the picture depicts a graduate student in my uh, just graduating and receiving Vushivanka as a present for his graduation. So now on the Vushivanka day, I have somebody from Chile and next will be Peru doing this. Uh, I have collaborators in Ukraine. I always try to present uh, their uh, permanent address like it's done here. Uh, my great collaborator, Alexander Kirichenko from Kazarian University, uh, Karazin University in Kharkiv, who is now being um, uh, relocated to Ternopil, and I'm glad that he's there in relative, relative safety, continuing his academic work. So uh, this is just the personal um, subject. That's not the subject that I wanted to bring to your attention is confronting the narratives that I imposed willingly or unwillingly by promoters of Russian point of view. And uh, this is uh, in 2016, uh, a prominent scientific journal 
called Science, uh, published a featurette uh, uh, out of the cold where they uh, presented seemingly uh, objective depiction of the situation in Crimea, which appears to be objective to many readers uh, who are so entrenched in the imperial narrative. Uh, not only this piece was placed under the subsection of science in Russia, uh, but it also uh, was, was filled with, with anti-Ukrainian uh, narratives uh, and narrative points. And it took a great effort of uh, an initiative group uh, that of dozens of uh, scientists of Ukrainian descent to uh, create a counter letter. And uh, uh, I, I was fortunate to be at the forefront of the interaction with the editors of science. Uh, and we were finally allowed to uh, write our letter where we uh, presented our point and basically uh, suggested that uh, they are catering to Russian propaganda. And uh, you, you can find this letter, his references. And uh, the letter was signed by uh, over 140 uh, scientists worldwide. Uh, we specifically avoided inviting people from Ukraine. So it was uh, Western scientists. We didn't want it presented as a partisan kind of bickering between Ukrainians and Russians. Um, and what is also important that we were allowed, we were actually managed uh, to get an apology or whatever um, passes an apology presented here by the news editor. Uh, because their first reaction was denial and uh, they didn't want to deal with us. But they did issue an apology. And more than that, they allowed us to publish an accompanying e-letter to science, uh, which was entitled Out of the Cold and Kremlin's Weaponization of Culture. And uh, I am presenting the opening paragraphs here, basically stating that this is, uh, we, we went a step by step and analyzed their piece and presented how the goals of uh, Kremlin propaganda were met uh, by, by this piece. And uh, here, this is a final, I can send you whoever is interested, I can send the entire text. Uh, but the point was that uh, it was an exploitation of the uh, natural tendency of Western audience to hear two sides of the story. And the presentation was basically a Kremlin-based narrative where you present both sides of the, every story and both are false. And uh, we uh, hope that uh, with these tools, we'll be able to address some issues. And I have to stress that this was not received particularly well by scientists at that point, because that was 2016 before the DNC hacking. They did not see that this is a part of a concerted effort. And uh, subsequently, I received several letters of apology from my colleagues who did not sign the letter at the time. And they said, well, I, we were right, and we, they should have signed it uh, at that point. And we'll continue this effort. And uh, I think referencing this uh, in the current context is also important. And, uh, and these are co-authors who very much helped uh, uh, with, with me worked on this uh, um, specific letter and you recognize many of the names as uh, uh, prominent members of this society. And the third point I would like to make is the use of uh, uh, professional academic societies such, for example, as a biophysical society to bring up the story. Do not let it slide down. Yes, there was a great uh, recognition of the sacrifice and heroism of Ukrainian people and uh, amazing bravery or, and skill of Ukrainian armed forces, of men and women of Ukrainian armed forces. 
but we should keep a longer perspective. We should need to understand what is happening and bring this, continue this to be on the front pages because this war is not going to be over in a month or two months even. So uh, here I'm presenting um, a small excerpts of uh, uh, what I wrote for the Biophysical Society newsletter, which will be published next week, and uh, basically makes several points about uh, role of Ukraine and as well overlooked historical contributions of Ukraine. So uh, when I am teaching my class and I am teaching spectroscopy, I always make point, well, here's your Yablonsky diagram. And yes, Yablonsky was ethnic Pole, uh, but he was actually born in Ukraine and got his education in Ukraine. Do you know about that? You don't know about that. Uh, the same story is with many other contributions to science they came either from uh, uh, Ukrainian universities so we've seen in par or uh, later on, and uh, uh, emphasizing the Ukrainian origin is important and uh, countering it with the current Russian origin of the war. And here is a very important point because currently, there is a tendency to represent this war as Putin's war or Kremlin's war. And it's a role of Ukrainian society and Ukrainian scientists and Ukrainian diaspora, as well as Ukrainian cultural uh, leaders in this country and around the world to present the truth that indeed this Russian imperial ambition is shared by millions of people beyond uh, the Kremlin's walls. So uh, with this respect, this, this is how I ended this piece that will be published and talking about uh, a revival of Ukraine and revival of Ukrainian science. And I specifically did not talk about our efforts uh, to outline what is needed to be done for Ukrainian science although we also worked on this subject and have several publications. Uh, and this was collaboration with a German-based group of Ukrainian scientists. But the key message that we want to transfer that this is only would be possible when the existential threat to Ukrainian state is over. And to achieve that, we need victory on the battlefield. And we need a destruction of Gregasso's economy. And uh, uh, at this point, I would like to briefly summarize my points that in my personal experience, your personal positions and efforts matter, and that we need to continue confronting people who want to have business as usual and select, let's say, well, we're gonna select Russian scientists because they are all uh, white and fluffy and uh, uh, we cannot punish everybody for actions of their single person leader. That is not true. And I urge you to use uh, professional academic societies uh, that we have and we are part of to educate Western communities about Ukraine. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Alexei. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Melania Nenka. So she's, uh, Melania Nenka is an astrophysicist. So she earned her PhD from Columbia University and is now a research scientist at the Massachusetts University of Technology for Technology. So she helped uh, construct and calibrate the optics uh, of the space-based New Star Telescope which observes our universe in X-rays. So it was sent to space. Uh, so as part of the New Star Galactic Science team, she studies supernovae and black hole at the center of the Milky Way at MIT. Uh, Melania works for the Chandra X-ray Center. So where she provides uh, support for the Chandra telescope. So she has earned several NASA awards 
uh, for outstanding collaboration. Uh, she written 15 uh, peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, also, Melanka recently was in Ukraine and Poland, and she was involved uh, to help Ukrainian refugees. So, so she might say also something about this. So thank you, uh, Melanka, please. Thank uh, you, um, Let me just start my presentation. Okay, so I hope the title slide is up and easily viewable. Um, so as Dr. Bluch said, I am an astrophysicist. I work at MIT. Um, and when most people hear of my job title, they think that I sit on the ground uh, on Earth and I use telescopes to look at the sky from the Earth, which is not an off assumption. A lot of astronomers do use ground-based telescopes. Um, I, in particular, am an observational X-ray astronomer, so I use, uh, in primary, two telescopes um, that are orbiting Earth in, in space. So one is uh, the New Star Telescope, which is on the top, and the other is the Chandra X-ray Telescope, which is the uh, observatory that I work for right now. Um, so those are my two primary telescopes. Um, and the next question most people ask is why do we study X-ray astronomy? Um, and a very simplistic answer is um, to just view a hand with your eyes. You obtain certain pieces of information when you look at uh, a hand. You can see its shape, its color, um, how it moves. Um, but when you tra transition into the X-ray regime, you get completely different pieces of information um, that can tell you a little bit more about the deeper structure of what you're looking at, like the hand. And a very uh, similar thing happens in astronomy. So we, we can use telescopes like the Hubble or ground-based uh, optical telescopes, um, like the kind you would use to look at the moon. And you get several pieces of information with that wavelength. But when you transition into a completely different energy field, you get completely different pieces of information. Um, so my primary field of uh, interest is the galactic center, our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, this is an image in X-ray uh, taken with the Chandra telescope. And the large white potato in the center is a supernova remnant that holds um, the black hole at the center. Um, and so I study the black hole Sagittarius A star quite often. It's not a very bright black hole. So there are a lot of questions. Why is our black hole particularly dim when it is supposed to be a little bit brighter? Um, and then I also observe and analyze all of the other components that hang around the black hole. So because it's such a dense gravitational well with uh, the set, supermassive black hole at the center, there's a lot of material that can't escape its gravitational pull. And with that comes a lot of very interesting objects like supernova remnants, pulsar wind nebulae, um, X-ray binaries. And so I'm happy to answer any questions about the science part of this, if you have any after the talks. Um, but my uh, astrophysical work doesn't particularly um, help Ukraine at the moment. So uh, the past uh, two, about two weeks ago, I, I took a hiatus from work and my husband and I went to Ukraine uh, and Poland. We spent the majority of our time in Poland. And uh, we did what we could to help the humanitarian crisis, uh, mostly at the border in Padamysia. So I'm gonna give you a little example of some of the things that we encountered along our two week trip. Uh, the first is that Poland is doing a phenomenal job supporting Ukraine, both from a structural perspective uh, with government agencies and from an individual pers perspective. Um, people are hanging signs up. These are two examples of signs that were just on fences in Pedemysia. Um, they may these uh, there's a lot of uh, Ukrainians in Pedemysia themselves, but there are also a lot of uh, Polish citizens who have no ties to Ukraine directly, and yet everybody is extremely supportive. Um, you see, you see supportive signs like this plastered all over Pedemysia. And if there's a Polish flag on a building, chances are right next to it is a Ukrainian flag as well. Um, one of the first tasks we did was we transported about 500 pounds of tactical first aid kits 
um, that are <clears throat> packed according to the specs provided by the Ukrainian army. Uh, these were packed, provided, and given to us by Sunflower Peace, is a local organization here in Boston. It's a great organization. Um, we took it to the airport, we checked it through Delta, and we picked it up in Warszawa when we landed in Warsaw. And then we interfaced with the PLAST Scouting Network. PLAST, if you don't know, is a Ukrainian scouting organization originally started in Lviv 110 years ago. And it has since spread to most corners of the world, um, including the US and Poland. And PLAST has this phenomenal network now. It's an ad hoc uh, decentralized transportation network and from Poland into the corners of Ukraine. Um, and they do a wonderful job transporting goods um, wherever they need to go. So uh, we landed in Warszawa and from the time of departure to about 23 hours later, these med kits were in Ukraine, in Ukraine, and they were getting back in the hands of Sunflowers of Peace Network and they were getting distributed to the Ukrainian military wherever they were needed. So this was um, a really unique collaboration between two independent organizations that did what they needed to do to get these med kits where they needed to be. Um, so in Peremyshil, I interfaced a lot with the uh, PLAST scouting organization, the Okrinska Skavska Organizacija. Um, like I said, they are a loose decentralized transportation network, mostly organized by young scouts, uh, anywhere between 16 and about 40 to 50 years old. Um, they are they're doing an incredible job with expedited green corridor access between Poland and Ukraine. So large shipments get transported across the border from Poland into Ukraine very quickly with uh, minimal wait time. Um, and they also do smaller scale uh, transportation if you um, so this particular warehouse that I'll tell you a little bit about uh, took a lot of shipments directly by individual drivers and small vans directly across the border. Um, so there are a number of these warehouses uh, in Warsaw and Pramyshil, as well as in Ukraine, mostly in Lviv and Kiev. Those are the two largest. Um, this particular warehouse where I volunteered a substantial portion of my time in Poland is also linked with a charity called Support for UA and EU. And this is a really interesting charity that connects um, po Polish warehouses with the broader EU network. Uh, so it's not just Poland and Ukraine supporting Ukraine, it is the uh, larger EU system. So the way things worked at this particular warehouse, um, you can see on the left is an example of a forklift bringing uh, donated goods from one section of the warehouse to another. And on the right is one of the rooms where food was being stored. So you can see it's, it's, a, it's a loose collection, uh, loosely organized. Um, and the way it works is that uh, with no schedule or warning, a truck from the support EU network would show up at this warehouse. It could be anywhere from a personal van that somebody had loaded up with donated items to a, a, a large semi-tractor trailer. Um, and they would just show up. The uh, volunteers and organizers at this warehouse would hop into action, unload the donated goods, which ranged from food that you can see here, to medical supplies, um, sleeping bags, um, anything that Ukraine could possibly need would get donated to one of these warehouses. And then uh, once those items were sorted and stacked somewhere in these warehouse rooms, uh, every so often another truck would come and this time it would be empty. And they would say, we're on our way to Kiev, we're on our way to Dnipro, we're on our way to Kharkiv, and we would like to take food for a hundred men for two weeks. Um, or they say we're going to an orphanage, we have a lot of children that need young food for infants, and we would load up what we could. And then we, the trucks would close their doors and travel directly across the border. It was a very uh, efficient system. And these are uh, some photos. Uh, most of the time when a 
truck would come and load up food to be delivered into Ukraine. There was a lot of goodwill and, and, and emotion and everybody wanted to take a photo with their drivers and some of our teams. So these are two photos that I was a part of. Um, I think the left truck was a smaller truck going to an orphanage and cave, and the right truck was going um, as far east as they could with no specific destination in mind. Um, and I will say that a little bit about the people, these amazing young people that were working at the warehouse. I was one of the oldest volunteers. Most of the um, men in the orange vests that you see in the photos are Plastone, are scouts from either Ukraine or Poland. The leader, the main leader of the warehouse was a scout from Lviv who's rented a hotel room and spent most of his time in Premyshel. He'd go back every so often to visit his family. Um, a lot of the scouts from the Polish chapter in Peramyshil worked there um, most of the time. Uh, some of the women in this particular image were refugees themselves. They, uh, Yulia all the way on the left, her home was destroyed in Dnipro and she's in Peramyshil for as the near foreseeable future. And she doesn't wanna sit and do nothing all day. So she spends most of her time volunteering at the warehouse as well. Um, and then there were oh volunteers God. from Germany, from the US, myself included, uh, Poland. So it was, a, it was a broad mix of languages um, and experiences. So it was a very, very interesting uh, location to volunteer. We also got a chance to know- Dr. Um, Dr. Nemke, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, we are coming up on the end of our time on this panel. Um, so if you could wrap up, um, yeah. we'll just, um, thank you so much. This is so interesting. Not a problem. Um, and yeah, so I'll just say that the last uh, slide here shows um, one of the convents in Peremishil. And this is an example, they, they took in volunteers and refugees alike and gave everybody free lodging, food and whatever support they could. Um, so it's an example of the, the network of personal support that people are opening their homes. Um, it's very hard to find a large a uh, group of lodgings that are provided by the government. Most of the refugees are staying in locations that um, are private homes or facilities like this. And it's just a really wonderful network. So that's, those are in general my experiences. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Melamka. Thank you very much. So we have a comment. Uh, so Bravo Plus is doing a lot of uh, behind the scenes work, and also another, so this command from Alex Orishkevich, and another command from Anna Nagurny. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your great work, Melania, and that of PLUST. Uh, remember, finally um, uh, belonging to PLUST as a child and summer camp in East Chatham. So this was from Anna Nagurni. So thank you very much, Melanie, again. So, so I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Anna Nagurni, Yuri Gornichenko, Oleksiy Ladokhin, and Melania Nenka for their very interesting presentations. And I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Martian Lubchansky and Ntisha for putting together this great event. So we are very honored to be part of this great event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bruch, um, and to all of our panelists for um, the really, um, really um, meaty presentations in the sense that um, they gave us a lot to think about. And um, I would like to turn it over to Helena Hrin, uh, and I would like to ask all of the panelists in the Language, Literature, and Culture panel to turn on their video and get ready to begin the panel as I play a selection uh, from the song Nemaya Kul by Piatnica. Ale devon, devon, de Pala je Pusena v kolo mene Amore Červoni je, ni je Vono bilo, ni čorno, ni je Nemaya cool, Nemaya cool, Nemaya cool, 
Okay, um, that of course is Pyatnitsa, um, a band from Kharkiv, uh, which sings mostly in Russian and has songs in Ukrainian. That was Nemaya Kul. Um, and they have re-recorded their most famous song uh, now to have an updated anti-war uh, message um, in the current context of the war. Um, so um, check out Pyatnitsa. I'd like to turn it over to Helena Harin. Uh, thank you. Well, we are beginning our sixth hour of our uh, marathon and time goes quickly when you're having fun. It is, uh, it has been very, uh, very inspiring, very revealing, and every one of our sessions really merits a separate presentation in its own right. But we are now at 2.08 and um, unfortunately we need to move along. Uh, I will introduce each speaker before they speak, and then I, they will speak for about 10, 12 minutes. And um, then uh, we hopefully will have some time for questions as well. So we have a very distinguished panel uh, today on uh, that will deal with language, literature, and culture. These are all uh, members of our philology section, but no, not entirely. Uh, Lada Bilanyuk, our first speaker, is from the history and social sciences um, section. Lada Bilanyuk is an anthropologist, a professor the, at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington in Seattle, with a special interest in linguistics, specifically the phenomenon of mixed languages, but also the ideologies of language in wartime. Her monograph, Contested Tongues, Language, Politics, and Cultural Correction in Ukraine, was devoted to the study of Surzhik. I should also mention that she's, she is a beloved teacher and has mentored a number of scholars. Some of them will be speaking today, later in the program. Today, she will speak on the language of war. Manda, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join this uh, amazing group of people. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, what I'm talking about today is the language of war and what that can mean in many different ways. Um, in this initial slide here, I'm featuring some of the linguistic transgressions and sign language transgressions that have even reached kind of an official uh, level as with the Ukrainian stamp. So uh, to outline what I'll be talking about today, I'm gonna start out with talking about how language doesn't matter. In, in what ways is it possible for language not to matter? Uh, in what ways is it does language matter? Language choice matters, and this is especially heightened in war. I'll talk a little bit about language use in the media and how the variety of language that it features, including bilingualism, code switching, also ways that it really evidences the prevalence and strength of Ukrainian language now, as well as linguistic variation, dialects, and surzhik. And then I'll conclude talking a bit about the warline, wartime linguistic culture uh, the, the spirit and, and humor that helps people survive and make it through uh, the horrors. So talking about sayings, shibboleths, swears, and linguistic memes. Uh, 
So for starters, how can language not matter? Uh, well, I, I have found that just in the eight last eight years of the war, there have been these competing discourses. On the one hand, at just as in the past 30 years, most Ukrainians are bilingual, at least passively, people understand each other. There's a lot of non-accommodation, even if people could switch, they persist in speaking two languages and they understand each other fine. Um, also, despite Russia's rhetoric about protecting Russian speakers, um, being a Russian speaker hasn't protected anybody. Actually, the regions where and the cities uh, where there's a high prevalence of people who have Russian as a native language have been some of the worst affected uh, with, with uh, bombings and, and killings. And uh, the other uh, example that is often cited, uh, that was cited in the past eight years as well, is that a huge portion of the people who are fighting against the Russian army identify as Russian speakers. So Russian does not, what, what language you speak does not determine your uh, patriotic allegiance at all. However, I would say that this potential, this possibility for language to be neutral, is diminishing more and more people are finding that language does matter. And in part that has to do with the wartime rhetoric that uh, basically has been that Russia needs to protect Russian speakers and Russians and the denial of the existence of Ukraine and its language. So, and, and that goes into a centuries old discourse of there can be no little Russian language, you know, keep, keep trying to erase it. So uh, language has become more and more politicized. It's, it's hard for it to be neutral. Uh, people, there have been tensions between many of the refugees who speak Russian uh, and Ukrainian speakers in Western Ukraine and Poland and other refugee areas. And there's some debate. Is this the time for there to be the tension? Uh, and yet people who are coming from uh, areas where they spoke Russian more of the time are finding themselves inwardly compelled to try to speak Ukrainian. Uh, and more and more people are doing that. Um, and here's an example just that I took from Sidhi Jadan's Facebook page, uh, where he says that he uh, came into a volunteer center. I'll just translate what is written in this uh, post. He says, I came into one of the volunteer centers where young people are working, really very young people, and I noticed something, how important and natural it is for them today to speak Ukrainian. Um, as much as for, Nith, for them today, this is yet another um, expression and proof of their difference. This is their marker, and it will always be with them now. Um, so he says more about that, but really highlighting how even in what has been considered a more traditionally Russian speaking city, at least 13 years ago when I was there, it's true, it was hard to hear Ukrainian on the streets, although there was a very vibrant Ukrainian speaking sort of community um, that I connected with. So more and more people, especially young people, but even middle aged people are, are making the switch. Um, in the media, the media is showcasing this shift as well. So I've been following a lot of uh, a few channels on Telegram where uh, you get a lot of reports from politicians who are speaking um, for the most part in Ukrainian. And you know, if you've listened to Zelensky, he pretty much only speaks Ukrainian uh, with some code switching and I'll, I'll point out some differences. And um, even I, one of the, um, government officials in Odessa. You know, he probably reads his accounts and he has a very heavy Russian accent, but he is speaking Ukrainian. So I think in this time of war, there's been a shift for people recognizing the greater need. Use Ukrainian. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just make the effort. Whereas in uh, prior decades, there has been more of a purist uh, tendency saying, ah, oh, net don't butcher the language, don't grate my ears, you know, better to speak Russian than to uh, ruin Ukrainian. So that's really shifting. People are um, making the effort and, and proud to do it. And there's even some debate with people who've newly converted to Ukrainian, uh, rejecting people who correct them all the time, saying, all right, already, just let us ease into this. 
Um, now, Zelensky, during his campaign, actually has a couple of interesting blogs where he shows himself learning Ukrainian. He does like physical exercises, you know, if he doesn't translate the word from Russian to Ukrainian or vice versa correctly, he has to do pull-ups and he shows his welted hands about how he has, you know, how this Ukrainian language learning, the effort he puts into it. But from my own estimation, he speaks Ukrainian very fluently now. And a lot of people noticed it during uh, the first time this I noticed this happening was during an interview with um, Russian independent journalists, where he, uh, during this hour and a half interview, there were six times where he forgot a Russian word. Uh, so the examples that he forgot, he forgot the word for, for um, medicines, so liki, and he had to turn the sign, oh, lekarstva, although I say lekarstva in Ukrainian, but anyway. Um, Polony, he had to sort of search for that word and got help with it. So v plenu, zovni, he finally found the word vnieshni, although in that context, I think it was incorrect. It should have been snaruzi based on the grammatical structure. But um, he was talking about zakordoni dilenke. He couldn't remember the word dilenke, uchastki. So usually somebody in the background helps him find the word if he doesn't find it himself. Vidnovlyvate, vastanovlyvate. Well, so he's talking about the invasion a lot, right? So he says, so some people thought this was an act because he's an actor, but to me, it just seems like a very natural part of the language that you're speaking more often, that vocabulary is at the tip of your tongue. So it really shows that Zelensky as president is portraying Ukrainian language as a, the stronger language and even using Ukrainian for international journalist audiences, although he will uh, answer Russian speakers in Russian as he did for this uh, group of journalists. He's not the only one who uh, has an example of that. So, um, oh, there's another example and he was visiting Bucha talking to journalists uh, and he said, Прекрасно мы знаем, кто те лидеры. Я считаю, что Ангела среди тех лидеров, лидеров провидных. Як российскую буде провидных? So, so there's various examples of him showing Ukrainian language being stronger in some areas of vocabulary. Um, uh, the mayor of Mykolaiv, Vitaly Kim, who is another prominent uh, figure, he's known for his Dobroranku, Mez Ukraine. Uh, greetings, although he then usually continues in, in Russian. He was had an interview with uh, Gordon um, and he was doing the interview in Russian. And it was really interesting because he couldn't remember a word and he said, hesitating. And then he said, Vahatisha. And then Gordon provided him with the word kolibatsya. So maybe maybe Vitaly Kim is learning English. So he actually hesitating was, was more front of his uh, brain and then he had Vahatisha before Gordon, who understands, knows Ukrainian as well, provided him with the Russian equivalent. Um, so, so there are these exhibitions of Ukrainian dominance, but also uh, a lot of examples of bilingualism. So on, in all the media, whether it's uh, officials or politicians or soldiers or uh, civilian eyewitnesses uh, really demonstrating their linguistic skill, easily switching back and forth. Um, sometimes the reports are also in Russian. So this does kind of feed into the language doesn't matter. Um, in Kriveirih, uh, Vilku, who's doing the reports, almost always does them in Russian. Arestovich, who does the military report, he does the official one in Ukrainian, but then when he's talking with journalists, he does it in Russian. So a lot of bilingualism. And then finally, uh, just showcasing the linguistic variation, the richness of dialects and surgic. Um, and this is presented without any critique. You know, people are uh, speaking their authentic language. And with surgic, this is a question. How much is it influence of Russian? How much is it pre-existing dialect continuum variation? So that's kind of up in the air, but in a way it's showcasing the richness and variety of Ukrainian language. Uh, so some sayings and terminology, as I mentioned, Dobroho Vechera Mez Ukraine or Dobroho Ranku Mez Ukraine has become just a, a greeting. Um, another phrase, Vse bude Ukraina, and I wonder if you can help me because um, sometimes people say everything will be Ukraine. I thought it made more sense to say there will always be Ukraine, but then I heard a new turn of phrase, people saying, 
meaning okay. So people apparently say ok, and I've heard both teenagers and middle-aged politicians uh, say this sebude ok. So I was thinking sebude ok, maybe that's an analogy with sebude uk, rayina, maybe that's why everything will be okay, everything will be Ukraine. If any of you know more about the origins of this phrase, I'd be happy to learn about that from you. Also innovations in lexicon, Chornobayite, because Chornobayivka is a place where, oh, I don't know, I think it's the 19th time now that uh, Russian forces and equipment has been uh, bombed out by Ukrainians successfully. So Chornobayite, to keep failing at something, repeating the same mistake. Uh, Makronete is another word. I don't know how widespread that is, but you know, there are people written some of these up to show concern, but not actually act. And then the huge uh, variety of language for how people talk about things in the war. So the enemy, rarely do people say Russians or Russiane. I mean, they do sometimes, but orke, orcs, rasiste, that famous combination of Russian fascist, which so aptly uh, fits together, saying ruski, uh, Ukrainian says Rosiane for Russians, whereas in Russian you have ruskie and Rosiane. So Ukrainians now use that term with a Z to emblematically refer to this group of people. And the how that works is, well, uh, maybe it serves to distinguish from the mass of Russians, but also it's just a way of, um, adding an emotional valuation to the label. And same with the names for Russia. Erefia, Rasha, Rashka, Rasia, Rasiushka are ways of referring to Russia that are not so um, respectful. Shibboleths, okay? So you've all probably heard Palyanitsya, Ukrazaliznitsya, Pulunitsya, which with Russian phonology is difficult to say. Um, so uh, Palyanitsya being sort of around bread. And as this sign shows, just in general, uh, in, in Kyiv, you know, uh, asking people to speak Ukrainian. And so to make sure that uh, you are not a... Um, diversant, you know, uh, people who moved to Ukraine the months before the invasion and then were there to uh, label, uh, you know, put signs for invading forces and things like that. And finally, the war unleashing expletives. Um, you know, you've all heard where we send the uh, Russian warship. That's actually the polite way to refer to it. Oh, I sent them where the wa Russian warship went, if you don't want to use the expletive itself. And, you know, these signposts that were actually put up telling which right way Russia should go, again, using uh, vulgar language, which normally would not appear in public. But in wartime, this is therapeutic. It's also emboldening. Uh, this picture of these uh, Easter eggs created a whole debate about the sanctity of Easter eggs and what God would think about having expletives on an Easter egg and how do we know what God would think. But anyway, some people do find it therapeutic. And I like this um, post. <laughs> So, you know, a very nasty expletive, but she's like, I am an intelligent, cultured lady. But, you know, the war gives license and, it, and it's, this is needed. And, and as we know, the, the vulgar sign on the Ukrainian stamp. Um, so to conclude, um, also just grammar at war. Um, one uh, blogger who has a small child who was very, who had to evacuate, she's from Poltava, She's, she said, uh, I thought I'd never laughed, but I laughed. So she posted this, Pavlo Zibrov, Petro Rozibrov. So Rozibrov, that's Poltava dialect, having that O-A alternation. So this is kind of humor. And, and just this morning, Tatusha Bo, one of my favorite bloggers, she says, uh, you know, her, she's in Lviv, but her, near her building was bombed. And so she basically, if you can read the Ukrainian, I won't indulge and translating for you, but it is uh, bad mouthing the people who cause this. But she uses an interesting term, which I actually had to look up, potoroch, and people are then arguing, potorochi, oh, well, 
In Poltava, they say with an A, Patorochi, so that, that makes an expletive. And then somebody says, this is only in Ukraine, in reaction to a remark about explosions, people are arguing whether you should say O or A. What an invincible uh, country. Excuse and, me, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to play police. Yeah, they, this, is, uh, this is it. Uh, this was my Thank last you. slide. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I um, just don't want to be um, in, owing the next panel time because I've already done that once this morning. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, do we have questions? Uh, yes. Is the pejorative term Moskali still being used in Ukraine? I hear it very seldom in speech or in the press. That's for is from Daria Kirchano. I, I have encountered it. Um, numerically, it's not as common, I think, as saying Rashiste uh, or using Orke. I think Orke is the most common one. Um, but um, in, in the... So not as common, but it is still there. And I think also it may have to do with the fact that um, so many of, actually there's been research done that shows that minority groups in Russia, so non-Muscovites, non-Russians are disproportionately represented in those who are being sent to the front and who are being killed. So from Buryatia or Adige or Tuva. Um, so in that way, it's harder maybe to call them Muscali they are more broadly Russian citizens. So that might be one reason. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Vitaly Chetnetsky, who needs no introduction to our Shevchenko Society membership. He is the first vice president of the society and has organized and chaired many of our public events. He is professor of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Kansas and has written extensively on comparative literature, post-colonial studies and film studies including his monograph, Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization. He is also the former president of the American Association of Ukrainian Studies. And today his topic is the Ukrainian film community responds to the war. Vitaly, please. Thank you so much, Helena. I also would now like to share my screen and I do have a, a little bit of a PowerPoint in the interest of time, I will not be playing film clips, uh, but I would like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the responses to the war by the Ukrainian film community. One thing we have to uh, emphasize is that even if we go back to the very beginning, of the Maidan protests in November of 2013, filmmakers there were, from the start, there was a quick realization that there is an urgent need to document what was happening. And uh, therefore, with the wide presence of the filmmakers, especially the Babylon 13 collective led by Volodymyr Tehi, we had a very strong and serious response to happening immediately. There were also a lot of live streaming projects uh, that were there as well. Also, I would say what is important to uh, realize is that uh, this it, the trauma of the uh, attack on the protest, the loss of life, and later the Russian invasion was what galvanized Ukrainian cinema in uh, from having just beginning to stand up on its own feet after having had a very precarious existence, basically in the first 20 years of post-Soviet uh, independence. It is in the last eight years that Ukrainian cinema has grown really strongly and really powerful. And Babylon 13 and other documentary groups, but uh, this is an example of the work that came out of Babylon 13, have done a lot of really great projects that showcase many different aspects of the war. This is an example of the film, uh, The Invisible Battalion, which highlights the experience of women soldiers at the front in Donbass. And this is an anthology documentary film uh, showcasing the individual stories of nine women and directed by three women filmmakers, all of them part of Babylon 13 group. 
And this way, a lot of really wonderful stories came to the foreground. There also were, of course, uh, many powerful uh, films that tried on the basis of uh, learning of the heroic uh, acts during the war to then create uh, patriotic uh, fiction films. So these are fiction films, not, not documentaries, but they're based on real events and they're based on documentary research. And here we have one film based on the events in Donetsk, and that is Cyborgs, directed by Ftem Seytablaev, based on a script by Natalia Vorozhbit, the acclaimed prayer, playwright, and she did a lot of documentary research and interviewing with the actual Ukrainian soldiers who were defending the Donetsk airport. And a similar uh, example for uh, the annexation of Crimea, and this is the film Cherkasy, which was released internationally as U311, uh, directed by Timur Yashchenko, and that is the story of a Ukrainian uh, Navy ship that refused to surrender to the Russians and its heroic resistance. So these are just a couple of examples of this kind. But what is also important is that we have the stories that humanized and brought to the international audiences uh, the stories of civilian survival uh, in the context of the war. The film that probably became most famous in this respect is Irina Tsiuk's The Earth is Blue as an Orange. And the title is from a surrealist poem by Paul Eluard. Tsiuk is also herself an acclaimed poet. So her naming the film this was to emphasize how surreal it is to be a civilian in wartime at the front line. And the film won, uh, it was the first time a Ukrainian film was in competition at Sundance and it won the best director for a world documentary category right before the start of the pandemic, went on to win more than 20 awards at other film festivals. And that film came out of observing a family, a single mother and four children living in Krasnohorivka, which is one of the towns right to the west of Donetsk, which is right at the far front line, like Marinka and Avdivka, Krasnohorivka is between Marinka and Avdivka. And it came, uh, the project came into being from Tsivik meeting Miroslava, the oldest of the children who was an aspiring filmmaker. And this is a really powerful film. It is now, uh, available in the US in theaters and hopefully will soon be available for streaming. I really urge everyone to see it, a really moving, really powerful picture. And Tsiwik's film, I think, is a very important antithesis and antidote to uh, uh, Sergei Woznitsa's film Donbass, and Woznitsa is someone who became quite a controversial figure, and I'll talk more about him and the controversy later in my presentation. Donbass, which was a very powerful film and was Ukraine submission for the Academy Awards of 2019, uh, was a, a fiction film that uh, in part recreated amateur YouTube videos that the director found. And the film seeks to problematize a reality and news media and their relationship. A lot of it uh, deals with creating a uh, fake uh, atrocities and fake news in a Russian counter narrative uh, that is trying to blame Ukraine for uh, war crimes that it did not commit and hide this way, sort of muddle the waters in terms of Russia, the atrocities it has been committing. Uh, the film uh, basically is characterized by a deeply misanthropic and pessimistic view of the world. Uh, the film contains several episodes, one set in Ukraine controlled territory, uh, others set in the Russian supported uh, AstroTurf so-called separatist controlled territory, but there is not a single person there to, with whom we can sympathize. And Sivok's film by contrast is a warm portrayal of a family at the front line that uses film, families trying to make a film about their own experiences and part of it as a collective therapy project. So this is where the difference is, and this is where Loznitsa, as he prefers to 
be known, is uh, still not fitting into Ukrainian film community. And he, in that sense, is where his linkages are much more with the um, independent Russian cinema's approach to reality, uh, even on a static uh, level. Okay, for some reason, it's not advancing. Okay. I also uh, wanted to highlight that filmmakers from the very beginning have been engaging in a lot of practical projects. One of them is the so-called uh, Yellow Bus Project that was running uh, in uh, the east near the front line in Donbass after the first invasion for many years. It was a volunteer workshop where practicing filmmakers went with the equipment for these 10 day stints uh, to different uh, towns and villages near the front line and had these volunteer classes for young people who were interested in learning the basics of film craft. And that's actually how Irina Tsivak met uh, Miroslava Tromfevchuk, uh, the young woman from The Earth is Blue as an Orange. And since uh, the renewed Russian invasion in February 24, similar workshops for displaced teenagers are now being run in Lviv by another prominent contemporary filmmaker, Marina Stepanska. Also, uh, in addition to the documentary films by Tsilik, uh, I want to highlight that there have been wonderful fiction films about civilian experience during the war. The same Natalia Vorozhbit, uh, the same time as she was doing um, the research for cyborgs, also uh, did a lot of interview with civilians uh, and their experience in uh, the war in Donbass in 14-15, and that uh, lay basis for her play Pohanyi uh, Darohi, Bad Roads, which she then herself adapted into a film and it became her directorial debut. And that film has also received considerable acclaim and was Ukraine's submission to the Oscars last year. And on the right is a Klondike by Marina Er Horbach. Er is her husband's last name. He's Turkish. It's a Turkish-Ukrainian co-production. And this film won the Best International Fiction Film Award at Sundance Festival earlier this year. And this is a film about an expectant young couple who lives in Hrabove, the very village where the shot down a Malaysian airliner crashed. So this is once again a film that brings the horror of the war and one of the atrocities through the perspective of a local family. So wonderful uh, fictionalized story by based very much on real events. Also, we see in a lot of contemporary cinema wonderful ways and thoughtful ways in how uh, war is uh, an omnipresent background. The film Blindfold by Taras Drony is an example. In that film, uh, there is a uh, the young woman's uh, boyfriend, uh, the central character, uh, went missing. And the young woman is actually an amateur uh, freestyle boxer, not amateur, professional freestyle boxer who wanted to quit, but she goes back to boxing in order to raise money because there is a call which may or not, may not be a scam about uh, her boyfriend still being alive and a attempt to rescue him from captivity in uh, the occupied part of uh, Donbass. We also had very powerful films like Valentin Vasinovich's Atlantis. Uh, it's a film that won at the Venice Film Festival. And it said five years after Ukraine's victory in the war in, and, but it shows that uh, the landscape has been devastated. It's an ecological disaster. And the war since February 24th very much proved the warnings that Vasinovich was making in that film because it is indeed by uh, the uh, horrible actions of Russian military by shelling of a lot of uh, industrial installations, creating ecological disaster. The film also deals a lot with serious issues like post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is something that is very much talked about too in uh, um, what we are now seeing and witnessing from uh, folks in the last two months since the renewed and intensified 
uh, Russian invasion. <laughs> Almost out of time. So wrapping up, uh, Stop Zemlya was a wonderful uh, film. Uh, and this was the last film that many people saw in theaters in Ukraine before February 24th. In that film, it's a coming in age film of high school students. Uh, one of them, the boy you see on the top uh, on the left uh, photograph is a displaced person from Donbass. So the war is always there. Finally, of course, since the war began, uh, Oleg Sentsov, uh, the famous filmmaker who was imprisoned by Russians and brought back by early in uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's presidency in prisoner swap on the very first day of the renewed invasion, put up arms and joined the army. So some filmmakers now are actually fighting at the front, while others very actively are uh, protesting uh, the treatment of Russian culture and the way by some Russian cultural practitioners to find a way. A uh, very important sort of prominence that is given to Ukrainian filmmakers, like the prominence we see given to Irina Tsilik, who is now in the jury of the Cannes Film Festival this year, and there'll be two Ukrainian films in competition there, and serious pro responses to Lesnitsa's manipulative rhetoric in the way of trying to uh, react to the most recent war in a way that gives try to sit between two chairs, so to speak. Most importantly, filmmakers are not staying silent. And for that, we have to be really grateful to them. Thank you for your attention and your patience. Sorry if I went slightly over time. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. It will be the next panel that will be after us. Uh, it, it, this, uh, each of these presentations is so rich and so full of material, and it's just um, it just gives us a taste. We absolutely will need to follow up with all of you. Our next speaker, Amelia Glazer, is Associate Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature at the University of California in San Diego. This year, she is a Radcliffe Scholar at, in residence at Harvard University. She has written widely on Russian and Yiddish literature, including the monograph Jews and Ukrainians in Russia's Literary Borderlands. She also organized an important conference and edited the collection Stories of Khmelnytsky, Competing Liter Literary Legacies of the 1648 Ukrainian Cossack Uprising. Recently, she has been involved in translating and propagating contemporary Ukrainian poetry, and today will speak on the subject, How Has War Changed Ukrainian Poetry? Lessons from an Online Archive. Uh, thank you very, uh, thank you for participating and um, be eager to hear your presentation. Thank you so much, Helena. It's such an honor to be part of this group and, um, and to be part of this effort. I'm really grateful for the invitation. Uh, and uh, this, this event was set up, of course, to, uh, to aid the people of Ukraine. And, and I'm, I was so happy to see in the chat that funds are coming in as a result of it. Um, but I, I feel that to some extent, if we're honest um, with ourselves, the people of Ukraine have actually been sending a certain amount of humanitarian aid to those of us who are watching what's happening from abroad. They've been sending us a newfound understanding of the meaning of sovereignty, of what really matters in life, um, of this concept of freedom that has taken on a cynical tone, not only in Russia, but also sometimes in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about how poets have engaged in this, this practice of humanitarian aid to the rest of us. Um, and I want to thank, before I even begin, uh, the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, which is where I've gotten into this project, um, my, uh, my undergraduate Harvard fellows who have played a very large role, especially in the social media aspects of it, which you'll see in a moment, um, Paige Lee in particular at Harvard, as well as Olga Kian, Polina Galowuchka, and James Quillen. Um, I also want to thank a couple of colleague collaborators, uh, Yulia Ilchuk at Stanford University, with whom I've been doing a lot of translating, and Professor Aron Mukamal at UC San Diego. Diego, who's also involved in the data visualization. Um, so I want to start by just reading the opening lines of this poem by Ia Kiva. Uh, We've packed a contraband humanitarian aid kit of war songs 
and shipped it to Europe, America, India, and China, paving the Silk Road with great Ukrainian literature. Stvorili spisan provinu pilnu humanitarku. Uh, the poem goes on, but this is just the opening couple of lines. So Ia Kiva uh, recognizes in this poem the extent to which Ukrainian poets may be aiding the rest of the world. She posted this to Facebook on March 16th. Um, and what I want to argue in the very short amount of time that I have is that Ukraine has been exporting and encouraging not only poetry, but these ideas about the importance of freedom and civic society for the last eight years, probably longer. Um, and I'm going to try to make this argument quickly and in a data-driven way, as well as in a qualitative way, which is a, very new to my comfort zone. I am not someone data-driven. I am kind of moving into this, this weird world of, of big data with this project, and I'm going to take you with me as I get into it. Um, so this is an ongoing project about poetry and society, and I'm looking very closely at the social networks um, that have been formed by poets in Eastern Europe. Um, and so contemporary Ukrainian poetry, especially the poetry that has been written since 2014, since the, um, you know, really kind of when, when the Maidan heated up, when the, when Crimea was annexed illegally, um, uh, poetry has been something that has um, absorbed the consciousness of a lot of people in Eastern Europe. And I've noticed um, especially from following certain poets on Facebook, that Ukrainian poetry has moved to the center of discussions about poetry in general in Eastern Europe. Um, and what looking at poetry on Facebook allows us to do is that we can look at it qualitatively, but we can also look at the, uh, you know, the, the numbers of likes, and we can look at the comment sections where people have a kind of, you know, this, this kind of commentary, um, in some cases, really interesting analysis even. Um, so some of the poems that I've found have been, you know, like this one by Andriy Bondar, uh, kind of crass parodies of adversaries. Um, I'll just share this with you quickly. Stayat titushki, stayat sirhotki, rubasi v rukach tribyat, patabushte na sirhke i vodku nechvatayet u eti ribyat, right? And I had fun with my translation of this this morning. The orphaned titushkas are standing around, clasping some cash in their fingers because these guys don't have enough to buy themselves vodka. And Siggies, and then you you see in the comment section. This is just a little excerpt from it. You know, you get a, another poem about Titushki. These are these hired thugs that were you know supposed to be rabble rousers during the protests in 2013-2014. Uh, and then you have Irvanets uh, respond with his own little rhyme. And somebody at the bottom says, "Ashtutakayasushki." <laughs> right? What are these? What are these? Like, what's this short form of 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 Siggies or cigarettes? Um, so I'm fascinated by the use of language. Bonzer is perfectly capable of writing poems in Ukrainian. He usually writes in Ukrainian, but here he uses Russian as a parody of these titushki or these rabble rousers who are coming in. Um, but I was really especially fascinated by this comment section and by the relationships that are implied in the um, interface between the comment section and the posts. Um, so Facebook is uh, the primary place where Ukrainian poets have been posting since 2014. It's replaced uh, almost completely at this point, live journal, um, certainly with Contactia and other, other uh, social media sites. Um, Twitter is a little too out of control, right? A poet doesn't have quite as much control of um, what is posted and that relationship. You can't go back and edit if you post on Twitter. Um, and I think, you know, there are a few reasons that uh, that Facebook has emerged as so central and important to Ukrainian poetry in particular, but also East European poetry more broadly. Um, so there are some there's some pros to posting on on Facebook and to looking at Facebook as an archive. Um, you know, we we may remember that uh, the Maidan was started off by a Facebook post by Mustafa Nayim, a journalist. Uh, who said, okay, everybody, let's go. If you're serious, go out to the Maidan. Um, likes don't count. Uh, he then would go on to join the government as a member of parliament and uh, is still very active. Uh, and, you know, so it, it's become a space of activism. It's seen, in fact, by Russia as a space of terrorism against Russia. So it's very much aligned with Ukraine's cause for the last eight years, especially. Um, it, it presents us with an archive um, of years of poetry and responses to it. Um, but it's, it's also especially useful in Eastern Europe because copyright law, for the most part, 
in Eastern Europe allows a poet to post something on Facebook um, and then repost it somewhere else. Whereas in the United States, uh, a social media post is often, not always, there are exceptions in both cases, but uh, social media post is often considered a publication and like the New Yorker will no longer take it. Uh, but there are also some drawbacks and I wanna acknowledge these. Um, there are questionable corporate ethics that we have to think about, right? Disinformation campaigns, ad targeting, which is problematic, um, documented mental health risks to spending too much time on Facebook for adults and not only for, you know, kids who go on social media and, and get wrapped up in it. Um, also, there's a, a more practical challenge to people who want to use this academically. That is that Facebook, um, partly in an effort to protect people from these other problems, have made it very difficult to scrape. So my um, computer science undergraduate and I could not go in and just scrape all of the Facebook data in the way that these like ad companies want to do to sell you things. Um, we've had to create a database manually. Um, in the process, we've taken some necessary precautions. Uh, first of all, we're only looking at public posts. Um, even though I may be Facebook friends with a lot of these poets that I study, I'm only going in and looking at the posts that are available to everyone that have this little you know, world sign next to it. Um, even doing this, we're keeping the database that we're creating private, especially right now during the war. If at some point we're able to you know, consensually make some of this available, we will. Um, but for now, I'm using it as a, as a tool for doing some preliminary writing about uh, Facebook data and poetry. Um, and we're keeping the poet's locations private, which you know, seems like something that uh, everyone should be doing at this point. So, um, you know, one thing that reading Facebook since 2014 has shown is that Ukraine is really moving to the center of conversations among poets. So we can take, for example, poets like Dmitry Strozov, who is Belarusian, who's been based in Minsk, and um, he started posting poems about Ukraine at around the time of the Maidan. Um, his poems are always highly self-referential and, and appreciative followers would immediately have recognized this poem. Um, in 2014, you know, he writes this poem, where did the guy get his Afghan sadness, his Abkhazian sadness, his Donbass sadness. People would recognize this from a 2011 post that he'd made about the Libyan sadness during the first Libyan civil war. Um, and there, you know, the third line had been, where did the guy get his Libyan sadness, which he then changed to Donbass in solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, well, his original 2011 poem had itself alluded to Mikhail Svetlov's neo-romantic ballad Granada, um, where Svetlov asks, you know, at kudo parmi spanske grust, right? Where did the guy get his Spanish sadness? Svetlov was a Jewish poet from Soviet Ukraine, and he um, tells in this Russian laced with Ukrainian about a Ukrainian Red Army soldier who dreams of freeing the world. Um, and I'll confess, I would not have noticed the connection if it weren't for a comment in the comment section where somebody said, oh, I love that song by Svetlov. Um, so you get a lot out of reading these comments. Um, uh, Strozov later in, um, in, in for, the for the five year anniversary of the outbreak of the Donbass war posted a translation of his Donbass, Donbass sadness poem by um, Natalia Bilchinka. And you see that in the comment section, people would write you know, things like, um, oh, that's interesting. She changes the word grust in Russian to zhurba in Ukrainian. It's as if you're on two sides of the front line. Um, and Strozov kind of agrees that the translation makes it a different kind of poem. It broadens it, it turns it into a, its own sort of poetic conversation. Um, and Strozov more recently in January posted a new version where he just adds a line at Kudu Parmi Kazakh Grust. And this was when there were protests in Kazakhstan. Um, somebody else added, well, what about the Belarusians? Um, so, uh, you know, what I was observing simply by looking qualitatively at these Facebook posts was that a community was coming together in the form of social media to supplement existing relationships that were already established through, you know, festivals and, and publications and things. Um, there is an observable network that that comments. And, and I was also seeing this shift of Ukraine, Ukraine and Ukrainian to the center of conversations. But I wondered if there was a way of quantifying this. And this is where the database comes in. So at this point, we're doing this manually. We currently have a database of about 600 poems, a little bit more. Um, I have my undergrads working very hard to fill this out because I only have them for another month here. Um, and they're assembling it. Um, and, uh, and we're also in the process of kind of researching other uses of, of similar databases. 
Um, but it's it's worth um, you know just reminding you that we're you know we can't we can't do scraping and we want to be very very careful about the uh, the writer's anonymity. So I'm not making this publicly available um, any place at this point. Um, so here are the things that we've managed to do with this database. Um, and I'll just I'm going to go back to this slide really Sorry, quickly. Dr. Sorry, Dr. Glazer, yes. um, we really are running out of time here, and uh, we have one more presenter. Okay, I will then not go back. <laughs> I will quickly show you some of the very fun things we can do with it, like create, you know, themes and authors, and it's clickable. We can do Google engrams to see the use of words over time. Um, this is a chart that shows the most numbers of likes for different poems. Um, I will skip this one. Um, and this is a, a really fun chart that is actually shows the connections between poets um, as we found through the, uh, the comment section. So who, who mentions whom? Um, so I wanna thank uh, all of you for inviting me. I wanna thank the poets for their poetry, for continuing to write and to send us these aid packages and my own students. This is a picture I took of a couple of them this morning, Olga and Paige. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amelia, for, for this very rich presentation. Our last speaker, uh, Professor George Grubovich, is another person that needs no introduction to our Shevchenko Society membership. He was twice elected president of the society. Uh, he is the Dmitro Chashevsky Research Professor of Ukrainian Literature at Harvard University and a formal scholar of the legacy of Taras Shevchenko. His two most important monographs are The Poet as Mythmaker and Shevchenko v. Haidamake, Poema i Kritika. He is also someone who has conceptualized and written about many aspects of the history of Ukrainian literature and about some of its most important writers, such as Pavlo Tychina and Mykola Khvilovei. Today, he will speak about Shevchenko's very important poem and very pertinent to our times, Kavkaz, Contemporary Resonances of, Shevchenko Kavkaz, of Shevchenko's Kavkaz. Please. Thank you, Helena, for this kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, our um, panel today gives new meaning to the notion of embarrassment of riches. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, have, we have too much to say and uh, not enough time to say it in. I, I can be brief. Um, I, um, I have about, what, seven, eight, uh, nine talking points, seven. You know, if I spend a, a minute and 30 seconds on each, you know, that'll take it up. But then also I want to quote from the poem. So, um, you know, that complicates it. Um, I'll be compressing things. Um, I'm, I'm talking about a poem that um, I just translated into English. Uh, this was thanks to uh, the um, uh, request from uh, Vitali, And um, I enjoyed doing it. And... Uh, now I have some new ideas about um, what um, um, what Shilchenko is doing and how he's evolving, and um, and this of course is a very uh, pertinent poem because it is um, it's about the war in the Caucasus, and it is an razoblachenie, as the Russians would say, uh, the uh, unmasking of the Ruski Mir of that time. But it is the Ruski Mir. And uh, it is intimately also involved with, uh, with um, all forms of uh, God worship, um, heathen God worship, if you will. Anyway, uh, the, the poem requires a, a fair amount of contextualization, and I have to do it in a very brief time. Um, basically, what I would like to uh, state is that it is. Um, one of the last poems he wrote in the, in the collection that is called the Trilita, poems written between 1842 and 1845. It was written in uh, uh, November uh, of um, 1845, uh, just a few months after he heard that his close friend um, and one who had actually been instrumental in, uh, in illustrating um, a, a collection of his poetry, of Szczenko's poetry that was done in, uh, in Polish, for that matter, actually in Polish letters for people who could read uh, Ukrainian in Polish. Um, um, in um, just the year before, in 1844. Uh, in any case, uh, Balmain died in um, uh, July or, or August of 1845, and uh, Shochenko wrote the poem by uh, November. Um, it is, um, 
uh, a work that um, gives us a new sense of how Shulchenko is developing, how he is uh, emerging. What most people don't know, um, what um, even maybe Shevchenko scholars have sort of forgotten, is that um, uh, Shevchenko, uh, until um, the early 1840s, was um, um, very much a professional painter. And as a professional painter, I mean, he was a professional painter all his life after he received his education. Um, uh, but he uh, was also doing popular works to make money. Of course, that's what you have to do. Um, uh, and which were, for example, one of which was called Ruskie Polkovoitse, where he did uh, these uh, um, illustrations for that uh, pop, uh, popular production where, uh, you know, um, any number of generals and beginning with Peter I, whom he despised, uh, were given very pretty uh, visages. Uh, or he did, the, for example, the Historia Suvorova. Uh, uh, in the course of the Trilita poetry, however, Shuchenko is rediscovering a different calling, uh, and that calling is of the national poet. And um, which already began with the long poem Haidemaki, which appeared in early 1842. Um, uh, by the way, in the process of, um, of working on this, I also um, revisited um, Rory Finnan's piece on Kafkaz, which came out in 2005 and which deserves uh, commentary, which I don't really have the time to present today. But there are various issues there that he brings up that need further discussion. Um, the poem itself is given in three modes, as it were. Um, although these are very fluid and, uh, and uh, the, um, the articulation is uh, one that moves is sort of seamlessly from lament to ironic diatribe to, uh, 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 to a further lament of uh, self-discovery. Through the death of his friend Yakiv de Balmen, he discovers, Shevchenko discovers himself as well. Um, uh, let me, um, if I can, uh, I suppose I should put on this. I, I'm not very good at this, even though I thought two courses on Zoom. Um, if I can put... Uh, uh, I don't know, I can't do this. I uh, will have to forget it. Um, I, uh, I, I will just have to, um, to read the poetry uh, because it's, um, I, I need tutelage in these things. Um, um, so um, what I will do though is, um, is talk about the poem, quote a bit from it, okay? So um, it, it begins in a way that is, uh, um, um, uh, that is, um, in, 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 as, as Rory Finnan notes and makes a very big issue about it, although I think the issue is maybe not as, uh, as, as exactly as he is phrasing it, but that it, here is a poem re relatively short. It's only about four and a half pages. I don't know, about um, 200 lines that is uh, in three different meters. Um, one is the uh, uh, iambic tetrameter that uh, Shuchenko has mastered very well and does it in a, in a very peculiarly uh, non-Russian way um, and different from Kotarevsky too, who used that in his Eneida. Um, it is also in the Kolomika meter, which is basically a syllabic meter of eight plus six, um, essentially trochaic. And um, in um, four foot, um, Amphibrax, which is his, Shevchenko's um, uh, uh, variant of the uh, iambic, uh, of the uh, dactylic hexameter that is characteristic of the uh, epic. As you can see, I'm trying to do also a technical analysis of this poem, but there's more than just that to be sure. So this is how it begins. Mountains beyond mountains, all swaddled in cl clouds, deeply seeded with grief and watered with blood. From time immemorial, an eagle claws Prometheus, crushing each day his ribs and his heart. Um, uh, the, um, the, the notion in the beginning is that this is a, a kind of universal event. That is to say that this war in the 
caucuses that the Russian Empire is doing, as you know, expanding year by year, covering uh, greater and greater territories. Its greatest expansion, of course, was in uh, uh, right after the partitions of Poland, where all of um, uh, or much of Poland, uh, the great majority of Poland was taken over by Russia. Uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, of course, I mean. Um, in any case, um, um, uh, it begins with this uh, universal, if you will, uh, uh, Promethean notion that this eternal torture and torment that is uh, visited upon peoples. Uh, and it becomes, uh, and it becomes, uh, 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 well, let me read the whole thing, uh, not the whole thing, but the part of it. Um, uh, an eagle claws Prometheus, crushing each day his ribs and his heart, but he cannot consume his life-giving blood. The heart stirs again and keeps laughing again. Our soul will not die, and nor will our freedom. An insatiable Tsar cannot plow the sea as his field, nor chain the living soul and the living word, nor mock the glory of the Almighty. Um, but this glory of the Almighty is given uh, is given in a in a in a decentered or uh, um, um, or uh, in a uh, contradictory uh, aporia uh, framed way uh, because God himself is somehow complicit in this uh, uh, if, and there, there is this element of, of his uh, of his brief uh, um, um, uh, inter, uh, interlocution with God. Uh, it's not for us to question thee. It's not for us to judge thy deeds. All we can do is weep and weep and weep and mix our daily bread with sweat and tears. The hangman mock our plight while our own truth lies drunk asleep. When will it wake? And when will thou, O Lord, give us a break? Lie down and let us live. Because if God is almighty and all of this is god's will then why is he doing this but then he retreats from that notion but still we trust thy might and thy living spirit the bulk of the poem is about the uh, the ruski mir as seen from inside and suchenko sees it extremely well because in his prose he is full of this um how should i say cultured civilized frame that anybody who went through educa was educated in the Russian system that was part of a civilized world would accept its enlightenment. It is, uh, it is what is normal and the conquest of the Caucasus is presented as enlightenment. Um, and, uh, and, and, and his very ironic and sardonic and extremely pointed uh, depiction of uh, the world of the Enlightenment is, uh, um, is the bulk of the poem. Although he says, as he introduces it, you still will win. He says, fight on for you will win, for God is on your side, truth is on your side, and glory, and holy freedom. But then he moves to that world of the um, of their imperial perception of uh, all these territories that need to be conquered for their enlightenment. And this, of course, is what makes it so uh, contemporary, because that is what Putin's program is. Ukraine has to be denazified and to be made normal, made normal through the Ruski Mir. Uh, so he says then immediately after having said, you know, uh, truth is on your side and glory, he, he switches to that world. Bread and a hut, Shurek Isaklia, was all you had. It wasn't begged for, wasn't granted, and didn't come with chains. Not like we have it here. We're literate, you see, and we read holy writ. And from our deepest dungeon up to our highest throne, we just drip gold, and we're all naked. Come, let us educate you. We'll teach you with your, what your bread and salt are worth. We're Christians. Temples, schools, we've got them all and other goods, and God himself is one of us. But this damn Sakla really galls us. This hut, Sakla is, a, um, is a, I think, a Dagestani, whatever, a Chechen word, I assume, uh, for, for hut. Why do you have it if we didn't deed it to you? And why don't we just throw some of your shurek to you as a dog? And why should you not pay for your sunlight? That's all. We aren't heathens. We're Christians through and through. 
we don't want, want much. But still, if you would just become our friends, you could go on to learn so much. And then these are these wonderful lines that I, I, I cited uh, when I spoke about this uh, last time at the Shevchenko conference. Uh, if you would just become our friends, you could go on to learn so much. And then there's all this land we have. Just take our measureless Siberia and then our prisons and all the nations we can hardly count. From our Moldavia to our Finland, in every tongue, there's only silence because they're all content. In our land, a holy monk reads holy writ to teach us that a swineherd Tsar once took his friend's wife to his bed. He's speaking about David, whose Psalms he translated, but now this is a different take on David, who took his best friend's wife to bed and killed his friend. Now he's a saint. Of course, this is part of Shevchenko's Tsare Borstvo. I mean, Bože Borstvo. He's fighting with God all the time, like the Hebrew prophets. And like Jeremiah, who's insipid, opens up the collection of Trelita. Uh, it says, while you are still in darkness and enlightened by the Holy Cross, come learn from us. With us, it's clear. First, rip it off, then do the payoff, and you're in paradise. The family comes for free. We know it all. We count the stars. We harvest wheat. We curse the frogs. Frenchmen, we sell or lose at cards. Our folks, not Negroes, but you know, still Christians, just a simple kind. Um, and then finally, after this outpouring of rage, comes a moment that puts the whole poem together and makes it part of his own self development and um, makes it the fine poem that it is. Um, um, he uh, speaks of the death of Balmen and, uh, and how he uh, uh, integrates this into the larger picture. And they also drove you there, my one true friend, my dear good Yakiv, not for Ukraine, but for her hangman, where you forced to shed blood that was good, not black, to drink the Russian poison from a Russian cup. In Antokolsky's translation into Russian, that is given as Tsarskaya, uh, you know, uh, that is to say, it's not the same thing. That is a Soviet translation. But anyway, uh, me, uh, we're going to have to end. Yeah. Okay. And, and then in, in the last moments, he speaks of, uh, uh, let me just, because this is, this is, I think, better than my words. Uh, he, he asks the spirit of the Balmen to hover over Ukraine. Uh, uh, watch over her ravished burial mounds amid the steppe, weep with the Cossacks, your grown man's tears, and in the steppe await my return from captivity. By the way, this is this I discovered for myself. This is the first instance where Shevchenko speaks of his uh, imminent uh, arrest and exile. It's, it's right here, my return from captivity. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, and 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 then uh, the final parting. Acquire, uh, let them grow. Um, uh, and in the meantime, I will sow my songs and my grief. Let them grow and talk with the wind. A quiet wind from Ukraine will take along with the dew my songs all the way to you. Uh, and with a brother's tear, my friend, you'll greet. You'll read, greet and read them quietly, and you'll remember the burial mounds, the step, the sea, and me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful translation. In addition to the talk, the translation is it was, was wonderful. Uh, our apologies to the next section, uh, to the next panel. And um, we will, we will pick this up on another occasion and uh, organize a separate panel. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, to our speakers and to all who, uh, who listened and participated. I'm sending it over to Makian. Um, thank you so much um, to uh, members of the philology section and um, Lao de Bilanyuk, who's a member of the uh, history social science section. Um, I would like to just uh, dispense with the music after this one and turn it directly over to Dr. Roman Shirokov, um, who um, is the director of the medicine and biology section of Entisha. And he is, he is going to... Um, be chairing the next panel. And I'd ask all of our panelists from the next panel to turn on their videos and uh, presenters from the previous panel to please turn off your video. And I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Shirokov. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, on behalf of the Bias section, I am honored to present Dr. Roman Moskalenko. He is Associate Professor of 
par, uh, part of morphology at Sumi State University Medical Institute, where he does his research and teaches medical students now. And uh, what's important is also he's a member of the Board of Advisors of the National Research Foundation of Ukraine. Uh, and NRFU is currently the major funding organization for research in Ukraine. It's sort of parallel to Academy of Science, but it has the money, right? So, um, had before the war, I should say. I met Dr. Muskulenko, or well, not met physically, this is our first time, uh, uh, so to speak, to see each other. Uh, but then learn about Dr. Muskulenko in 2017 when he won plus Platon Kostyuk Award, which Antasha gives to young Ukrainian researchers. Um, welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for invitation. I am grateful to uh, Shevchenko Scientific uh, Society for this uh, opportunity to be speaker. Uh, can I show uh, presentation? Okay, uh, I am medical doctor, pathologist from Sumo State University, uh, Ukraine. Four years ago, I received um, Platon Kostyuk uh, Prize from Shevchenko Scientific Society. It, uh, this gave me a good bust for my career. Today, I'm professor and a member of Scientific Council of National Research Foundation. Uh, of course, uh, you all know about uh, um, that Ukraine currently at, uh, at war, heavy fighting is currently underway in eastern and southern part of Ukraine. Uh, situation is uh, difficult and by uh, today I want to little talk about uh, situation in Sumy and uh in in this uh, difficult time uh it's uh, this pictures from a local press uh, from last month uh, we, um, it uh, all situation describes uh, in a fresh wikipedia article battle of sumi this uh, battle ended uh, in victory for ukraine uh, this uh, story uh, happened at the new courage uh, of uh, soldiers and volunteers, uh, and uh, it's a good uh, story for, uh, let's say, uh, the luck on the side of brave. Uh, let no one doubt that uh, Ukraine will win. <clears throat> But uh, it's uh, it's uh, in in this short time we uh, live uh, it's in different situation for of uh, desperation or some enjoy for victory. Uh, uh, by the way, this uh, lots of uh, dead of Russian soldiers only recently has been transferred to Russia uh, by the Red Cross. It, uh, this package uh, stored in our morgue uh, hospital in hospital. Uh, but uh, in um, uh, our university was bombed. Uh, it's some collateral. The mage, uh, because um, Russians bombing critical infra infrastructure in uh, neighboring areas. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, the day before yesterday, uh, QS uh, uh, Times High Educate ra Rating uh, was published, uh, uh, which our university took place between uh, four and six hundred, the best university. 
uh, by the rate and uh, it's <laughs> probably different rates say it <laughs> uh, evaluate different uh, side of uh, university activities but it's uh, it's uh, this uh, estimation based on uh, some uh, some information before war. I don't know how it will will be in future. Okay. Uh, uh, also, I have center uh, before uh, um, several years ago. I uh, work in Sweden and. Uh, now I um, create Ukrainian Swedish Resource Center and uh, have lots of uh, fluorescent microscopes and work with some and feel biomedicine and medicine and work with uh, calcification of soft tissues and, and Helicobacter pylori infection and, 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 and another, another uh, project. Uh, it's an uh, example of how collaboration uh, can help for Ukrainian scholars and scientists. Okay, uh, what uh, support is currently needed for Ukrainian scientists? It's, uh, probably it's not need some directly help from our monetary help it's uh, like in the story uh, about fish and the rod and uh, give man a fish and <laughs> he uh, will be full one day but uh, learn uh, to fish with fish and rod it's uh, that uh, he will always be full okay <clears throat> it's a uh, good help uh, will be it's opportunity to establish some scientific ties and collaboration with uh, foreign uh, societies with uh, uh, it's this uh, will help to obtain some joint project publication for increasing of uh, 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 quality of uh, competitivity of work for obtain some funding uh, another problem uh, now it's uh, all uh, all money of uh, of budget of uh, government uh, it's now it's uh, direct to um, army and and uh, some help people who suffered from russian occupation and and some it's horribly uh, situation uh, but uh, for science always uh, leaves on some background and uh, it's uh, very bad for future uh, uh, it's uh, it's a big problem is competitiveness uh, for ukrainian scientists it's need to some increases uh, this uh, parameter <laughs> uh, also uh, another another um, uh, features it's uh, it is assistance in uh, the evaluation of research project. Uh, I I hope uh, in the future in probably nearest future Ukrainian uh, research foundation continue uh, provide some uh, funding and um, uh, we have. Um, uh, opportunity we uh, uh, always uh, send uh, some invitation for um, uh, experts uh, foreign uh, expert it is uh, improve uh, uh, improve of expertise and uh, independence of um, evaluation research projects it's uh, this helps is uh very appreciated by national research foundation because it's uh, uh, helped to them, uh, provide some independent expertise uh, okay <laughs> probably it's uh, I, I said enough uh, thank you so much
for this opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roman. Uh, may I ask you a question about this? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, could you please uh, mute your, your mic because we have a reverberation. Right, okay, so the American academics may and should sign up as experts uh, for the National Research Foundation of Ukraine. From that perspective, I would like to uh, ask your opinion and what in their role of experts, how they will help to fight possible corruption and distribution of those scarce research funds which are given by Ukrainian government. So do you think it's important to have an independent opinion? Will it really help? Yes, I, I think it's uh, very, uh, it will be very valuable uh, support because it's uh, in uh, most of, uh, in Ukrainian science, it's uh, lots of uh, very narrow fields, uh, which uh, people um, have some links between, uh, between uh, scientific groups and then some, probably some competition and uh, it's a very close space and uh, uh, it, it will be better to uh, some <clears throat> have uh, independent experts because it's uh, we have some uh, some opposition between national academy and uh, university science and, and it, it uh, lots of uh, lots of some tricks and uh, also it's corruption and probably some people uh, helps and other people to obtain some fund foundation, etc. It, it will be good to have a lot of experts, independent experts. Thank you so very much. And I'm glad you have electricity tonight. <laughs> Last time he didn't have electricity. Right. Thank you. So let me switch to Dr. Jennifer Carroll. Are you here? Yes. So Dr. Jennifer Carroll is Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at North Carolina State. Uh, she is a medical anthropologist with training in cultural anthropology, epidemiology, and clinical research. Her book, Narcomania, Drugs, HIV, and Citizenship in Ukraine, was published in, uh, by Cornell University Press in 2019. And she received for the book the Health Prize uh, from Association uh, for Women in Slavic Studies. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Um, and I want to acknowledge um, with love and gratitude, uh, Lada Bilanyuk is on the call, who was my dissertation advisor, who um, had an enormous impact on the quality of that project and my mental health <laughs> while I was filling it out. So it's really lovely to see her here. Um, all right. So um, I want to be able to allow as much time for our other presenters and for Q&A with our um, Ukrainian colleague as much as possible. So I'm going to be brief. Um, this is a presentation about what's happening with treatment for um, people living with opioid use disorder in HIV in Ukraine. I want to preface this by saying um, they don't call it a fog of war for nothing. It's often very challenging to understand what's going on on the ground um, and people who have the bandwidth to both be present, see what's happening, and communicate what's happening on these topics are very few and far between. So there is a non-zero possibility that the information I'm sharing with you is obsolete and during a time of war, a week of obsolescence might as well be an eternity. But this is the best understanding that I have based on communications with people who are doing the work, um, who have been doing the policy research for a while. So here we go. So briefly, um, opioid agonist therapy is a treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, for those familiar with the medications in the United States, those are methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and for HIV, antiretroviral therapy, also called ART, is the common treatment for HIV. Um, these are both long-term medications. Um, ART is for life. Methadone and buprenorphine can be for life, but are not always, um, but they are safe for that and effective in that way. And these are two sets of treatments or medications 
that um, are really, really important not to interrupt. Um, if you think back perchance to um, the last time you or someone in your family was prescribed antibiotics um, and the physician really, really took time to ensure that you knew to take all of the antibiotics and not stop them in the middle. The reason, right, is because you run the risk of developing resistance. Um, we, it's, it might seem like a silly question to ask, but it's important to ask, like, why do you have to take antibiotics every day? Or why do you have to take a medication every day? The quick answer is because your liver is working and your liver is pulling all of those medications out of your body. So you take the dose, it goes into your body, your liver cleans it out, and then you take more. And you hope to stay in this therapeutic band where you don't have so much medication in your system, you're getting side effects, but you don't have so little medication that you're at risk of developing resistance or especially with medications for opioid use disorder, that's when your tolerance starts dropping. Um, and that is really when you're at risk of overdose. We know, especially in the United States that um, the risk of overdose is increases by orders of magnitude when people stop taking their medications very suddenly. Um, but that's also risk of new HIV infection, return to drug use. So it's very similar to tuberculosis um, treatment, insulin for diabetes. These are two um, long-term health situations, HIV and opioid use disorder, or the continuation of care or preventing the interruption of care is such an urgent public health issue. Um, and it's complicated across the board, really. So this is, I, I love the stuff that the Ministry of Health is putting out now. Um, it would have taken like a research assistant five years to do this before a lot of this data was um, digitized and put out. But this is a map of the centers that were offering, um, for example, opioid agonist treatment for opioid use disorder as of the 1st of January of this year. Um, there are uh, several that from, based on how I'm looking at the data have just ceased operating, right? Since the war has started and these locations are probably not surprising to us. Um, but we know that the number of people who have shifted locations in Ukraine, who have left Ukraine um, and also places where it's just really hard to get supply chains in, where they're struggling to get food and petrol into the city, let alone essential medications is challenging. So we know the situation no longer looks like this. And so there's a few things that have been done by the Ministry of Health uh, in the very, very first weeks of the war in order to try to ensure access to essential medications, including OAT, including insulin, including antiretroviral treatments. Um, so they passed several orders very quickly, reducing the accounting requirements for reimbursement. Um, Americans, you can think about Medicaid or insurance reimbursement. They're just like, keep treating people, we'll send you, we'll keep sending you money, we can handle paperwork later. Um, they created a number of hotlines to assist patients who couldn't find their medication. Um, a lot of coordination, a really, really um, impressive coordination, actually, with neighboring nations for the continuation of care abroad, saying like, hey, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, you're going to be receiving a number of our patients who are on chronic treatment for tuberculosis, chronic treatment for HIV. Let's, what can we do to smooth this out, make sure that they don't have a gap in care, which can be really dangerous. Um, and then also they lifted that address or registration requirement for a lot of um, HIV, tuberculosis, and OAT care. Um, people still have to be looked up in the national database, but they have one of those now. So that's really, really facilitating what's going on. But um, these two medications specifically, ART and OAT, can be really challenging um, to come by because of the way they are regulated, because they have historically been paid for by international agencies. Um, the Ukrainian government is now doing a lot to support these types of treatment programs, which is a marvelous, marvelous um, uh, advancement. And I would say they're doing better than the US in a couple of ways, if I don't you have a bunch of people unfollow me for saying that. Um, but one of the things, and I think that this is an amazing thing that they stood up pretty quickly, but this uh, tabletki.ua is a system that the Ministry of Health has been advertising a lot to help people find their essential medications. Um, and the images, these are screen caps. They're just for illustration, um, if this is not an analysis, right? But this is just what it looks like for if you're looking for insulin in Kyiv city. I grabbed these screenshots this morning. Um, so lots of pharmacies, similar prices, Insulin is 
pretty available. It's in stock. If you look at um, antiretroviral treatment, this is just a search for tenofovir, which is one of several medications that are often prescribed simultaneously. Um, we know that HIV treatment is there, but it's not typically sold in your regular apteca on the corner. It often comes from specialized centers, speed centers, things like that, um, specialized dispensaries, and they aren't always in the regular stock. So if you're someone who has just, you know, thrown um, a bag and your daughter and your dog and a house plant into a car and left and tried to get somewhere where you can survive, figuring out where to go to start asking can be really challenging. Um, medications for opioid use disorder are still more hard to come by and still much, much more tightly regulated, which means they're not going to appear in ordinary inventories and stocks. Um, I've actually been checking and this one, I don't know what this is, but there's one pharmacy in Nipro that continually says they have buprenorphine in stock. And this map has looked like this since the 1st of March. So again, these tools that are there to help everyone because of regulations are just not providing the type of assistance for these particular patients. Um, so uh, things that are hindering medication access. Um, so first of all, there's no state level disaster plan for patients receiving OAT. Um, there are four patients receiving HIV and patients with other types of care, but nothing for people being treated with opioid use disorder. Um, most of the medication stocks are kept near Kiev, which means that they're unreachable if Kiev is under attack or under lockdown. Um, we experienced similar chaos in the United States with like N95 masks in early 2020, if you remember that mess, similar sort of uh, bottleneck situation. Um, the treatment plan, and this is also true in the US, is often left up to local physicians during emergencies. So local physicians have um, the authority to be like, well, let's taper you off of your methadone because it's not available, um, which is not great. Um, uh, Ukraine had been actually manufacturing methadone domestically, so they no longer had to import it from Germany or Israel or India. Um, and those pharmacies, there were, or excuse me, factories, there were two. Uh, one has been evacuated and one was destroyed by Russian bombing. So all of a sudden, the place where they even get these medications don't exist. Um, and then I found this really interesting. I've been following the Ministry of Health on their Telegram channels and their public uh, you know, information system, so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of public comment about what to do if you're receiving treatment for tuberculosis. There's a lot of public guidance and infographics and supportive stuff. If you're receiving treatment for HIV, there is nothing for people who are being treated for opioid use disorder. Um, and I think that stigma has a lot to do with that. And please forgive me for putting up a photo of, of Putin, but um, I, I put this up there because if you recall this, one of the countless uh, nonsensical things that he said um, at the beginning of this war and since, um, or let's say since 1999, is uh, that the people who were running the country in Kiev were bands of, he's like, narkomanov and neonazisiv. And so like, what, why does it even make sense for him to choose that word narkomani as a way to insult folks? is because that's a very, very um, widely understood, very compelling, very pervasive um, mechanism for dehumanizing people, not just in Eastern Europe. I, I live in North Carolina. We do it here too, but also in Eastern Europe, in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and, and other places like that. So um, he's able to make asinine comments like that because those lines land with their audience. Um, I even met folks, um, and Markian, I think, was with me on this particular occasion um, in, in Kharkiv who were working with internally displaced people in um, 2016 who someone made a passing comment of like, well, at least the separatists have driven the drug users out of Donetsk and Luhansk. And I remember being like, these are very high acuity patients that need a lot of medical care and we should not be dismissing them. Um, stuff that's helping maintain medication access. So Ministry of Health have been doing the best they can, allowing 90 days take home supplies for ART, 30 day take home supplies um, for OAT medication. In, in a lot of Ukraine, there has been rules where you have to go to the clinic every single day, much like methadone clinics here in the US. Um, largely though, it has been through informal networks, um, uh, WhatsApp like and Telegram uh, discussion channels where people are just talking about which pharmacy, which dispensary they're finding methadone at which morning. So it's really, really been people scrambling um, to take care of themselves and take care of each other. The reality though is that a lot of um, a lot of people are going without, um, and a lot of people are uh, you know 
losing access to medication, suffering through withdrawal, while also being actively under attack by the Russian military. Um, and we're, as with many, many aspects of this war, we're still uh, waiting to see what the carnage is from that. Um, so I'll close with this. Um, part of the reason why I think we should care is that more than 100 people died um, in Crimea after Russia uh, um, illegally annexed, occupied and illegally annexed the peninsula and shut down all of these clinics to provide medication for um, people living with opioid use disorder. Um, as I mentioned before, suddenly stopping treatment is a known risk factor. Your risk of fatal overdose increases by an order of magnitude. Um, and so I don't I don't expect the invading army to care how many vulnerable patients they're killing but they really, really don't care <laughs> when it comes to people who are living with opioid use disorder. Um, and if you're interested in reading more, I've done a bit of writing about what happened in, in Crimea and, and why we should care. Um, and all of that is free. Um, the Sovereign Rules and Rearrangements piece in which I talk about that specifically is open source at PubMed Central and EPUB and PDF versions of the book in which I have multiple chapters about it are available for free um, at Cornell Press. So please don't I would love to take your money, but I don't want it. Just download the book uh, and ask me any questions um, if you have them. So I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if there are no questions from audience, um, I would like to move on for the sake of time. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Dr. Bogdan Pihurko. He is a pulmonary and critical care physician. Uh, Dr. Pihurko started his career at Harvard Medical School and then held several leadership clinical and research positions at Michigan. And currently, he is a director emeritus of pulmonary laboratories at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, by the way, has the exercise physiology laboratory, which is endowed in his name. So, uh, welcome, Dr. Pihulka. Please begin. Thank you. Um, I gave my slides to Markian to control, if that's okay. Yep, it'll just take me a second here to put bring. I'll start in the meantime. Um, Thank you to the organizers for including me in this outstanding program. I enjoyed every session that I was able to listen to. It's absolutely outstanding. Um, my aim today is not simply to introduce my organization and its uh, activity, in, partly, in part it's that, but also uh, to give the listeners a view through our organizational eyes a view of the challenges of healthcare providers and medical educators in Ukraine since it regained its independence 30 years ago. I think that's the last, Markian. Great, Yaku. Next slide. Although I started my career as indicated uh, at the Brigham Women's Hospital, it was uh, a decade later uh, that I moved my family to uh, Michigan and was introduced to the American Ukrainian Medical Foundation, which I'll refer to from this point on as AUMF. Um, and the, particularly the work of its founder and first president, Dr. Pavlov Zhul. Um, I became familiar through my friendship with his son, Andrei. Um, and it was intriguing to me uh, for two reasons. One was essentially that no one else uh, was doing the work uh, of essentially this single man who had taken this on as a project, the translation and publication of medical textbooks in Ukrainian medical schools and libraries into Ukrainian. Previously, uh, they were uh, printed in standard Russian language. Uh, but secondly, he was taking this task on um, with the potential of affecting the medical education and ultimately the healthcare of Ukrainians throughout the entire nation. Um, 
for a generation or more to come. And this far reaching aim of his organization uh, was what appealed to me and uh, thus I became a member. As you can see before uh, I joined, he had already published and distributed thousands of volumes through medical libraries and schools throughout Ukraine. But with the additional manpower um, and kind of a broadened leadership with additional members, uh, we were able to formalize the organization a bit, making it uh, formally a 501c3 public charity. And after translating some of the local medical texts into Ukrainian, it was also recognized by medical school faculties, deans, by the health ministry, uh, that there needed to be an improvement in the quality of the texts as well. And so the step we took next was to purchase the rights of translation from very large worldwide publishers like W.B. Saunders, Elsevier Worldwide Publications, and so on, so that we could access textbooks that weren't available uh, otherwise. And we thought that we would be on this course, just starting with very basic textbooks uh, and providing them to uh, medical schools and libraries from this point on. And we were quite content uh, to pursue that course, but 2014's events changed all of that. Um, and with the outbreak of hostilities in uh, Krim and uh, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, we needed to supply what was then not readily available for trauma surgeons, um, despite their many talents, medical and surgical health providers in Ukraine did not have vast training in trauma. And so uh, this was something that we thought uh, we would take on as a mission, but neither Elsevier nor Saunders really had good textbooks. And so we turned to the source uh, within the Department of Defense, the Office of the Surgeon General, and through it, it's Borden's Institute that publishes textbooks on various topics, including um, the surgery uh, for trauma victims that are casualties of war, and uh, ask them for their permission to translate their works, which they granted. And we were able uh, then to produce very quickly and distribute in hard copy, softbound, and also digitally through our website, uh, thousands of volumes of emergency war surgery uh, that I'll allude to again uh, and have a few more words to say. Next slide, please. Next slide. Marquia. The next slide is just a, a, a sample of um, not all, uh, but just an ex example of a, a smattering of the books that we produced in Ukrainian. Um, you can see the Ukrainian language on the covers, but in fact, the original text are in English. The first is uh, Frank Netter's Anatomy. Frank Netter's a uh, world famous uh, illustrator. Um, and the book on the left is uh, our translation of his work was actually done in two printings and widely dist distributed. Uh, the second is uh, one of two Dorland's dictionaries. The first printed in 2007 was Ukrainian English. And the one that followed was English Ukrainian, each of them two volume totaling about 2000 pages, really an exhaustive work. The third is the Ukrainian version of the emergency war surgery, Nevikladna Nevishkova Chirurgia, uh, that was widely distributed uh, to assist the surgeons tending to casualties, both civilian and military casualties of the hostilities um, in Ukraine, which uh, continues to be used in the present time. And also recognizing that there were psychological consequences to the war for both military and civilians um, we were able to obtain again from Borden Institute and translate into Ukrainian uh, what was in English called combat and operational behavioral health. And that became our 
also in two volumes. Next, please. It was then thought that we would broaden our services to Ukrainians um, and Ukrainian health professionals. So in 2018, we were able to get funding uh, to bring two young professionals, one an orthopedist, the second a PM&R, uh, physical medicine rehabilitation specialist to the United States for two month terms of training. Um, and those were, uh, with the idea that they would go back and then influence and teach others of their uh, contemporaries and their colleagues and to uh, raise the overall level of care to Western standards. Uh, we also continued to publish um, at the bottom, you see Harrison's Handbook of Internal Medicine is a condensed uh, version of the standard two volume text of Harrison's. Uh, but life threw us another curveball in uh, March of 2020, and that was the appearance of the COVID pandemic. And so we thought quickly um, what we might do to serve the needs of the healthcare providers. Uh, it was just beginning to appear at about that time, no um, And so we wanted to be timely uh, with an instructional webinar. Um, and so you can see the YouTube address there. Uh, and to date, it's received uh, just short of 10,000 visits by healthcare professionals. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just to expand on the webinar. It's a 53 minute, and nearly a one hour uh, treatment in considerable detail of what was known at that time. The text was in English and our colleagues, an outstanding group of people uh, in Ukraine called Ingenious, uh, that partners uh, with various media productions were able to translate it in record time. And on April 6, 2020, it was uh, presented and continues to appear on YouTube now as a, a resource for anyone that's interesting. We even went into detail about critical care of uh, patients in respiratory failure and ventilation techniques um, like proning and things that perhaps were not well known on the Ukraine at the time, uh, the feedback that we got was quite favorable. Next, please. And so once again, we had to pivot on February 24th. Um, and it appeared that uh, simply being publishers and translators of English text into Ukrainian and sponsors of rotations and occasional webinars was no longer enough. We needed to respond to the urgent situations and the needs of uh, the victims of the most recent war. Um, and so this was largely in two parts. The first was that our publisher partner, Nash Format in Kyiv, um, shared the cost of an urgent printing of 2000 additional volumes of emergency war surgery um, and made it digitally available uh, at our website to anyone who needed it. And the second was that we queried the Ministry of Health and individual providers to see what materials they required uh, that we could assist them in procuring. Next, please. Their answer was essentially two principal items, and both of them are visible here on this uh, victim um, in his right leg. One is an external fixator device that essentially pins skeletal fractures uh, using principally external braces so that there is um, minimal invasion. And um, it is a short-term assist that is suitable for their needs in a situation like they're currently facing. The second was an apparatus called wound vax or wound vacuum drainage apparatus. And you can see that in the foreground uh, to drain excess fluids and to aid healing in that manner. And these two um, literally cost thousands of dollars if secured from uh, North American sources, essentially uh, unaffordable in large numbers. So what to do next? Next, please. Fortunately, two of our 
uh, leadership uh, were raised uh, in Ukraine and practiced uh, medicine in Ukraine and still had significant contacts. And through them, we were able to locate two manufacturers in view that were able to produce and manufacture more than 500 external fixators each week uh, at a price of about 10% of the US price. And of course, they could then help distribute and we would avoid the uh, transatlantic costs and the time and delay and so on. And to assure quality, we were in touch with the surgical users who would receive and use that equipment uh, to get their feedback. And we also got two instruments for testing at Brown University's biometric laboratories uh, to assure that we were purchasing not only at a tremendous value, but also a first quality product. And they appear to be, um, some of the testing is still ongoing. Um, Dr. Pichurko, I am very sorry, but uh, we have one more speaker. So if um, you could wrap up in the next couple of minutes. And I, I am wrapping up. Thank you for the reminder, Matka. Next right. slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and so this is my last slide. Uh, we uh, invite anyone interested to visit our website uh, and Facebook. Um, Obviously the war has disrupted medical care enormously um, with public health consequences that are probably difficult uh, to foresee. Not only uh, are there um, the casualties of war and the trauma of war, but my fear is that people whose primary care and preventative care um, has been disrupted not only by war, but pre previously by the pandemic, have not received the kind of care that would catch problems like uh, cancers in men and women early, my fear is, and I hope I'm wrong, my fear is that the consequences of uh, this current tragedy and the pandemic that preceded it are going to compound public health uh, difficulties and challenges for uh, many years to come. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pichurka. Um, for the sake of time, uh, I would like to move on to the following speaker, who is Irina Vashuk. She is the president of Revite Soldiers Ukraine, uh, an outstanding volunteer organization. It's a nonprofit dedicated to providing aid to the people of Ukraine in support of their fundamental human rights and medical rehabilitation of Ukrainian soldiers. Welcome. Um, thank you very much. And the presentation will be on English, I believe, correct? Yep. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I don't have a slideshow uh, to show you uh, about uh, the amount of work we have done uh, for the past six and a half years. I'm just going to, um, in some way, explain what we do. Uh, we do bring severely wounded Ukrainian soldiers to the United States for the past six and a half years. Uh, and we help over uh, 50 wounded soldiers, uh, six of which fighting on our American prosthetics right now in the war zone. Uh, I'm kind of proud of it because uh, all of them were, used to live with me in my home. And I personally was uh, taking them to prosthetic facilities to receive those um, important uh, devices. I would say it's not devices, it's uh, parts of the body, legs. Uh, we are uh, also opened up a rehabilitation center for paralyzed soldiers uh, in Ukraine. We locate uh, for three years right now in city Irpin, which is right outside of Kiev. And uh, for past month and a half, we were occupied by Russians. Fortunately, our uh, rehabilitation center survived. Our uh, housing did not much survive. So we're gonna rebuild our housing where we uh, have access uh, for the paralyzed soldiers in the wheelchair to um, live uh, nicely, very good. Um, so we're gonna rebuild that and we will start uh, our rehabilitation center uh, uh, gonna start to work again within a week. Uh, in our plans is to open up another rehabilitation center in the west of Ukraine. As we know, uh, everybody's relocated uh, back west and uh, we would like to open next to Lviv, which will be probably twice as bigger facility that we have in Irpin. Uh, 
And um, it will be only dedicated to uh, people who suffer paralysis, partial or full paralysis, uh, any narrow injuries with the orthopedic trauma as well. So we bring all the equipment from the United States. I've been uh, working on um, developing rehabilitation in, for paralyzed people in Ukraine for all six years now. So we're kind of aware what uh, what companies we want to work with uh, in order to provide the best care in Ukraine. Uh, that also will give a jobs to rehabilitation uh, people who moved from uh, Kharkiv area and uh, South area to west of Ukraine. So we're gonna create jobs. We're gonna uh, create a uh, rehabilitation that is not, not, not worth than you, you would get in the United States. And we have uh, very smart and educated people who can uh, oversee these projects. So when the war started, what we start to focus, we realized that not only um, military, but the civilians getting severely wounded. Uh, and so we start to help out medical facilities and uh, as, as well as military hospitals. Uh, so what we do, we purchase um, equipment such as x-rays, portable x-rays, everything is more portable, so it could be moved around the hospital, or, or if we need to use them in the field hospitals, we can use them as well. So we purchase large quantities of um, ultrasound machines in France, X-rays we purchase here in the United States um, and everything, uh, so, some stuff already uh, arrived in Ukraine and we distributed it among hospitals and some stuff is still in the way. Uh, we also, as um, I think Pan Bogdan mentioned, uh, the VAC systems. We just purchased 30 of those VAC, VAC, VAC systems and work together with uh, our partners to distribute them uh, evenly among uh, Ukrainian medical facilities. So we are covered Poltava, uh, Zaporizhia, Odessa, and Ivano-Frankivsk, and other other, I would say, organizations cover other cities. So um, also we purchase um, a lot of ambulances, over twenty cars of ambulances that uh, helped first first ten cars helped to evacuate people from city Irpin and Bucha to Kiev. They were going like a uh, like a public transportation in some way, uh, and right now we're moving everything to the south of Ukraine and east. So we're receiving a new um, shipment of the ambulances from Italy you know, within uh, next week. And we will try to distribute equally among uh, military facilities, the medical uh, offices, and as well as uh, um, uh, hospitals as well, because a lot of hospitals asking for assistance with the ambulances. Uh, so that's what we've been doing for all this time. It was busy two months of work and um, we grew uh, uh, tremendously. We spent uh, uh, in the month of um, uh, March, we spent almost $3 million on aid to Ukraine. And I'm sure the month of April will be not, not less. Hey, wonderful. Um, I think Roman Shirokov is on mute, so please unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, so uh, yeah, that I was my question. Very, yeah, I try to be very short and very compact. Yes, uh, excellent presentation, and I invite everyone to visit your tremendous website, which is so clear and well designed and answers so many awesome. questions. It's one of the best websites. For volunteering organization, I've ever seen. Um, yeah, but, uh, right now I would like to add. So we continue to helping wounded soldiers to bring to United States. As of right now, we negotiate for two uh, special force guys for Massachusetts with Massachusetts General Hospital to accept on pro bono. So that's if you guys know any medical facilities who would accept uh, wounded Ukrainian servicemen as well as civilians, we would be more than happy to uh, talk and find uh, trauma that could be assist here in the United States. Yes, and I, if I may, I will ask a question. Uh, so I know that uh, in many volunteer organizations, I, I, familiar, I'm familiar with United Health Ukraine, uh, you know, the amount of money that was poured in in the first three weeks over seated, like, like it was 10 times what they had a year. And then, it was all about uh, organizing and infrastructure, but are you concerned that this 
support will run out. Yes, yes, that's why I'm saying that, uh, for example, we do understand that there is uh, rehabilitation of uh, wounded people and, and military will take years. Uh, depends on the injuries. That's why we, uh, we're putting up with the, with the funds that we are raising right now, we're putting them into rehabilitation in Ukraine. So we're investing in Ukrainian medical facilities uh, and they will help um, wounded civilians and soldiers uh, going forward. Uh, for the, yeah, you mentioned uh, r r very nicely that um, uh, and clearly that uh, we've been raising, we, we never raised that much money in, uh, through our entire existence of six and a half years. Yes, we did provide help and negotiation with the hospitals for this amount, but we never raised like physical uh, funding. Uh, so in the last year, for example, we raised $1 million throughout the, the whole year. And the month, month of March, we almost spent three on uh, medical aid to Ukraine. Um, so yes, we do, we, we do consider the fact that, you know, the money will run out eventually and uh, rehabilitation and medical uh, devices that we're purchasing will work for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you, the panel. I think it was inspiring. Say the least, and I pass my baton to Markian. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, to all of the panelists and to Dr. Shiroko for um, chairing so ably. Um, I do want to um, lighten the mood a little bit uh, before our last panel, um, just to wake people up. Um, so I'm going to play uh, the song Nezhuritsa uh, Chlopti by the Pushkin. Pushkin exclamation point klezmer band, which is one of Ukraine's uh, leading pop acts. So Nezhuritsa Chlopci. Yeah, 
вновь все еще и с нами будет Мы поедем до Корчак и там и лодка будет На жорице хлопцы еще и с нами будет Мы поедем до Корчак и там и лодка будет Окей, thank you so much for staying with us. Um, this is the final session, one hour session of the Shevchenko expertise -thon. Um, Once again, I'd like to remind you all that we are raising money for the uh, Shevchenko Emergency Fund, which is um, going to create fellowships, non-residential and residential fellowships for Ukrainian artists, writers, and scholars, including scientists um, who have been affected by the war. So I'd like to uh, thank our previous panelists, um, ask them to turn off their video, and then um, invite our uh, final panelists to turn on their video. and. I will be uh, chairing the final panel. So it is my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Olena Nikolayenko, who is professor of political science at Fordham University. Um, she is um, a well-known um, commentator on Ukrainian affairs and in the political science community. And she needs no introduction at NTSHA because she is the chair of the communications committee and a board member of NTSHA, as well as a full member of the history, social science, and law section. So, uh, Professor Nikolayenko, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be a, a part uh, of this uh, panel. Um, and uh, we have, I think, previously heard a great deal about women's participation in the war efforts. Um, uh, and uh, in my brief remarks, I'm going to focus uh, more on the uh, you know, gender outcomes of the revolution and the ensuing war. Um, uh, so I will uh, just uh, um, talk uh, uh, about these two events because they are interrelated. Uh, just a second, I need to, oh, sorry. I don't know, uh, just, I, I will, uh, just a second, I will share this. I want to share the, the screen with the slides. Uh, um, so if it's uh, full screen. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, and uh, of course, uh, as you all know, uh, women played an active role in the revolution of dignity and uh, they assumed a wide range of um, uh, uh, tasks. Uh, uh, they played um, an active role as volunteers building a network. Uh, uh, they were involved in various crowdsourcing initiatives. Uh, um, uh, they uh, distributed information, provided pro bono legal aid uh, and uh, medical aid for the uh, protesters and also some of them joined uh, the self-defense units um, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, once uh, uh, Russia intervened uh, and uh, started uh, you know the war in eastern Ukraine many women uh, volunteered uh, uh, and joined uh, the volunteer battalions and uh, uh, many of them were also involved in um, efforts uh, to raise uh, funds uh, to support the armed forces in Ukraine um, and provide uh, um, aid for the internally displaced people. Uh, so in part uh, in my project uh, on women's participation in the revolution, I look at Uh, we seem to have lost Olena briefly. Um, hopefully she can jump back on. Um, but if she's not able to jump back on the call, then I would like to introduce um, our next speaker. And that is uh, Dr. Irina Zinyuk, who is Associate Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Um, Dr. Zinyuk has been um, quite active in um, assisting Ukrainian scholars um, working within her university and 
um, through her own platform um, to provide opportunities for Ukrainian scholars who have been displaced, scholars and scientists who have been displaced. So, uh, Dr. Zanyuk, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martian. Um, thank you for opportunity to present. Um, I will be sharing my screen with the presentation. Um, uh, could you confirm that you see my slides? Yep. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm professor. Yeah, I'm associate professor in engineering here at the University of California of Irvine. And uh, when when the Russian war happened, uh, we I started to to think about how we can help displaced scholars. I'm academic, and of course uh, the 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 academics affected by war uh, were kind of personally close close to on my agenda and. Um, turns out that um, many universities have mechanisms to do so. Actually, uh, obviously Europe has a lot of resources. For example, Germany has a Philip Schwartz Initiative, Max Planck Society, where there are already existing fellowships that Ukrainians can come and work from like uh, on a very short notice. In the United States, unfortunately, we don't have kind of centralized federal programs until very recently. Uh, but um, so each university can do kind of their own initiatives um, and one has to look for resources to understand what can be done through the university. Just to give you a brief introduction where we are, we are on the West Coast in California. We are one of the nine campuses of University of California located in Irvine. This is just south of LA. Uh, we are located in beautiful location. A lot of people come here for vacation. We are public school. We are a large public school. We have a comprehensive. We have uh, schools and departments of all, all types, including law school and medical school. So essentially, we can accommodate scholar of any type of background. Uh, when I when I started inquiring, trying to understand what can be done, I, I learned that we do have a scholars at risk program at the University of California, Irvine, founded in 2017 by Professor Jane Newman. She is faculty in comparative literature department. And up until now, we hosted about seven scholars that were displaced by war or some other events. We had Turkish, Afghan scholars, Cameroonian, and they typically come here for a year or two. And uh, they bring their families, spouses, children, in some cases it was younger sister. And the schools that hosted them so far, again, since we are a comprehensive university, uh, have all kinds of schools already hosted the scholars. So, so I, um, what happens is that uh, Afghan's crisis happened uh, just just a few years ago, and Afghan scholars are still arriving to campus now. So, so the people who are involved in the Scholars at Risk program are still very much busy with Afghan scholars, and perhaps don't have the bandwidth to to intake Ukrainian scholars or to work or to establishing programs for Ukrainians. So, we really need more people, more volunteers who can do this. So, uh, just to give you a brief, uh, many of you are familiar with what Scholars at Risk program is. Uh, it's an international program, and uh, the idea is they will. It's kind of um, scholars that are displaced can submit their resumes and dossier to this program, and then this organization acts as a matchmaking type of organization. So you have you have uh, scholars submitting applications and universities saying we can we can host this in this area and this and this. So that matchmaking happens currently. It's really slow because they are overwhelmed with applicants that are still from Afghanistan and now from Ukraine too. So process can take up to three months to review the application. So currently it might not be the best path way to go but what they provide they pre-screen the application they build the dossier they they assigned kind of the social worker so so there are a lot of benefits to, to going through this program alternative scholars rescue fund scholar rescue fund is limited to essentially applicants who have phds who who are academics who are either professors or research scientists and they have they they need to have really comprehensive cvs and record of published research and scholars rescue fund actually provides stipends so twenty five thousand dollars it's a very competitive process, and for now, I think um, they are looking now into Ukrainian applicants as well. So, uh, what have we done here at UC Irvine? Essentially, this is kind of the pathway and the model that can be, I believe, replicated across many universities. Um, so, essentially, the first step is to do fundraising, since there is no dedicated funds 
for for such activities within specifically public schools maybe it's better private within private schools um, but in public schools fundraising is the biggest step and then identifying scholars uh, displaced scholars either through sc uh, scholar rescue fund or, or scholars at risk or some other mechanisms and then finding the department for hosting getting commitment from the dean and from the chair uh, getting up academic appointments so one has to talk to all the offices in the universities to get this coordinated Essentially, many universities have this in place because if your university hosted already displaced scholars from Afghanistan, this can be duplicated to, to do the same thing for Ukrainian scholars. Okay, And then once they arrive here, the logistics, a lot of places like here in California, the housing is really expensive. So one has to really make sure that the, these things are budgeted for them so um, and for their families as well. So in terms of fundraising, fundraising is the most important step. So uh, typically it takes about 100,000 or more per scholar, depending on their rank. Um, and so what are they, how can one do fundraising? For ex uh, so, so first mechanism, direct address, ask of university. So uh, all the officials like provost, vice chancellor for research, dean, chairs, one can go and write a letter and say, please donate. And, and they usually do. Uh, in terms of then crowdsourcing campaign, essentially getting public funding from uh, from from the community. Um, if your university is integrated within the community well, then then this can be successful, but it also needs to be advertised. So one has to really be a very active with media to make sure that the story gets out there. And if you are Ukrainian, say, t telling story about Ukraine is, is also personal. So it resonates with a lot of, I would say, with a lot of donors. And then organizing charitable events. In our case, we organized concert again by our Ukrainian colleagues here that, uh, that helped with fundraising. In terms of identifying scholars, um, that uh, there will be dossier building. Essentially, they have to specify why they are at risk. So it's not difficult to do because they come from war zones. So de by definition, they are at risk. And um, and and that's something we can help with. And then the rest of logistics is something uh, which is very different for each university, but it's just time consuming. It's not so difficult. So in our case, we we, we set up a fundraising, which is crowdsourcing campaign through official channels of UC Irvine. Our goal was hundred thousand dollars. So this is kind of um, realistic goal. So a lot of people who donate like twenty dollars, fifty dollars, don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel that their contribution is not going to count. Essentially. We are not limited to 100,000, it can go overboard, but uh, as of now, we launched in March 9th, so in a month or so, we get, gathered around $64,000, and important was to advertise it on, on all the social media. It was advertised in our university through the official UCI channels, as well as a letter from Chancellor went out condemning the war in uh, Russian war against Ukraine and also uh, advertising our crowdsourcing. So and and so we also had the provost. Uh, so we had high officials saying, please donate. So that helps. And uh, we had specifically also donors uh, who who were uh, relating to this cause. In this case, the Duran and Sata Pelian had uh, donated $10,000 to the cause. In, in the next stage, it's direct ask from Provost, Vice Chancellor for Research and Deans. So Provost 50,000, VCR 25, and each Dean about five to $10,000, depending on how big their program. So that's also substantial amount that can, uh, essentially what, what we are now currently over 200,000, we can bring two scholars at this point. So we also did a concert fundraising concert uh, organized by the colleagues, Ukrainian colleagues here, uh, Vladimir Minin and Yulia Minina, and uh, the concert had a really nice uh, program of Ukrainian songs and uh, it gathered more than $5,000. So admission was free, but but people had the QR code they could donate to. So that was quite uh, quite nice, nice event and boosted our fundraising effort. In terms of media exposure, so it's not it's not about like us getting famous is more about getting the message out. So if you are Ukrainian and you have personal stories to say, it actually really helped with fundraising. So that's what my experience been getting out in the news. So we've been with CBS, with PBS, on UCI, uh, you know, website and, and things like that. So those really, really after those kind of interviews, I see the, the boost in crowdsourcing. So that that helps to re and also uh, chronicles of higher education. So in terms of conclusion and 
additional thoughts. So I'm, I haven't done anything like this before. I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist. I'm, most of my time goes into managing my research group, but since the war happened, uh, at, at this type of activities, any, any academic can, can initiate at uh, your universities. Another opportunity is Department of Energy issued Dear Colleague Letter. So if you have funding from Department of Energy Basic Energy Sciences Award, you can bring essentially scholar from Ukraine as supplementary funding. So this is something our university already organized, all the principal investigators who have this funding to, to submit those grants so we can host uh, many more scholars. In terms of our effort, our target to bring like four academics, so it's not large effort as you can think of, but uh, we are one of nine campuses of University of California. So what we did for Afghanistan, essentially all seven, I think seven out of nine campuses did something. So for example, Ber Berkeley managed to bring 12 uh, displaced scholars, uh, UC Irvine, we had four. So it, it depends on campus and how successful their fundraising was. And uh, through that, if all the seven campuses uh, do something for Ukrainians, then, then this number can be substantial. So that was the idea behind starting this program. So others can duplicate too. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, as I mentioned, many programs still too busy with Afghan refugees and uh, you know academics there are so many displaced uh, people currently refugees in Ukraine that need help uh, you know desperate help academics might not be high on the list currently but uh, I think um, we, we can do something for them as well so uh, in terms of students uh, students not so easy some universities for example Arizona State University managed to bring like cohort of 40 Af Afghani students uh, so this is something can be re replicated. It's not so easy because one needs to really uh, figure out how the system works and how to provide scholarships and all of that through the university. So uh, in this case, alumni engagement can be critical. And um, visa process, the CIA takes about several months. So it's, it's, we cannot bring them immediately tomorrow, but we're looking forward to bringing them maybe in three months. So we identified, for example, already several scholars. And another challenge we have, we are in California, we are a little bit isolated from, not as integrated into diaspora. There is diaspora here in Los Angeles, but it's still some driving distance to Irvine. So I think there is some, some reluctance to come here. So uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this opportunity to, uh, to present and to just tell you what, what we've been doing here at UC Irvine. It's not a big effort, but it's something uh, I, I think many, many universities can replicate. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Zanyuk. Um, I know that there's long been um, discussion in the Shevchenko Scientific Society about possibly creating a chapter in California, but uh, up to now, the geographic challenges of having the North, South, Central Valley, California um, has made it um, a little bit challenging, but we hope to change that in the future and uh, maybe we can be in touch. Um, it would that. be really, really great. I feel like there is a lot of academics now that I'm, I'm meeting a lot of academics who are integrated in the University of California, who are Ukrainian, who have never heard about Shevchenko Society. So I, I've been pointing them, but but yeah, I feel like we have, we have a lot to offer here and it would be really, really great if we can bridge the cause um of course with the with the headquarters still being in new york city <laughs> right <laughs> thank you well i'm thr thrilled thank you so much um so i would like to give olena nikolayenko a chance to complete her presentation she got kicked off of her um internet connection earlier but um she left off just as she was beginning to talk about the outcomes of the revolution um in gender Yeah, th th thank you. Sorry, uh, I just, I don't know, for some reason, my internet connection is not very stable. Um, and um, yeah, I do hope that maybe we're, given the Zoom uh, um, uh, technology, you know, there is a possibility to connect people from across uh, California, you know, and have, um, you know, the, the summer, the, the chapter. Um, so yeah, so in terms of gender outcomes, uh, usually uh, scholars distinguish between political, economic, and cultural outcomes, and political outcomes are uh, usually um, evaluated in terms of women's representation in different uh, types of government. Economic outcomes uh, include uh, unemployment about women and men, the gender wage gap, and occupational segregation, gender-based uh, uh, distribution uh, across the different occupations and within occupations and the cultural outcomes uh, tend to focus on mass attitudes uh, uh, toward gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, 
So in uh, Ukraine, uh, since uh, 2014, there were some changes in electoral laws adopted by the uh, parliament. And in 2015, uh, the law on the local elections introduced the gender quota, uh, suggesting that approximately 30% uh, of uh, uh, candidates on uh, the proportional system uh, sh must uh, uh, should be of another gender, and in fact, like um, um, trying to um, encourage uh, political parties uh, to uh, place more women on the ballot. And uh, uh, just the shortcoming of that election was that uh, it was adopted just a few months before the local elections and it did not introduce any sanctions for non-compliance. So not all political parties uh, uh, complied with it. And uh, uh, in 2020, the electoral code that was adopted expanded uh, uh, the scope uh, uh, to which gender quotas are applied uh, to both local and national elections, and also stipulated that uh, no less than two candidates out of five on the list should be men or women, which uh, raised uh, the gender qu uh, quota to 40%. Uh, percent. Uh, and um, Uh, and women's representation in government has slowly increased. Uh, if we look at uh, the level of women's representation in the national parliament, uh, it stayed uh, under 10% uh, for um, more than uh, uh, two decades, you know, since uh, Ukraine regained national independence. Uh, um, but then there was a, a dramatic increase uh, in 2019, when uh, more than 20% of uh, seats in the national parliament uh, became held by women. And uh, some women uh, assumed the prominent positions in the Verkhovna Rada, uh, you know, one um, of uh, the political parties, newly created political parties, the Golas, um, became headed by, by a woman. Uh, and in local legislatures, uh, the picture is more mixed and uh, as you can see as far as uh, women's representation in oblast legislatures is concerned it increased uh, gradually uh, from 12 percent in 2010 to 15 percent in 2015 and then up to 27 0.8 percent in 2020. Um, the proportion of women just slightly increased in city councils from 28 percent in 2010 to 32 percent in 2020, but it declined in um, village councils. Uh, and these statistics provide just a very crude uh, measure of women's uh, representation in government. Uh, and of course, it's much more important to, to look at actual work uh, completed by women deputies and different um, levels uh, to try and bring about uh, uh, long-term policy change. Uh, there are also some media reports suggesting that uh, party voices uh, try to game the system. And uh, while initially some women were elected to local uh, or city or oblast level councils, uh, later after several months or a year, they, were, um, they came under a great deal of pressure to step down and um, give uh, room for other, uh, usually um, male uh, politicians to take up uh, their seats. Uh, and in the labor market, um, the uh, situation is also uh, somewhat mixed. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's striking that unlike many other countries, I think in the developing world uh, in Ukraine, according to the official statistics, uh, the unemployment rate is uh, higher for men than for women. Um, but uh, of course, it doesn't take into account uh, uh, citizens' participation in the informal economy. And the gender wage gap uh, um, uh, fluctuated a little bit uh, uh, since uh, the 2000s, uh, uh, but uh, most years it was around 77%. Um, uh, which meant that uh, women received 77% of uh, you know, men's wages. Uh, and only uh, most recently, 
it uh, jumped a little bit and uh, uh, it uh, you know it reached uh, uh, 81.4% in 2021. Uh, and of course, there is a great deal of variation across different sectors of economy, different industries, and uh, uh, the level of occupational segregation is particularly high in the armed forces. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the situation has uh, dramatically changed uh, with the start of the war, and um, the number of women serving in the military increased from uh, 16,000 to almost uh, 32,000. Uh, it nearly doubled within uh, uh, the span of um, seven years. Um, one of the changes that was uh, spearheaded by uh, primarily women uh, veterans occurred in 2016 when uh, the Ministry of Defense expanded uh, uh, a number, a list of military positions and occupations open for women. Um, and also in 2018, there was a law uh, on equal rights and opportunities for women and men in the armed forces uh, uh, that tried to reinforce the idea that um, many, um, many positions, including combat positions, are open for women um, in in. Uh, in the armed forces and uh, uh, just uh, uh, moving on from you know public opinion data statistics to uh, individuals i wanted to point out how um, uh, participation in the revolution of dignity had a profound impact uh, on many women um, who uh, in some way changed the, the you know political uh, outlook or uh, in the case of Marusa Zviraboy, for example, the linguistic uh, habits uh, where um, after her participation in the Russian dignity, she decided to switch from speaking Russian to speaking Ukrainian. And um, uh, many women also became involved in the war in Eastern Ukraine. And um, Marusa Zviraboy, for example, found the uh, proving ground um, training ground uh, for um, soldiers uh, uh, that became known as Marus and Polygon. Uh, and uh, uh, Yana Zinkevich uh, is uh, another example of a woman who first participated in the Euromaidan and then uh, um, went to Eastern Ukraine as a paramedic. And uh, while she was there uh, during the first year, uh, she founded uh, the organization, volunteer organization of paramedics, hospitaliers, uh, that is active to this day. They, raise, they have a Facebook uh, page uh, um, and they continue to raise a lot of funds and you know, provide assistance uh, for uh, those affected by the war. Uh, and Yulia Payevska also participated in the Year Maidan. You know, she was um, a well known um, uh, in martial arts uh, and um, uh, later, she set up a paramedics group, Tyra Angels. Uh, she was uh, involved in the evacuation of uh, people uh, from Mariupol, and that's why she was captured uh, uh, several weeks ago, and uh, she is now kept uh, in, uh, in the, um, in, somewhere in, in, the, in Russia. Um, uh, so women were involved in... Um, the war in multiple ways and to some extent there is a gradual change also in public opinion uh, where there is a little bit of a greater acceptance of women uh, assuming leadership positions in politics and also in business um, and uh, I just wanted to conclude by pointing out that uh, you know women played an important role in the revolution of dignity and also uh, in the ongoing war against uh, Russia's aggression uh, and uh, it's important to make sure that not only structural changes are introduced in the system uh, but also that there are efforts to cultivate uh, cultural norms uh, um, and uh, uh, political attitudes that are supportive of women's empowerment and uh, moving or thinking forward, I think it's important to also uh, take into account, uh, you know, gender equality when uh, uh, post-war reconstruction plans are considered. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nikolayenko. Um, 
I would like to, um, if we have questions, please um, give them to our panelists in the chat or in the Q&A function, and they can respond in writing. In the interest of time, I would like to turn the floor directly over to uh, Professor Adriana Helbig, um, who is a professor, associate professor of music um, at the University of Pittsburgh. And she is a longtime member of Entesha and is a full member of the arts and music section and uh, is currently the vice president and treasurer of um, the society. So uh, Dr. Helbig, please, the floor is yours. I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble sharing my screen, but um, as I've been listening to my colleagues, I think what I'll do is probably not show the images I had been thinking of, uh, partly because I think that the examples that I was going to show might shift the mood of what we're trying to do in this inter interdisciplinary panel. So I am a music professor. Um, I teach at Pitt. Um, I'm an ethnomusicologist. I missed my opportunity at one o'clock to uh, join my colleagues in music. Uh, for other uh, events that I had to do today. But the uh, research that I do in Ukraine is very much human rights based. So I work with uh, Roma, with African students and with LGBT um, activists. Um, today, I wanna to talk about Roma because very much uh, to my surprise, they are playing a very central role in this war. Uh, this started uh, right at the beginning uh, when there was a news um, meme that came out through social media that in Kherson, a group of Roma or gypsies or Tsihane as they were referred to, had stolen a Russian tank. And this became a viral sensation that our Tsihane, Nashi Tsihane, stole a Russian tank. And using that word stole, which is a, a stereotype that is very much associated with this group, um, these endless forms of discrimination are evident um, not only in, um, in among the way that people talk about Roma in Ukraine, but throughout Eastern Europe and also in Pittsburgh um, and in the US where many uh, Roma immigrated um, more than 100 years ago. So this idea that Roma steal children, that they um, are unable to work, that they are uneducated, that they uh, live in dirt, that they wish to live like that. Um, my book that's coming out in a few weeks um, which is called Resounding Poverty, Roman Music and Development Aid with Oxford University Press, talks about the 300 years of discriminatory policies uh, on the territories of Ukraine through the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire that had led to this systemic this discrimination and inability of Roma to um, participate in economic, political, and social life. So the narrative that seems to be changing um, regarding to Roma is that they are participating in civil society and they are equal citizens. Um, they are suffering the same way that Ukrainians are. And there, there again is a distinction the way that people talk in Ukraine, that there are Roma, Sehane, and Ukrainians, right? It, it, there's a very, very uh, distinct way that groups are um, differentiated that they are suffering um, and the Roma are responding with these types of memes, um, with the story that the Russian tank was stolen, um, that they are uh, serving in the army. Um, and there are a lot of videos of uh, Roma soldiers, um, especially in the East. Uh, that's where many uh, soldiers, especially out of uh, Western parts of Ukraine where the majority of Roma live, um, are being sent to Mariupol. Um, they are more in, in that Eastern part. Um, the soldiers that are sharing their stories are putting forth one narrative and very interestingly in the Ukrainian language. Um, and this is again a very significant shift. Typically among Roma, most of the research that I've been doing is in Russian. Um, they also speak Romani, uh, Romanes, uh, which is the language of the Roma, um, also Hungarian and Slovak. Uh, so those would be the typical languages, especially more in the Ushorod area. 
um, the narrative is that there is no difference among nationalities on the front. Um, and again, putting forth that narrative that everybody is equal, my concern is uh, what will happen after the war? Will the, that type of narrative hold? Will people remember? Uh, there were attempts uh, to do this uh, during 2013 and 14 during the uh, Yaura Maidan and the Revolution of Dignity, uh, trying to remind people that Roma had been already involved in the, in the armed forces back then, and that story seemed to have dissipated. So we'll see where this is. Um, there are a lot of non-governmental organizations that are on top of this, especially um, in Central and Western um, Europe. Um, the one uh, other difference that I've been noticing is that typically uh, Roma in Ukraine used the Romani flag. So this image of a blue um, and green structured flag, and then there's a red wagon wheel or circle right in the middle. Um, that wagon wheel refers to the chakra, uh, which is the story that Roma came from India about a thousand years ago. And then also that wagon wheel uh, functions as the structure of the history of nomadism um, and the red color meaning fire and, and uh, passion for life. Uh, so that Romani flag typically would appear at any function uh, for a, a Roman music event or a political event or any kind of uh, Roma associated publication that now comes out in Ukraine. And that has all been substituted by the Ukrainian flag. And that image of the flag of the Ukrainian flag also now appears on most Roma media outlets, um, you know, images of the tractor as well, uh, pulling the Russian tank. But that, uh, again, the, the, the supra narrative now is the Ukrainian nation state and uh, civil society and uh, citizenship responsibility. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing among Roma is the fact that uh, they do not have the paperwork that typical citizens might have. So as we're seeing the refugees move across from the eastern parts to the western parts, many of them are staying in Ushorod. Um, and again, the 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 way that the economics work, the Ushorod Roma are actually much poorer uh, than the more affluent uh, coming out of Kyiv uh, or Kharkiv, the ones that have been evacuating. Um, so there's this very interesting joining of groups that hadn't uh, had contact before, especially personal contact, uh, and where the more affluent are now depending on the um, more impoverished. Um, and so there have been a lot of attempts to try to send money directly through Western Union to colleagues uh, that are working and making Bogrash, um, you know, in big um, cauldrons right at the Ushura train station to feed people. The decision to leave Ukraine is very difficult for Roma because they have to choose between discrimination in Romania, which is extreme, uh, Hungary, which is even more extreme, Slovakia, not so bad, but also bad. Um, and so we have this, again, this situation where as we're talking about refugees, uh, one has to consider what one looks like as they cross the border. And that's all I'll say about that because this has really been a, a theme, uh, and especially in the Western media, they picked up on that very quickly. Not so much about Roma. We're only seeing Roma stories come up in the last two, three days, quite honestly. Um, Al Jazeera just published a, a, a an article almost just two days ago about Romani refugees and the challenges that they're facing. Um, but the, the story did go very uh, strongly um, in the first few days of the war with regard to the African students. So the African and Indian students um, that were being maltreated on allegedly on the border uh, uh, on the Ukrainian side, but also uh, or facing discrimination, especially on the Polish side, um, that uh, has led to quite significant pushback in certain organizations, academic organizations, uh, to uh, support uh, some of this stuff. And I'll just say just briefly, in the Society for Ethnomusicology, this was a very big deal. Um, my uh, The board actually did not uh, issue a statement condemning them the war in Ukraine because of this particular issue um, in the first few days of the war. 
So, you know, in terms of activism, um, it just happens that I'm on the board of that particular organization, and it took quite a bit of work to show uh, some of the nuances of this. But the PR element with regard to race in Ukraine, um, you know, there, there has to be quite a bit of work uh, to, to explain what has been happening, especially with uh, African students, Indian students. The story actually was not so simple. And just based on my own experiences, this really had to do a lot with the embassies uh, from certain uh, African countries, when and where were they issuing um, orders to evacuate and how students were engaging with the embassies. And please remember again that many African embassies uh, do not actually exist in Ukraine, they are in Moscow. Um, and so we've seen again some of these nuances. So as these global shifts happen and as this war continues, um, you know, this element of race uh, minorities uh, is really important. Um, and I just ask that everybody be aware of this. Um, and just to bring this to the foreground as we move towards rebuilding efforts in Ukraine. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Helbig. Um, it, it's a really important issue. And I think that the interdisciplinary panel um, has raised a lot of these questions, um, especially about how um, things in Ukraine are intersectional um, in a lot of cases. And all the more so when you're talking about dis disparate ethnic groups that are working together, right? Um, there are still these issues at play. So um, again, um, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please mention them in chat. Um, the final speaker of the day, um, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce um, Dr. Timofey Brik, um, who is a sociologist um, he's joining us from Ukraine, um, where it is almost midnight. So um, I express uh, my deep gratitude to him for being on the panel today. And um, he is a researcher at the Kiev School of Economics and a sociologist by training, and also the acting wartime vice president for international affairs um, at the Kiev School of Economics. And he's also very involved with the Ukrainian Global University Initiative. So uh, Dr. Brik, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, well, what can I say? Midnight is not such a huge uh, burden for me. So don't worry about that. And I wanted uh, also to say thank you, well, to all of you. Uh, uh, we've lost your sound. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Is it working? Yes. yes. I, okay, good. I apologize for my headphones. Uh, sometimes technologies uh, well, are tricky for me. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for your long support of Ukraine and um, various activities that we uh, have been doing. We have uh, received specifically, you know, a lot of support from the community of Ukrainians in New York, from uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society, from Razom. So I appreciate all, 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 of, all your help. And uh, I also want to highlight, you know, what Irina um, was saying during her presentation. Uh, so you know, thank you, Irina, a lot. You've been doing a huge work. I also have been talking to many um, colleagues in different universities in uh, in various countries and it seems that this program of scholars at risk is quite um, well known in Europe but not necessarily in the United States and your educational effort and your promotion is uh, is very valuable so thank you I will share my screen now as well I will show some slides about our own activities at Kiev School of Economics so today I will be you know, talking at my capacity of um, uh, of, um, of vice president of international affairs, uh, not as a sociologist. Unfortunately, I you know I have uh, interrupted my research. Even though I think I think I managed to do two uh, revise and resubmit during this invasion. Yeah, so. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we, we can still find a few hours per week to do, to do research. 
or at least to receive um, desk rejections. You know, desk rejections, they don't care about war and things like that. So, um, but yeah, but mostly I, I, I've been focused on, um, on our administrative work and uh, on our diplomacy efforts. So uh, Kiev School of Economics is a small private and non-profit university. So we have uh, all been engaged in various ways during this war, during this invasion. Um, most of our staff now is scattered. Some of our professors are abroad. Most of them are in Ukraine. Our students, uh, they are back to lectures. So we, we give online lectures. Most of our staff is working now pro bono as researchers for government. You know, we advise on sanctions, on uh, humanitarian needs, on um, rebuilding efforts. Uh, we also participate in some diplomatic uh, efforts and um, uh, together with many partners, including you know, Razon, we fundraised for um, medical toolkits. Uh, I think we fundraised more than $20 million to purchase and deliver them to different places in Ukraine. Um, and I've been focused mostly on the umbrella of activities which we label fighting for intellectual sovereignty. So it is a very um, important project for us. We um, see that internationally, uh, political debates and academic debates are often still shaped by, um, you know, sort of um, narratives that are rooted in Russian intellectual tradition. So we, we want to address this. We want to, uh, to bring more Ukrainian voices and Ukrainian-based narratives to, to the international debate. Uh, and at the same time, we also want to show that, you know, Ukrainian academia is resilient and we can do um, our work despite the, this invasion. So that's why we initiated quite a lot of activities. So we started these lectures called Global Minds for Ukraine. We host lectures by world you know, uh, leading intellectuals like Nobel Prize winners, Daniel Kahneman, uh, Paul Krugman. Yesterday we had uh, Fiona Hill, we had Anna uh, Applebaum, we had some historians, sociologists. Uh, you know, it's just a great opportunity for us to, to invite these people to discuss uh, uh, pre significant intellectual um, issues and challenges. I remember that I was hosting some of these events from, uh, from the shelters. So it was, it was fun. And we uh, want to keep doing that um, as long as we can. We also initiated uh, more hardcore um, uh, seminars in economics uh, called uh, KSC Frontiers in Economics, where people actually present working papers with the theoretical models and empirical findings. Uh, we had some great academics like Tirol, who is also a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Jamoglu, they all presented. And we ourselves, we try to participate in various seminars, panels. We participated collectively uh, in more than 70 panels already. So that's been quite a, you know, quite a journey for us uh, doing all this. But uh, now our energy has been ch channeled to something new to the project which we label uh, Ukrainian Global University. And we want to um, develop this project to support Ukrainian students and academics who, um, whose studies, whose research uh, is interrupted. So you know that a lot of students and academics are abroad, they need your help. And Irina already you know, uh, presented you with uh, some um, tools that you can use. <coughs> But we also, um, you know, we, we also uh, try to address some other dimensions of, of this problem. So looking at this problem in more long-term perspective here in Ukraine, we, we really care about um, several issues. So first, it seems that quite a lot of programs that are designed now to help uh, refugees, including um, scholars at risk, these programs are often very, you know, kind of short term, uh, they offer, you know, six to 12 months postdoc positions to academics, or maybe some dormitories to students, some scholarships. But, you know, to be realistic, in, in one year, there will be some sort of a fatigue, 
people will not care about Ukraine as much. Um, there will be some economic shocks, deficits. So eventually there is a high risk that these people will lose their support uh, and they will be you know, left behind. And we don't want this to happen. We want to build some uh, security for these people. Also, we really care about brain drain. And it seems that there are so many people now abroad and uh, very few projects care to collect data about these people, you know, to, to think where are they, what do they need, how can we ensure that we can bring these people back to, you know, so they can uh, remain uh, members of Ukraine and Ukrainian community and to rebuild Ukraine. So there's uh, a lot of questions, open questions. So we, that's why we developed this project, Ukrainian Global University, because we want to ensure that we uh, will stay in touch with, uh, with Ukrainians abroad. So we will be doing it by ensuring, you know, community building. Um, <coughs> and facilitating their uh, return. So basically what's happening now, we, we are getting in touch with Ukrainians who are either abroad or maybe in Ukraine, but they consider to move abroad. And we um, interview them and we uh, help them to find education abroad, which is a bit counterintuitive. You may say that, well, why do we help if we want to address brain drain? So why do we send them abroad? But that's exactly, um, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but strategically we believe uh, this is a good cause because we want to offer them an opportunity, a unique lifetime opportunity to not only to secure human capital, but uh, even to improve their human capital, to study abroad in top universities, specifically with the reason to come back and to rebuild Ukraine. So as long as we sort of, you know, in control of this process, I think this can work. So uh, we interview the students, we help them with placement, but we also build a network with this student and we, um, we will build sense of community and um, you know, joint intellectual activities, uh, standardized curriculum. Uh, we will also facilitate the return in terms of bureaucracy. So basically we can you know, uh, think about standardized diplomas and credits for them, uh, incentivize the return with internships and job opportunities. Um, so, um, you know, we have a very broad network of partners who can offer internships to the students. Even our own organization, Kiev School of Economics, we will be very happy to offer jobs to the students. You know, if, if someone is studying uh, abroad as a master's student, we will accept them as PhD students. If someone is a PhD student abroad, we will offer the postdoctoral position. So we are open, you know, to, to provide resources and tools to bring these people back. And, uh, you know, it's also important for us to ensure that uh, Ukrainian students and academics, they preserve a sense of academic integrity, meaning that they are still doing their research. So we are also fundraising to support their research activities. Uh, so that's what we have now. We, we launched this project um, with partners. So we are not working alone on this project. There are several universities and NGOs uh, that work in uh, education in Ukraine. We also are, um, we received endorsement by the Ministry of Education and by the Office of the President of Ukraine. So we created this website through which we um, promote our activities and, um, um, and, um, and we offer um, forms to be filled so we can keep track of the students and of the universities. Um, so, this data is already um, old, it's April 20, but by today I checked, we have almost 900 applications by students, uh, how 55% of them are in Ukraine and they consider to go abroad. 45% of them are abroad already. Most of them are in Germany, in Poland, in France, in Italy, some of them are in the US. We have already verified um, uh, about 200, uh, well, uh, as of today, about 200 uh, applications, meaning that we check, you know, the quality of the application, whether they speak English, whether they can um, write nice essays. And we offer them free duolingo vouchers. Basically now, you know, because of war and because a lot of these kids, they, you know, they had to escape, they don't have their diplomas. 
they don't have means or time to to get through GMAT or JERI or TOEFL or IELTS. So at least what we can do, we offer them free Duolingo exams. And after interviews with us, we can also verify their English. And by uh, doing this, we can um, ensure that universities will consider their applications more uh, seriously. Uh, so currently, um, on another side, we are uh, working with universities in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, and we sign memorandums of understanding with these universities, and we ask them to provide educational opportunities for Ukrainians. So I think it's it's important to emphasize that you know so many universities around the world they are willing to help. There are well, <laughs> virtually uh, no university wants to stay uh, aside. Everyone is very. Mm, pro-social, helpful. Um, nevertheless, uh, it is also important for Ukrainian side to be active here. So what we do, we are not just, you know, um, mm, it's not just uh, our website is it, not just to promote some links and some opportunities in universities. We generate new educational opportunities. So to give you some examples, um, um, a very concrete example, uh, consider NYU, uh, NYU University, they have this uh, amazing campus in Prague. And, you know, after some negotiations and talking and signing this memorandum of understanding, they were very kind and very generous uh, to offer 20 positions for bachelor students in, in the campus in Prague. So now this university will accept Ukrainian students to study there. So basically this opportunity did not exist, but they created these opportunities after uh, signing memorandum of understanding with us. So that's what we are doing. We take this more proactive position. We reach out to universities and we ask, you know, basically we lobby for Ukrainian students and academics to, to get some um, opportunities in these universities. So yeah, so this is an example of NYU. There are other examples. I really like this example of a business school in Milan. Uh, what they offered, uh, they immediately uh, agreed to create uh, new educational programs, joint educational programs with us. So we have our business school and our business school created a partnership. And right now we have joined classes. So Italian professors, they give uh, online lectures, some sort of theory in business, but Ukrainian professors, they offer uh, workshops and uh, practical sessions and Ukrainian students, business students, they uh, continue their education in Ukraine. So they will apply uh, this business knowledge uh, in Ukraine while developing the country. Um, University of Pittsburgh is also a great friend uh, of us. And I, I want to highlight this example um, for, you know, uh, to show some creativity here. So there are universities like uh, University of Pittsburgh, but also Northwestern University and uh, UMass, uh, Massachusetts University. All these universities uh, also generated new resources and new opportunities for Ukrainian scholars in Ukraine. So they created what is called virtual non-residential fellowships. So what we do now in uh, Kiev School of Economics, we will um, we already set up a committee, and we will um, recruit Ukrainian scholars. They can be, you know, uh, from different cities, from different fields. They can be historians, mathematicians, chemists. It doesn't matter. They just have to be great scholars, and they just, you know, have to be in Ukraine or maybe refugees in in Poland or in Germany. So we will find them. We will interview them. We will. Uh, make them appointments at Kiev School of Economics, uh, like, I don't know, visiting fellows or something like that. And after doing that, they will be eligible to become non-residential fellows of, of Pittsburgh, of UMass, and then they will be eligible to receive funds. So this is a kind of legal way of paying uh, salaries abroad. So instead of, you know, uh, getting these people to the US, you can basically send checks to Ukraine and these people are not free riders. Yeah, they will be working. They will present, uh, they will develop curriculums. They will uh, make online workshops, lectures, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, so that's it. We have uh, our 
uh, website, we have Facebook, Twitter accounts. We do quite a lot of publicity in Ukraine and abroad. And our idea now is to increase our base. We will uh, enlist more students and we will sign more memorandums of understanding with universities in Europe and North America. We are also targeting Latin America, Asia. And uh, our idea is to build a global community of Ukrainians who will eventually return to Ukraine to, to rebuild it. So thank you for your attention. And um, uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate just giving us this overview of this in, um, incredible, innovative, multilateral initiative. And um, that is the final speaker for today. Um, so please um, follow Dr. Briko on Twitter, um, follow Timofey Milovanov, follow Kyiv School of Economics and U Global U, the Ukrainian Global University. Um, I think it's fitting to bring back the focus to non-residential fellowships because that's one of the uh, main goals of the Entesha fundraiser, um, which is to allow people uh, to support the work of scholars, writers, and artists in Ukraine. Um, as non-residential fellows. We'll give them an affiliation, we'll give them an email address, we'll put them up on our website, um, bring them into our community, um, and also allow them to continue their work in Ukraine, um, in addition to helping people who are um, in the US and also affected by the war. So um, I would like to just give the word to, the final word to um, Dr. Halina Hrin, um, president of Entesha, and uh, I'll, close after her um after her final remarks i'm going to play another one final song it's a little bit of a farce uh, just as uh kotlarevsky's and the yida may have begun as a farce uh, we can uh, end our our expertise on today um with a musical farce um so um helena the floor is yours Thank you very much. Thank you again for, for your work uh, that you did in putting so much of this together. Uh, thank you to everyone that has stuck it out for eight hours. And I see from the panelists that some of you have been here from, from the beginning. Uh, the, um, the final panel, even though it was interdisciplinary, it seemed to have pulled together all the threads that we have been um, uh, talking about, we had presentations with a strong research focus, with, we had uh, presentations on, um, on minorities, which forced us again to think what it really does mean to have a civic nation. And we look forward to the, uh, to, to the upcoming Oxford University Press book. We have seen an example of people who can uh, switch the, from or, or work on parallel tracks of doing their academic work, but at the same time, becoming an activist like all of us have uh, at, at, at the same time. And also we've had uh, an opportunity to uh, engage again with, with someone from Ukraine, uh, a generation or, or just uh, people who represent the best of what Ukraine stands for today. So I think that we can be very pleased with our event. And aside from the fundraising, I just I have to say that how proud I am to be a part of this organization and how much it has changed. And at the same time, it hasn't changed. It's almost 150 years since, uh, it's 149 years since Antisha was founded. So we got another, Uvla coming down the pipe, which probably again we will not have time to, to 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 celebrate, but it has remained despite the changes or because of the changes, it has remained true to its mission. Just as 150 years ago, it was there to provide an intellectual foundation and the beginning of of real nation building. Today, again, we see um, our entire organization rally to, to the war effort and to really show the best of ourselves and, um, and of our, in fact, of our whole nation, not to get too uh, emotional about it. So I really thank all of you for your time, for your dedication and um, and for the work we have done, and I, I, as we had said during the, um, the session, 
every one of these panels can be accept, uh, extended into a full, full presentation or into a separate conference. So there is so much talent in this organization, so much room for development. And, um, and I think we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I think we are up to the, cha the challenge. And um, thank you again, all of you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. I'd like to bring this expertise on to 